Chapter 11 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Big Headache Do you think we'll have to use force on Macklin to get him to cooperate in the experiment? Ferris asked eagerly. How are you going to go about forcing him, doctor? Mitchell inquired. He outweighs you by fifty pounds, and you needn't look to me for help against that repatriated fullback. Ferris fingered the collar of his starched lab smock. Guess I got carried away for a moment. But Macklin is exactly what we need for a quick dramatic test. We've had it if he turns us down. I know, Mitchell said, exhaling deeply. Somehow the men with the money just can't seem to understand basic research. Who would have financed a study of cyclic periods of the hedgehog? Yet the information gained from that study is vital in cancer research. When we prove our results, that should be of enough practical value for anyone. But those crummy trustees didn't even leave us enough for a field test. Ferris scrubbed his thin hand over the bony ridge of his forehead. I've been worrying so much about this, I've got the ancestor of all headaches. Mitchell's blue eyes narrowed, and his boyish face took on an expression of demonic intensity. Ferris, would you consider? No, the smaller man yelled. You can't expect me to violate professional ethics and test my own discovery on myself. Our discovery, Mitchell said politely. That's what I meant to say, but I'm not sure it would be completely ethical with even a discovery partly mine. You're right. Besides, who cares if you or I are cured of headaches? Our reputations don't go outside our own fields, Mitchell said. But now Macklin... Elliot Macklin had inherited the reputation of the late Albert Einstein in the popular mind. He was the man people thought of when the word mathematician, or even scientist, was mentioned. No one knew whether his theory of spadium was correct or not, because no one had yet been able to frame an argument with it. Macklin was in his early fifties, but looked in his late thirties, with the build of a football player. The government took up a lot of his time using him as the symbol of the ideal scientist to help recruit science and engineering cadets. For the past seven years, Macklin, who was the Advanced Studies Department of Firestone University, had been involved in devising a faster-than-light drive to help the Army reach Pluto and eventually the nearer stars. Mitchell had overheard two co-eds talking and so knew that the project was nearing completion. If so, it was a case of ad astra per aspirin. The only thing that could delay the project was Macklin's health. Despite his impressive body, some years before he had suffered a mild stroke, or at least a vascular spasm of a cerebral artery. It was known that he suffered from the vilest variety of migraine. A cycle of headaches had caused him to be absent from his classes for several weeks, and there were an unusual number of military uniforms seen around the campus. Ferris paced off the tidy measurements of the office outside the laboratory in the biology building. Mitchell sat slumped in the chair behind the blonde imitation wood desk, watching him disinterestedly. Do you suppose the great man will actually show up? Ferris demanded, pausing in mid-stride. I imagine he will, Mitchell said. Macklin's always seemed a decent enough fellow when I've had lunch with him or seen him at the trustees' meetings. He's always treated me like dirt, Ferris said heatedly. Everyone on this campus treats biologists like dirt. Sometimes I want to bash in their smug faces. Sometimes, Mitchell reflected, Ferris displayed a certain lack of scientific detachment. There came a discreet knock on the door. Please come in, Mitchell said. Elliot Macklin entered in a cloud of pipe smoke and a tweed jacket. He looked more than a little like a postgraduate student, and Mitchell suspected that that was his intention. He shook hands warmly with Mitchell. Good of you to ask me over, Stephen. Macklin threw a big arm across Ferris's shoulders. How have you been, Harold? Ferris's face flickered between pink and white. Fine, thank you, doctor. Macklin dropped on the edge of the desk and adjusted his pipe. Now what's this about you wanting my help on something? 
and please keep the explanation simple. Biology isn't my field, you know. Mitchell moved around the desk casually. Actually, doctor, we haven't the right to ask this of a man of your importance. There may be an element of risk. The mathematician clamped onto his pipe and showed his teeth. Now you have intrigued me. What is it all about? Doctor, we understand you have severe headaches, Mitchell said. Macklin nodded. That's right, Stephen. Migraine. That must be terrible, Ferris said. All your fine reputation and lavish salary can't be much consolation when that ripping, tearing agony begins, can it? No, Harold, it isn't, Macklin admitted. What does your project have to do with my headaches? Doctor, Mitchell said, what would you say the most common complaint of man is? I would have to say the common cold, Macklin replied. But I suppose, from what you have said, you mean headaches. Headaches, Mitchell agreed. Everybody has them at some time in his life. Some people have them every day. Some are driven to suicide by their headaches. Yes, Macklin said. But think, Ferris interjected, what a boon it would be if everyone could be cured of headaches forever by one simple injection. I don't suppose the manufacturers of aspirin would like you but it would please about everybody else. Aspirins would still be used to reduce fever and relieve muscular pains, Mitchell said. I see. Are you two saying you have such a shot? Can you cure headaches? We think we can, Ferris said. How can you have a specific for a number of different causes? Macklin asked. I know that much about the subject. There are a number of different causes for headaches. Nervous strain, fatigue, physical diseases from kidney complaints to tumors, overindulgence. But there is one effect of all of this, the one real cause of headaches, Mitchell announced. We have definitely established this for the first time, Ferris added. That's fine, Macklin said, sucking on his pipe. And this effect that produces headaches is? The pressure effect caused by pituitarin in the brain, Mitchell said eagerly. That is, the constriction of blood vessels in the telencephalon section of the frontal lobes. It is caused by an overproduction of the pituitary gland. We have artificially bred a virus that feeds on pituitrin. That may mean the end of headaches, but I would think it would mean the end of the race as well, Macklin said. In certain areas it is valuable to have a constriction of blood vessels. The virus, Ferris explained, can easily be localized and stabilized. A colony of virus in the brain cells relax the cerebral vessels, and only the cerebral vessels, so that the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't create pressure in the cavities of the brain. The mathematician took the pipe out of his mouth. If this really works, I could stop using that damned ginergen, couldn't I? The stuff makes me violently sick to my stomach but it's better than the migraine. How should I go about removing my curse? He reinserted the pipe. I assure you, you can forget or go to mine tartrate, Ferris said. Our discovery will work. Will work, Macklin said thoughtfully. The operative word. It hasn't worked then? Certainly it has, Ferris said. On rats, on chimps. But not on humans? Macklin asked. Not yet, Mitchell admitted. Well, Macklin said, well. He thumped pipe ashes out into his palm. Certainly you can get volunteers, convicts, conscientious objectors from the army. We want you, Ferris told him. Macklin coughed. I don't want to overestimate my value, but the government wouldn't like it very well if I died in the middle of this project. My wife would like it even less. Ferris turned his back on the mathematician. Mitchell could see him mouthing the word yellow. Doctor, Mitchell said quickly, I know it's a tremendous favor to ask a man of your position, but you can understand our problem. Unless we can produce quick, conclusive, and dramatic proof of our studies, we can get no more financial backing. We should run a large-scale field test, but we haven't the time or the money for that. We can cure the headaches of one person, and that's the limit of our resources. 
I'm tempted, Macklin said hesitantly, but the answer is go. I mean, no. I'd like to help you out, but I'm afraid I owe too much to the others to take the rest. The risk, I mean. Macklin ran the back of his knuckles across his forehead. I really would like to take you up on it. When I start making slips like that, it means another attack of migraine. The drilling, grinding pain through my temples and around my eyeballs. The flashes of light, the rioting pools of color playing on the back of my lids. Ugh. Ferris smiled. Genergen makes you sick, does it, doctor? Produces nausea, eh? The pain of that turns you almost wrong side out, doesn't it? You aren't much better off with it than without, are you? I've heard some say they preferred the migraine. Macklin carefully arranged his pipe along with the tools he used to tend it in a worn leather case. Tell me, he said, what is the worst that could happen to me? Low blood pressure, Ferris said. That's not so bad, Macklin said. How low can it get? When your heart stops, your blood pressure goes to its lowest point, Mitchell said. A dew of perspiration had bloomed on Macklin's forehead. Is there much risk of that? Practically none, Mitchell said. We have to give you the worst possibilities. All our test animals survived and seemed perfectly happy and contented. As I said, the virus is self-stabilizing. Ferris and I are confident that there is no danger, but we may be wrong. Macklin held his head in both hands. Why did you two select me? You're an important man, doctor, Ferris said. Nobody would care if Michael or I cured ourselves of headaches. They might not even believe us if we said we did. But the proper authorities will believe a man of your reputation. Besides, neither of us has a record of chronic migraine. You do. Yes, I do, Macklin said. Very well. Go ahead. Give me your injection. Mitchell cleared his throat. Are you positive, doctor? He asked uncertainly. Perhaps you would like a few days to think it over. No, I'm ready. Go ahead, right now. There's a simple release, Ferris said smoothly. Macklin groped in his pocket for a pen. Ferris, Mitchell yelled, slamming the laboratory door behind him. Right here, the small man said briskly. He was sitting at a work table, penciling notes. I've been expecting you. Doctor, Harold... You shouldn't have given this story to the newspapers, Mitchell said. He tapped the back of his hand against the folded paper. On the contrary, I should and I did, Ferris answered. We wanted something dramatic to show to the trustees, and here it is. Yes, we wanted to show our proof to the trustees, but not broadcast unverified results to the press. It's too early for that. Don't be so stuffy and conservative, Mitchell. Macklin's cured, isn't he? By established periodic cycle, he should be suffering hell right now, shouldn't he? But thanks to our treatment, he is perfectly happy, with no unfortunate side effects such as Genergen produces. It is a significant test case, yes, but not enough to go to the newspapers with. If it wasn't enough to go to the press with, it wasn't enough to try and breach the trustees with. Don't you see... The public will hand down a U.K. case demanding our virus, just as they demanded the salt vaccine and the Grinnell serum. But... The shrill call of the telephone interrupted Mitchell's objections. Ferris excused himself and crossed to the instrument. He answered it and listened for a moment, his face growing impatient. It's Macklin's wife, Ferris said. Do you want to talk to her? I'm no good with hysterical women. Hysterical? Mitchell muttered in alarm and went to the phone. Hello? Mitchell said reluctantly. Mrs. Macklin? You are the other one, the clear, feminine voice said. Your name is Mitchell. She couldn't have sounded calmer or more self-possessed, Mitchell thought. That's right, Mrs. Macklin. I'm Dr. Stephen Mitchell, Dr. Ferris's associate. Do you have a license to dispense narcotics? "'What do you mean by that, Mrs. Macklin?' Mitchell said sharply. "'I used to be a nurse, Dr. Mitchell. I know you've given my husband heroin.' "'That's absurd. 
What makes you think a thing like that? The trance he's in now. Now, Mrs. Macklin, neither Dr. Ferris or myself have been near your husband for a full day. The effects of a narcotic would have worn off by this time. Most known narcotics, she admitted, but evidently you have discovered something new. Is it so expensive to refine you and Ferris have to recruit new customers to keep yourself supplied? Mrs. Macklin, I think I'd better talk to you later when you are calmer. Mitchell dropped the receiver heavily. What could be wrong with Macklin, he asked, without removing his hand from the telephone. Ferris frowned, making quotation marks above his nose. Let's have a look at the test animals. Together they marched over to the cages and peered through the honeycomb pattern of the wire. The test chimp, Dean, was sitting peacefully in a corner, scratching under his arms with the back of his knuckles. Jerry, their control in the experiment, who was practically Dean's twin, except that he had received no injection of the EM virus, was stomping up and down, punching his fingers through the wire, worrying the lock on the cage. "'Jerry is a great deal more active than Dean,' Mitchell said. "'Yes, but Dean isn't sick. "'He just doesn't seem to have as much nervous energy to burn up. "'Nothing wrong with his thyroid, either.' "'They went to the smaller cages. "'They found the situation with the rats, Bud and Lou, much the same. "'I don't know. "'Maybe they just have tired blood,' Mitchell ventured. "'Iron deficiency anemia?' Never mind, doctor. It was a form of humor. I think we'd better see exactly what's wrong with Elliot Macklin. There's nothing wrong with him, Ferris snapped. He's probably just trying to get us in trouble, the ingrate. Macklin's traditional ranch house was small but attractive in aqua-tinted aluminum. Under Mitchell's thumb the bell chimed, dum-dee-dee-dum-dum-dum. -dee -dum -dum. As they waited, Mitchell glanced at Ferris. He seemed completely undisturbed, perhaps slightly curious. The door unlatched and swung back. Mrs. Macklin, Mitchell said quickly, I'm sure we can help if there's anything wrong with your husband. This is Dr. Ferris. I'm Dr. Mitchell. You had certainly better help him, gentlemen. She stood out of the doorway for them to pass. Mrs. Macklin was an attractive brunette in her late thirties. She wore an expensive yellow dress and she had a sharp, cornered jawline. The army officer came into the hall to meet them. You are the gentleman who gave Dr. Macklin the unauthorized injection, he said. It wasn't a question. I don't like that unauthorized, Ferris snapped. The colonel, Mitchell spotted the eagles on his green tunic, lifted a heavy eyebrow. No, are you medical doctors? Are you authorized to treat illnesses? "'We weren't treating an illness,' Mitchell said. "'We were discovering a method of treatment. "'What concern is it of yours?' "'The colonel smiled thinly. "'Dr. Macklin is my concern, "'and everything that happens to him. "'The army doesn't like what you've done to him.' "'Mitchell wondered desperately "'just what they had done to the man. "'Can we see him?' Mitchell asked. "'Why not? "'You can't do much worse than murder him now.' That might be just as well. We have laws to cover that. The colonel led them into the comfortable, over-feminine living room. Macklin sat in an easy chair, draped in embroidery, smoking. Mitchell suddenly realized Macklin used a pipe as a form of masculine protest to his home surroundings. On the coffee table in front of Macklin were some odd-shaped building blocks such as were used in nursery schools. A second uniformed man... Another colonel, but with a snake-entwined staff of the medical corps in his insignia, was kneeling at the table on the marble-effect carpet. The army physician stood up and brushed his knees, undusted from the scrupulously clean rug. "'What's wrong with him, Sidney?' the other officer asked the doctor. "'Not a thing,' Sidney said. "'He's the healthiest, happiest, most well-adjusted man I've ever examined, Carson.' "'But—' "'Colonel Carson protested. "'Oh, he's changed all right,' the army doctor answered. "'He's not the same man as he used to be.' "'How is he different?' Mitchell demanded. "'The medic examined Mitchell and Ferris critically before answering. "'He used to be a mathematical genius. "'And now? 
Mitchell said impatiently. Now he's a moron, the medic said. Mitchell tried to stop Colonel Sidney as he went past, but the doctor mumbled he had a report to make. Mitchell and Ferris stared at Colonel Carson and Macklin and at each other. What did he mean? Macklin is an idiot, Mitchell asked. Not an idiot, Colonel Carson corrected primly. Dr. Macklin is a moron. He's legally responsible, but he's extremely stupid. I'm not so dumb, Macklin said defensively. I beg your pardon, sir, Carson said. I didn't intend any offense. But according to all the standard intelligence tests we've given you, your clinical intelligence quotient is that of a moron. That's just on book learning, Macklin said. There's a lot you learn in life that you don't get out of books, son. I'm confident that's true, sir, Colonel Carson said. He turned to the two biologists. Perhaps we'd better speak outside. But, Mitchell said, impatient to examine Macklin for himself. Very well, let's step into the hall. Ferris followed them docilely. What have you done to him? The colonel asked straightforwardly. We merely cured him of his headaches, Mitchell said. How? Mitchell did his best to explain the FM virus. You mean, the army officer said levelly, you have infected him with some kind of a disease to rot his brain? No, no. Could I talk to the other man, the doctor? Maybe I can make him understand. All I want to know is why Elliot Macklin has been made as simple as if he had been kicked in the head by a mule, Colonel Carson said. I think I can explain, Ferris interrupted. You can, Mitchell said. Ferris nodded. We made a slight miscalculation. It appears as if the virus colony overcontrols the supply of posterior pituitary extract in the cerebrum. It isn't more than necessary to stop headaches. But that necessary amount of control to stop pain is too much to allow the brain cells to function properly. Why won't they function? Carson roared. They don't get enough food, blood, oxygen, hemoglobin, Ferris explained. The cerebral vessels don't contract enough to pump the blood through the brain as fast and as hard as is needed. The brain cells remain sluggish, dormant, perhaps decaying. The colonel yelled. Mitchell groaned. He was abruptly sure Ferris was correct. The colonel drew himself to attention, fists trembling at his side. I'll see you hung for treason. Don't you know what Elliot Macklin means to us? Do you want those filthy Luxembourgians to reach Pluto before we do? Macklin's formula is essential to the FTL engine. We might just as well have blown up Washington, D.C. Better. The capital is replaceable. But the chances of an Elliot Macklin are very nearly once in a human race. Just a moment, Mitchell interrupted. We can cure Macklin. You can, Carson said. For a moment, Mitchell thought the man was going to clasp his hands and sink to his knees. Certainly, we have learned to stabilize the virus colonies. We have antitoxin to combat the virus. We had always thought of it as a beneficial parasite, but we can wipe it out if necessary. Good. Carson clasped his hands and gave at least slightly at the knees. Just you wait a second now, boys, Elliot Macklin said. He was leaning in the doorway holding his pipe. I've been listening to what you've been saying, and I don't like it. What do you mean you don't like it? Carson demanded. He added, sir. I figure you mean to put me back like I used to be. Yes, doctor, Mitchell said eagerly, just as you used to be. With my headaches, like before? Mitchell coughed into his fist for an instant to give him time to frame an answer. Unfortunately, yes, Apparently, if your mind functions properly once again, you will have the headaches again. Our research is a dismal failure. I wouldn't go that far, Ferris remarked cheerfully. Mitchell was about to ask his associate what he meant when he saw Macklin slowly shaking his head. No, sir, the mathematician said. I shall not go back to my original state. I can remember what it was like. Always worrying, worrying. Worrying. You mean wondering, Mitchell said. 
Macklin nodded. Troubled, anyway. Disturbed by every little thing. How high was up? Which infinity was bigger than what infinity, say, what was infinity, anyway? All that sort of schoolboy things. It's peaceful this way. My head doesn't hurt. I've got a good-looking wife and all the money I need. I've got it made. Why worry? Colonel Carson opened his mouth, then closed it. That's right, Colonel. There's no use in arguing with him, Mitchell said. It's not his decision to make, the Colonel said. He's an idiot now. No, Colonel, as you said, he's a moron. He seems an idiot compared to his former level of intelligence, but he's legally responsible. There are millions of morons running around loose in the United States. They can get married, own property, vote, even hold office. Many of them do. You can't force him into being cured. At least, I don't think you can. No, I can't. This is hardly a totalitarian state. The colonel looked momentarily glum that it wasn't. Mitchell looked back at Macklin. Where did his wife get to, colonel? I don't think that even previously he made too many personal decisions for himself. Perhaps she could influence him. Maybe, the colonel said. Let's find her. They found Mrs. Macklin in the dining room, her face at the picture window an attractive silhouette. She turned as the men approached. Mrs. Macklin, the colonel began, these gentlemen believe they can cure your husband of his present condition. Really? she said. Did you speak to Elliot about that? Y yes, Colonel Carson said, but he's not himself. He refused the treatment. He wants to remain in his state of lower intelligence. She nodded. If those are his wishes, I can't go against them. But Mrs. Macklin, Mitchell protested, you'll have to get a court order overruling your husband's wishes. She smoothed an eyebrow with the third finger of her right hand. That was my original thought, but I've redecided. Redecided? Carson burst out almost hysterically. Yes, I can't go against Elliot's wishes. It would be monstrous to put him back where he would suffer the hell of those headaches once again, where he never had a moment's peace from worry and pressure. He's happy now, like a child, but happy. Mrs. Macklin, the army man said levelly. If you don't help us restore your husband's mind, we will be forced to get a court order declaring him incompetent. But he's not. Legally, I mean, the woman stormed. Maybe not. It's a borderline case. But I think any court would give us the edge where restoring the mind of Elliot Macklin was concerned. Once he's certified incompetent, authorities can rule whether Mitchell or Ferris antitoxin treatment is the best method of restoring Dr. Macklin to sanity. I doubt very much if the court would rule in that manner, she said. The colonel looked smug. Why not? Because, colonel, the matter of my husband's health, his very life is involved. There is some degree of risk in shock treatments, too, but... It isn't quite the same, colonel. Elliot Macklin has a history of vascular spasm, a mild pseudo-stroke some years ago. Now, if you want to give those cerebral arteries back the ability to constrict, to paralyze, to kill, no court would give you that authority. I suppose there's some chance of that. But without the treatment, there's no chance of your husband regaining his right senses, Mrs. Macklin, Mitchell interjected. Her mouth grew petulant. I don't care. I would rather have a live husband than a dead genius. I can take care of him this way make him comfortable. Carson opened his mouth and closed his fist, then relaxed. Mitchell led him back into the hall. I'm no psychiatrist, Mitchell said, but I think she wants Macklin stupid. Prefers it that way. She's always dominated his personal life, and now she can dominate him completely. What is she? A monster? The army officer muttered. No, Mitchell said. She's an intelligent woman unconsciously jealous of her husband's genius. Maybe, Carson said. I don't know. I don't know what the hell to tell the Pentagon. I think I'll go out and get drunk. I'll go with you, Ferris said. 
Mitchell glanced sharply at the little biologist. Carson squinted. Any particular reason, doctor? To celebrate, Ferris said. The colonel shrugged. That's as good a reason as any. On the street, Mitchell watched the two men go off together in bewilderment. Macklin was playing jacks. He didn't have a head on his shoulders and he was squatting on a great curving surface that was space-time, and his jacks were Earth and Pluto and the rest of the planets. And for a ball he was using a head. Not his head, Mitchell's. Both heads were initialed M, so it was all the same. Mitchell forced himself to awaken with some initial difficulty. He lay there, blinking the sleep out of his eyes, listening to his heart race, and then convulsively snatched the telephone receiver from the nightstand. He stabbed out a number with a vicious index finger. After a time, there came a dull click and a sleepy answer. Hello, Elliot Macklin said. Mitchell smiled to himself. He was in luck. Macklin had answered the phone instead of his wife. Can you speak freely, doctor? Mitchell asked. Of course, the mathematician said. I can talk fine. I mean, are you alone? Oh, you want to know if my wife is around? No, she's asleep. That army doctor, Colonel Sidney, he gave her a sedative. I wouldn't let him give me anything, though. Good boy, the biologist said. Listen, doctor, Elliot, L, old son, I'm not against you like all the others. I don't want to make you go back to all that worrying and thinking and headaches. You believe me, don't you? There was a slight hesitation. Sure, Macklin said, if you say so, why shouldn't I believe you? But there was a hesitation there, L. You worried for just a second if I could have some reason for not telling you the truth. I suppose so, Macklin said humbly. You found yourself worrying, thinking, a lot about of other problems since we left, haven't you? Maybe not the same kind of scientific problem, but more personal ones, ones you didn't used to have time to think about. If you say so, now you know it's so. But how would you like to get rid of those worries, just as you got rid of the others? Mitchell asked. I guess I'd like that, the mathematician replied. Then come on over to my laboratory. You remember where it is at, don't you? No, I, yes, I guess I do. But how do I know you won't try to put me back where I was instead of helping me more? I couldn't do that against your wishes. That would be illegal. If you say so. But I don't guess I can come anyway. The army is watching me pretty close. That's all right. Mitchell said quickly. You can bring along Colonel Carson. But he won't like you fixing me up more. But he can't stop me. Not if you want me to do it. Now listen to me. I want you to come right on over here, El. If you say so, Macklin said uncertainly. Mitchell opened the door on the first knock. Macklin stood in the doorway, looking uncertain and ill at ease. Carson stood behind his left shoulder, looking actively belligerent. Come in, Mitchell said. I have the injection ready for you, doctor. Now you aren't going to cure me, Macklin said in concern. This is just going to help ease my mind. Of course, the biologist said soothingly. Colonel Carson lunged forward, mouth opening ominously. Mitchell winked at him broadly. Carson stopped in confusion and studied Mitchell's face. He essayed a second wink. Carson relaxed. Mitchell picked up the hypo of colorless carrier fluid from the interestingly stained work table. One thing first, Dr. Macklin. I'll have to have your signed release for this treatment. It specifies that your intelligence will probably be affected in this effort to keep your head from troubling you. Carson can witness it. Sure, Macklin said. I guess that's okay, if you say so. The colonel grinned, his face hot and shiny. I'm sure it will be fine, doctor. Macklin looked at the officer with almost a trace of suspicion, then accepted the sheet of type script and the ballpoint pen from Mitchell. Laboriously, he affixed his signature. 
Mitchell had the mathematician take a seat and press the needle directly into the neck area. Ouch, Macklin said. Mitchell stood back and exhaled. It should take effect shortly, the biologist said. Good, Carson said. The cylinders of the electric clock said 4.35 a.m. Macklin was playing with his hands and their shadows in front of his face. How long will this stage last, Dr. Mitchell? Colonel Carson said in concern. Indefinitely. This is the last stage. The circulatory system of his brain has been relaxed to the point where he has about the IQ of a turnip. Carson steeled himself. So, doctor, you're nothing but a dirty Lux. No, Colonel, I've never even seen Luxembourg. My reason for doing this to Dr. Macklin were entirely patriotic, or at least sympathetic. Tell that to the hangman. I'll see you tried for treason. Look at him, Colonel. He's certainly no longer legally responsible. He has the strength of a grown man and the intellect of an amoeba. It would be impossible to keep him alive either under sedation or even in a padded cell. Even if Mrs. Macklin still refuses her consent, and I don't think she will, when she sees him in this bad state, you can go over her head and get permission for Ferris and myself to administer our antitoxin to destroy the pituitrin-absorbing virus colony in his cerebrum. Carson looked dazed. I, I'll call her. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Nineteen Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blue Blood Even if I'm only a space pilot, I'm not dumb. I mean, I'm not that dumb. I admit that Dr. Ellick and Dr. Chan outrank me, because that's the way it's got to be. A pilot is only an expendable part. But I had been the first one to see the natives on this planet, and I was the first one to point out that they came in two attractive shades of blue, light blue and dark blue. Four indigos were carrying an azure. I called the others over to the screen. A sedan chair, identified Lee Chon. Think the light-skinned one is kind of a priest? Mike Ellick shook his head. I doubt it. The chair isn't ornate enough. I think that's probably the standard method of travel, at least for a certain social elite. Do you notice anything unusual about those bully boys? Tell me what you see, Alec evaded. Three of them are mongoloid idiots, said John. I thought so, Alec said, but I wasn't quite sure, aliens and all. They're humanoids, John said, and humanoids are my specialty. I know. The fourth one doesn't look much better. His features are slack and his jaw is loose, all right, but they aren't made that way. It's an expression he could change. His head isn't shaped like that. Hmm. The man in the chair is a striking specimen. No cerebral damage in him. I don't think the answer is brain damage. If the noble trusts those four to carry him, their actions and reflexes must be pretty well coordinated. They can't have anything like palsy or epilepsy. They must breed a special type of slave for the job, Alec suggested. They aren't slaves, Mike, I told him. No, Alec said, like talking to a kid. And what are they, Mike? I breathed out hard, a little disgusted that big brains like Alec and Sean couldn't see the translucent truth. They are just four dumb slobs who can't get a better job, so they're hauling his highness around because they have to make a living the hard way. That doesn't quite cover it, Johnny, Chon said. The carriers are a completely different race. What's different about them? I asked. They've got hands to work with, eyes to see with, noses to smell with. If you kick one of them, I'll bet he'll hurt. It's just their bad luck to be dumb slobs. Ellick grunted. Unfortunately, Johnny, there are subtler differences. The darker aliens, the indigo-colored ones, seem to be definitely further down the scale of local evolution. They must be an inferior race to the lighter, azure species. Chan had been looking at us and listening to everything. Finally, he said, You can't be sure of that, Mike. 
you haven't seen all of the indigos. Some of them may not be as far down as the common carriers. Ellick sighed. Explorers have to make snap decisions on insufficient data. We don't have time to see the whole damn planet before we write up a report. Yes, explorers have to make sharp decisions, Chon repeated to himself. Are you going to take a look at those buildings, see if it's a village? I thought I'd see if our blue blood friend out there wants to show it to me, said Mike Ellick. He won't, I said. They both looked at me. You don't have any chair and nobody to carry you, I went on. He'll think you're just a slob. Jonathan, Ellick said, you show occasional flashes of genius. I smiled and shrugged it off. I know I'm not nearly as smart as you boys, but that doesn't mean I can't think at all. Ellick clapped me on the shoulder. Of course it doesn't. But his grip was too strong. Johnny, Ellick said gravely, do you think you could carry me? Wait a minute. You want me to act like one of those slobs? That's asking a lot. But could you? Not all the way to those buildings. What was the gravity reading, Lee? Chon closed his eyes for a second. Point nine seven three. There, I said. I couldn't tote you three or four miles piggyback. Look, Chon said. We can strip down a magnetic flyer and you can ride the seat, Mike. Johnny can pretend to carry you, like on a platter. It'll impress the yokels with the strength of our flunkies. Mike could carry me, I pointed out. Chon laid a delicate hand on my back. But, buddy, Mike outranks you. I shook my head. Not that way, he doesn't. We may be going to a lot of trouble for nothing, Mike said. That gang may jump us as soon as we decant and try to have us for dinner. There's always that risk, Chon agreed solemnly. But naturally, I will remain on duty at the controls of the stun cannon. Securely inside, Ellick added. Always on duty, Chon said. Always inside, Ellick said. It's in the records, Ellick. I took the last one. Lee said it a little too sharp and it cut the kidding. Go soak your soft head in brine, Ellick said, disgruntled. Wait a minute, Chon called. Ellick turned back. Yeah? Don't forget to take your communicator with you. Chon's voice was choked. You may get out of line of sight if you go off with that troop. I know this business, Alec said, turning away. Mike, I'm sorry if I offended you. Shake, huh? Alec smiled sourly. Forget it. Come on, shake. Okay, we're buddies. Do I actually have to pump your clammy paw? Please. Oh, for Pete's sake. Alec turned around and kissed Chon on the forehead. Alec was just sore, of course. But the manual warns against that sort of horseplay when you've been out a long time. Satisfied now? Alec asked. No. Chon's voice was strained tight. It should have been me to kiss you. Chon turned up to me. Look out there, Johnny. I grabbed his hand and levered it fast, before he could decide I needed kissing. Sure thing, Lee. Thanks. The buildings weren't much to see, but they were a step above primitive huts. They were adobe, or maybe plastic. The aliens understood the stress principles of the dome, Alec said, because all the buildings had curved roofs. Unbaked pottery was what they looked like to me, and they looked as if they would be brittle as coffee-colored chalk. Actually, their ceramic surfaces were at least as hard as steel. The Azor had welcomed Alec with an outstretched hand. Mike wasn't one to jump to conclusions, so he just held out his own hand. The native grabbed it and let it go after pulling it some. The alien saw me apparently carrying Alec on a seat cushion with one hand, and he kicked me in the leg. To test my muscles, I guess. I managed to keep from yelling or jumping. The Azor looked impressed, and the Indigos did a bad job of hiding a lot of envy and hate. As the Indigos toted their man along on the litter, and I guided Ellick's seat cushion along the channel of magnetic feedback, the two riders began talking. Ellick's translator caller broke the language barrier, of course. It was a two-way communicator on a direct hookup to our cybernetic calculator on the ship. 
the brain analyzed the phonetic structure of the alien language under various systems of logic or anti-logic, and fed the translation into Ellick's ear. Then it went through its memory banks and played back at the right sounds to translate Ellick's talk into the alien language. I understand things like that. I'm a pretty good mechanic. I didn't have my translator turned on, but it seemed to me that somehow I could understand what the plug uglies, the indigos, were saying. Ellick told me that it was because all their speech was based on the one universal humanoid sound, Mama. Everything good in the way of nouns and verbs, there were no other particles of speech, was some inflection of M.M., -m, and everything bad was um mm. Ellick was pretty um mm. I was plenty um mm. I threatened their jobs, they thought. They were a real miserable bunch of slobs, those indigos. We passed through the wide spaces between the houses. I wouldn't call them streets. And saw a lot of indigos crouched in doorways, watching us. And Azores being toted around. The clothing they wore was also pretty universal for sentient bipeds. A tunic or sarong, kind of. For the Azores, it was smooth and colorful. And for the indigos, a loincloth of some rough, dun-colored stuff. Alec chinned off his translator switch and leaned toward my ear. They are two distinct races, Johnny. Notice that all the indigos are menials. There does not appear to be anything to correspond to a freedman or even a higher-ranked house servant. The Azores treat the indigos only as animals. Slobs, I said. Poor dumb slobs. The nuclear flash washed over us, peppering us with a few excess wrenches. We couldn't look at the spaceship going up, but we knew it was going. It was making a dawn. The aliens were all frightened. They fell on the ground and started praying to the ship, all of them, the Azores and the Indigos. What's wrong with that crazy Chinaman? Alec yelped. Lee knows what he's doing, I said. Alec unsnapped his communicator from his belt. Johnny says you know what you're doing, John. Do you? I know, John's voice sounded right beside us, perfectly natural. Belt communicators work just as well as those consoles. People only buy consoles for prestige. Well, Alec demanded, what are you doing, Lee? I thought maybe something had gone wrong with the communicator. John's voice finally reached us. I'm leaving you and Johnny on this planet, Mike, he said. An indigo brought us our morning supply of fruit. Alec kicked the indigo. It's overripe, blockhead. Um, 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 um. The indigo backed out, bowing, eyes very round. Alec felt me looking at him. Well, I don't like kicking the oaf, but that's all he's been conditioned to understand as a sign of disapproval. Sure, I said. Alec passed through the scimitar of gray shadow into the sunlight that washed lines and years out of his face. He braced a hand against the door frame and craned his head back. It stopped and steadied. He's still there, Alec said. Sometimes I wish his orbit would decay enough to burn him up in this damn sour air. He coughed into his fist. He could probably correct, I suggested. Alec sneered. He hasn't got the brains. Pretty hard for one man to manage a takeoff. He was lucky to make it into orbit. I just wish he would come down. Somehow, anyway, I'd get to him, no matter where he went on this planet. I suppose that's why he stays up. Alec slammed his fist into his palm. I'm going to call him again. He can't get away without us. He fouled up a takeoff that badly. He's not going to try to solo into hyperspace. I don't think anyone would solo into hyperspace. I don't think he would be able to come back. Oh, what do you know about it? Alec said shortly. He's just building up his courage to try the big jump. He's yellow, sure, but sooner or later he'll get desperate enough, or scared enough, to actually go. Then we'll be stranded for fair. This planet may not be colonized for centuries. Probably never, I said, not after Lee's reports. You think he would falsify reports? Alec asked, blinking at me. I suppose he'll have to. 
Alec held his head with his hands. Of course, of course. There's no limit to the depths to which you would plummet. He ran over to the corner and snatched a communicator off the pile of our gear. I'm going to call him and tell him what I think of him and his wild obsession. I didn't remind Alec that he had been telling Sean just that at least once a day for a month. I knew his nerves got tighter and tighter, and cussing out Sean helped release them and make him feel better. Come down, Lee, Alec called. The three of us can make the jump together. You're martyring yourself for a crazy reason. We've talked this over before, Sean answered. This is the last time I'm going to respond to your call. I've made it clear to you that I think knowledge of this world will cause great suffering, a lot of death, among the majority of Earth's people. You're talking prejudicely. You're prejudice. People aren't like that anymore. We haven't gone that far, Mike. The bigots, the hate mongers, the pettiness and xenophobia lurking in everybody haven't been asleep that long. Just look at it from my side, Mike. What will the white people of Earth think about the Orientals, Negroes, and Indians of Earth when they find out the dark-skinned humanoids of another planet are, measurably, unquestionably, vastly, inferior to the light-skinned race of the same world? I ask you, Mike. Mike Ellick said, It's an inept analogy, Lee, and you know it. But most people reason by analogy, said Lee Chon. No, Mike, I have to leave you and Johnny to prevent a reoccurrence of racial hatred, intolerance, and all the ugly consequences on both sides. This is the last time I'll answer you, Mike. I'm getting lonesome. In a few years, I'll get hungry for human companionship. I don't want to be tempted down. Goodbye, Johnny. So long, Mike. Alec screamed. Wait, one more call, Lee. It's the least you can do for me. I don't know when I'll make it. It may be a few weeks or a few years. It won't be just argument, Lee. I'll have something you'll want to tell Earth about this place and these people. I'm still here. Tell it to me now, Chon's voice said. No, I want to get proof. Let me rig up some kind of video circuit for you. I can use parts out of our tape camera and the translators. I want to get it all across to you. I could hear Chon breathing. Very well. I'll answer your next call. Lee, I called out. Mike and me will be expecting you to answer. Chon laughed. I'm not going anywhere, Johnny. Only around this world every couple of hours. You couldn't make the jump through hyperspace without us, Lee, Alec said. That's right, Mike. I'm, I'm sorry to quarantine you two down there. Quarantine? Alec stormed. We're not sickly. You're the sick one. There wasn't any sound, not even breathing. You have an idea to change Lee's mind, Mike? I asked. He cupped his hand on the back of my neck. Affirmative, Jonathan. A pretty damn good one, too. Alec stood staring out the door, gnawing on one of his knuckles, letting the sun turn the front of him into gold so he looked like half a statue and half a man. I suppose it had to come out in him sooner or later, he said. What, Mike? What could we expect? It's the basic quality of treachery in the Oriental mind. When the shadows were at their longest and the alien sun was down the closest to the horizon without actually going under, Alec marched up the path shoving a new indigo. The Azores supplied Mike with all the flunkies he wanted to gather food and the like for him, as his natural right. But I thought we had had enough of them hanging around our quarters. I couldn't imagine what he would want with another one. The alien hovered at the door. Ellie kicked him in the calf to make him understand he was to go inside. Look at him, Johnny, Alec said, pushing the fellow forward. Not a mongoloid, would you say? No. The alien looked stupid, blue and stupid. His face was hanging there, but it wasn't pushed out of shape any more than the faces of the azures. The indigo blinked back at me. What he also looked was not friendly. Alec took the indigo's cheek in his hand and angled the face toward the light. He's a half-breed, Johnny, or otherwise the gene was recessive. 
He wasn't damaged before birth, only after, when he started to breathe. What do you mean, Mike? Ever hear of kyanosis, Johnny? No. Well, these creatures have something like it. The indigos don't get enough oxygen in their blood cells. It makes them sluggish. It turns them blue like the pictures of blue babies in the old books. I never saw a picture like that in an old book, I said. Did you ever see a book? Sorry, Johnny, just kidding. Ellie rubbed his hands together. Well, I theorize that there is no basic difference in the azures and the indigos except improper aeration of their blood. So you see, an indigo is only a sick azure. I'm going to make this indigo well. How can you do that? It's simple, Mike said irritably. The indigos must have malformation of the heart causing an abnormal communication between the venous and arterial side of the circulation system. A little surgery and I adjust the valve in the heart. No more communication. Proper aeration. Enough oxygen. The deep blue color goes, leaving only the lighter blue of the natural pigmentation. The patient feels better, acts better, thinks better, looks better. In short, he is no longer an indigo, but an azure. Is, is this what you're going to show Lee? I ventured. Of course. It proves the indigos aren't an inferior race. They are the same as the azures, except that they are sick. Their being sick can't reflect unfavorably on any terrestrial colored race. There is no analogy. But I have to prove it to Chon. We're going to tape the whole process and feed it to him. I think, I said, that might get to him. Sure it will. Ellick's jaw muscles flexed. I should ruin Lee with this thing, but I won't. I'm not a vindictive man. Lee and I will probably be working together for years. But whenever he gets out of line, has some stubborn idea about doing something his way, don't think I won't remind him of this. Suddenly, he was smiling again. He turned to the gawking indigo. He pointed two fingers at him. Murr? Alec asked. The alien tapped himself on his chest cavity twice. Maha, he gave his name. Maha, me me im, ma? Alec asked him, without even using the translators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The alien went, slapping himself on the chest with his open palms. Ellie turned to me, grinning. I asked him if he wanted to stop being an indigo and become an azure. He thinks I can do anything, and he's all for it. After we fed Maha a dose of null shock from our packs, Doc Ellie started to slice him open with a ceramic knife he had borrowed from the azures. But Ellie had forgotten that the alien might get frightened seeing himself cut open, even if he couldn't feel any pain. It had never happened to him before. The alien lumbered to his feet, his chest hanging open, showing his heart beating like some animal caught inside a blueberry pudding. I drove a right cross into his jaw and felt the jar all the way up to my shoulder. He melted back down onto the pallet. Good work, Johnny, Alex said. "'stooping and starting his work. "'Right away, Maha started to lose that indigo color "'and get real light, lighter than the Azers, in fact. "'None of the blue of the race was actually in the pigmentation, "'Mike found out. "'Even the Azers suffered some degree of improper aeration of the blood. "'You going to call Lee Chon now?' I asked Mike. "'You going to show him the tape we had running during the operation and all?' Not quite yet, Johnny, he said. First, I want to educate Maha a bit, up to the Azure level or better. That should convince Lee. Maha learned fast, probably faster than the Azures even. Almost the first thing he wanted was for us to stop calling him Maha and start using an Azure name, Aido. Once a day, Alec left our hut to take some exercise, a walk along the alien esplanade he called it. I used to stay with the doctored alien, now Aido, but we finally learned we could trust him to follow our orders, which were to stay inside, away from the others, since we didn't know how they would take him. 
so I got to walking along with Alec. As dusk lengthened, we could see the spark that was our ship in its orbit along the retreating horizon. Alec twisted back his head and the side of his mouth. Look at him up there. Look. The spark burned brighter and danced in another direction. He's gone. He's left us, Alec said. It's okay. He's still there. Just corrected the orbit a little bit, I guess. No, 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 Alec said. He started to make another try, but he got afraid to try to go into hyperspace alone. He was just correcting for orbital decay. You don't understand, Johnny. He's a coward. That makes him dangerous. He's getting desperate. That desperation will burst the dam of his own weakness and wash away our hope, our lives. His voice hushed. He stood staring starkly ahead, his palms outstretched at his sides. Maybe he isn't that cowardly, I said hopefully. Finished, Alec announced. He meant he had finished editing the tape showing the operation on the alien and his recovery from his blue disease, from being an indigo to a better than an azure. The transmitter is finished too, I said. Alec had suggested a way of switching the tape camera to a video converter for one of the audio communicators, and I had been able to do it easy. It took parts from both our communicators and translators, too. Alec fitted the coiled snake of tape into place. This will be a great day for your people, Aido. After our friend from heaven lands, we will be able to teach you a way to cure all of your sick, to make all the indigos like you. Like me? Make like me? Aido said in the pigeon terrestrial that Mike Alec had taught him. Yes, We'll show them how we cured you, and how all can be cured. You make show fellow like me? Make tell make that fellow like fellow like me? Everything's ready, Mike, I called. That's right, Aido, Mike said. You'll show your people the way to equality. Make all fellow like this fellow? Aido asked. Shall I call in Lee? I asked Mike. Yes, that's right, Aido, just right. No, Aido said. The alien stomped the tape camera and the communicator to bits before I could get a hammer lock on him. Ellie just stared at the complete wreck of our only means of communication with the spaceship. I be much man now. I much smart. Much smart than Azure Hicks and Indigo Slobs. I much smart all. I much man. Not to be all same now. No. The snarl hung on in Aido's throat. Alec lifted his head and sort of smiled, but not quite. Well, he said slowly and sadly, what could you expect in the way of gratitude from a dirty alien? The Azures didn't accept Aido all right. They seemed to think he must have come from some other tribe. They don't associate him with the indigo that disappeared. No indigo ever became an Azure before. Of course, Azures sometimes become indigos, we found out. It seems there's a virus of what Ellie called pseudokyanosis in the air. The Azures have become a pretty resistant breed to it, while the indigos are all easy victims. But once in a while an Azure will come down with it and turn indigo. Mike Ellie caught it too. It happened pretty fast. By the time we realized what it was, he was already too stupid to finish the operation he had started on himself. I had to sew him up, not very neatly. Alec is treated pretty much like the rest of the indigos. So am I. He takes it all pretty calm. He can still talk a little earth. Whenever anybody kicks him, Alec just mutters something about, What can a fellow expect? Bunch lousy creeps like those fellow. I guess I'll get it too. I think I'm getting it. It won't be so bad for me. Just like maybe going around drunk all the time, not being able to think or coordinate very well. It will be kind of bad being a member of an inferior race, but the thing I'll hate about it the most isn't that, or even leaving old Lee up there, circling around and waiting for our call forever. No, the thing I hate is having it happen now, just when I'm beginning to learn something.
I'm not dead sure I know just exactly what I learned, but I think maybe I do. You get just what you damn well expected all along from a bunch of blue-blooded mongrels. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Nineteen Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No substitutions. Putting people painlessly to sleep is really a depressing job. It keeps me awake at night thinking of all those bodies I've sent to the vaults, and it interferes to a marked extent with my digestion. I thought before Councilman Coleman came to see me that there wasn't much that could bother me worse. Coleman came in the morning before I was really ready to face the day. My nerves were fairly well shot from the kind of work I did as superintendent of Dreamland. I chewed up my pill to calm me down, the one to pep me up, the capsule to strengthen my qualities as a relentless perfectionist. I washed them down with gin and orange juice and sat back, building up my fortitude to do business over the polished deck of my desk. But instead of the usual morning run of hysterical relatives and masochistic mystics, I had to face one of my superiors from the committee itself. Councilman Coleman was an impressive figure in a tailored black tunic. His olive features were set off by bristling black eyes and a mobile mustache. He probably scared most people, but not me. Authority doesn't frighten me any more. I've put to sleep too many megalomaniacs, dictators, and civil servants. Warden Walker, I've been following your career with considerable interest, Coleman said. My career hasn't been very long, sir, I said modestly. I didn't mention that nobody could last that long in my job. At least none had yet. I've followed it from the first. I know every step you've made. I didn't know whether to be flattered or apprehensive. That's fine, I said. It didn't sound right. Tell me, Coleman said, crossing his legs, what do you think of Dreamland in principle? Why, it's the logical step forward in penal servitude. A man has been heading toward this since he first started civilizing himself. After all, some criminals can't be helped psychiatrically. We can't execute them or turn them free. We have to imprison them. I waited for Coleman's reaction. He merely nodded. Of course, it's barbaric to think of a prison as a place of punishment, I continued. A prison is a place to keep a criminal away from society for a specific time so he can't harm that society for that time. Punishment, rehabilitation, all of it is secondary to that. The purpose of confinement is confinement. The councilman edged forward an inch. And you really think Dreamland is the most humane confinement possible? Well, I hedged, it's the most humane we've found yet. I suppose living through a movie with full sensory participation for year after year can get boring. I should think so, Coleman said emphatically. Warden, don't you sometimes feel the old system where the prisoners had the diversions of riots, solitary confinement, television, and jailbreaks may have made time easier to serve? Do these men ever think they are actually living in these vicarious adventures? That was a question that made all of us in the Dreamland service uneasy. No, Councilman, they don't. They know they aren't really Alexander of Macedonia, Tarzan, Casanova, or Buffalo Bill. They are conscious of all the time that is being spent out of their real lives. They know they have relatives and friends outside the dream. They know, unless... Coleman lifted a dark eyebrow above a black iris. Unless... I cleared my throat. Unless they go mad and really believe the dream they are living. But as you know, sir... The rate of madness among Dreamland inmates is only slightly above the norm for the population as a whole. How do prisoners like that adjust to reality? Was he deliberately trying to ask tough questions? They don't. They think they are having some kind of delusion. Many of them become schizoid and pretend to go along with reality, while secretly knowing it to be a lie. Coleman removed a pocket secretary and broke it open. About these new free-choice models, do you think they genuinely are an improvement over the old fixed-image machines? 
"'Yes, sir,' I replied, "'by letting the prisoner project his own imagination "'onto the sense tapes and giving him a limited amount of alternatives to a situation, "'we can observe whether he is conforming to society to a larger extent.' "'I'm glad you said that, Walker,' Councilman Coleman told me warmly. "'As I said, I've been following your career closely.' and if you get through the next 24-hour period as you have through the foregoing part of your dream, you will be awakened at this time tomorrow. Congratulations. I sat there and took it. He was telling me, the superintendent of Dreamland, that my own life here was only a dream, such as I fed to my own prisoners. It was unbelievably absurd, a queasy little joke of some kind, but I didn't deny it. If it were true, if I had forgotten that everything that happened was only a dream, and if I admitted it, the councilman would know I was mad. It couldn't be true. Yet, hadn't I thought about it ever since I had been appointed warden and transferred from my personal job at the plant? Whenever I had come upon two people talking, it seemed as if I had come upon those same two people talking the same talk before. Hadn't I wondered for an instant if it couldn't be a dream, not reality at all? Once I experienced a dream for five or ten minutes. I was driving a ground car down a spidery road made into a dismal tunnel by weeping trees, a dank, lavender maze. I had known at the time it was a dream, but still, as the moments passed, I became more intent on the difficult road before me, my blocky hands on the steering wheel, thick fingers typing out the pattern of motion on the drive buttons. I could remember that. Maybe I couldn't remember being shoved into the prison vault for so many years for such and such a crime. I didn't really believe this, not then, but I couldn't afford to make a mistake, even if it were only some sort of intemperate test, as I was confident it was, with a Swede, throbbing fury against the man who would employ such a jagged broadsword for prying in his bureaucratic majesty. I've always thought, I said, that it would be a good idea to show a prisoner what the modern penal system was all about by giving him a dream in which he dreamed about dreamland itself. Yes, indeed, Coleman concurred. Just that and no more. I leaned intimately across my beautiful oak desk. I've thought that projecting officials into the dream and letting them talk with the prisoners might be a more effective form of investigation than mere observation. I should say so, Coleman remarked and got up. I had to get more out of him, some proof, some clue beyond the preposterous announcement he had made. I'll see you tomorrow at this time then, Walker. The councilman nodded curtly and turned to leave my office. I held on to the sides of my desk to keep from diving over and teaching him to change his concept of humor. The day was starting. If I got through it, giving a good show, I would be released from my dream, he had said smugly. But if this was a dream, did I want probation to reality? Horbit was a twitchy little man whose business tunic was the same rodent color as his hair. He had a pronounced tick in his left cheek. I have to get back, he told me with compelling earnestness. Mr. Horbit, Eddie, I said, glancing at his file projected on my desk pad. I can't put you back into a dream. You served your full time for your crime, the maximum. But I haven't adjusted to society. Eddie, I can shorten sentences, but I can't expand them beyond the limits set by the courts. A tear of frustration spilled out of his left eye with the next twitch. But warden, sir, my psychiatrist said that I was unable to cope with reality. Come on now, warden. You don't want a guy who can't cope with reality running around loose. He paused, puzzled. Hell, I don't know why I can't express myself like I used to. He could express himself much better in his dream. He had been Abraham Lincoln in his dream, I saw. He had lived the life right up to the night when he was taking in an American cousin at the Ford Theater. Horbett couldn't accept history that he had no more life to live. He only knew that if in his delirium he could gain dreamland once more, he could get back to the hard realities of dealing with the problems of reconstruction. Please, he begged. 
I looked up from the file. I'm sorry, Eddie. His eyes narrowed, both of them, on the next twitch. Warden, I can always go out and commit another antisocial act. I'm afraid not, Eddie. The file shows you are capable of only one crime. And you don't have a wife any more. And she doesn't have a lover. Horbett laughed. Your files aren't infallible, Warden. With one gesture, he ripped open his tunic and tore into his own flesh. No, not his own flesh. Pseudo-flesh. He took out the gun that was underneath. The beamer is made of X-ray transparent plastic, Warden, but it works as well as one made of steel and lead. Now that you've got it in here, I said in time with the pulse in my throat, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to make you go down to the vaults and put me back to sleep, Warden. I nodded. I suppose you can do that. But what's to prevent me from waking you up as soon as I've taken away your gun? This. He tossed a sheet of paper onto my desk. What's this? I asked unnecessarily. I could read it. A confession that you accepted a bribe to put me back to sleep, Horbett said, his tick beating out of feverish tempo. As soon as you've signed it, I'll use your phone to have it telefaxed to the Registrar of Private Documents. I had to admire the thought behind the idea. Horbett was convinced that I was only a figment of his unfocused imagination, but he was playing the game with uncompromising logic, trusting that even madness had hard and tight rules behind it. There was also something else I admired about the plan. It could work. Once he fed that document to the archives, I would be obligated to help him even without the gun. My word would probably be taken that I had been forced to do it at gunpoint, but there would always be doubts, enough to wreck my career when it came time for promotion. Nothing like this had ever happened in my years as warden. Suddenly, Coleman's words hit me in the back of the neck. If I got through the next twenty-four hours... This had to be some kind of test. But a test for what? Had I been deliberately told that I was living only a dream to see if my ethics would hold up, even when I thought I wasn't dealing with reality? Or if this was only a dream, was it to test to see if I was morally ready to return to the real, the earnest world? But if it was a test to see if I was ready for reality, did I want to pass it? My life was nerve-wracking and mind-wrecking, but I liked the challenge. It was the only life I knew or could believe in. What was I going to do? The only thing I knew was that I couldn't tune in tomorrow and find out. The time was now. Horbett motioned the gun to my desk set. Sign that paper. I reached out and took hold of his wrist. I squeezed. Horbett's screams brought in the guards. I picked up the gun from where he had dropped it and handed it to Captain Keller, my head guard, a tough old bird who wore his uniform like armor. Trying to force his way back to the sleep tanks, I told Keller. He nodded. Happened before, back when the old man Preston lost his grip. Preston had been my predecessor. He had lost his hold on reality like all the others before him who had served long as warden of Dreamland. A few had quit while they were still ahead and spent the rest of their lives recuperating. Our society didn't produce individuals tough enough to stand the strain of putting their fellow human beings to sleep for long. One of Keller's men had stabbed Horbett's arm with a hypo spray to blanket the pain from his broken wrist, and the man was quieter. I couldn't have done it, Warden, Horbett mumbled drowsily. I couldn't kill anybody, unless it was like that other time. Of course, Eddie, I said. I had banked on that, hadn't I, when I made my move. Or did I? Wasn't it perhaps a matter of knowing that all of it wasn't real, and that the safety cutoffs and even a free choice model of a dream machine couldn't let me come to any real harm? I had been suspiciously brave, disarming a dedicated maniac. With only an hour to spare for Jim a day, I could barely press 350 pounds. I was hardly in shape for personal combat. On the other hand, maybe I actually wanted something to go wrong so my sleep sentence would be extended. Or was it that, 
in some sane part of my mind i wanted release from unreality badly enough to take any risk to prove that i was morally capable of returning to the real world it was a carousel and i couldn't catch the brass ring no matter how many turns i went spinning through i hardly heard horbit when he half shouted at me as my men led him from the room glancing up sharply i saw him straining purposefully against the bonds of muscle and narcotic that held him you have to send me back now warden he was shrilling you have to i tried to coerce you with a gun that's a crime warden you know that's a crime i have to be put to sleep keller flicked his mustache with a thick thumbnail how about that you won't let a guy go back into the sleepy by pads so he pulls a gun on you to make you and that makes him eligible he couldn't lose warden no sir he had it made my answer to keller was forming building up in my jaw muscles but i took a pill and it went away hold him in the detention quarters i said finally i'm going to make a study of this keller winked knowingly and sauntered out of the office his left hand swinging the blackjack the committee had taken away from him a decade before the problem of what to do with keller wasn't particularly atypical of the ones i had to solve daily and i wasn't going to let that worry me much i pressed my button to let miss ingle know i was ready for the next interview they came there were the hysterical relatives the wives and mothers and brothers who demanded that their kin be awakened because they were special cases not really guilty or needed at home or possessed of such awesome talents and qualities as to be exempt from the laws of lesser men once in a while i granted a parole to a prisoner to see a dying mother or if some important project was falling apart without his help but most of the time i just sat with my eyes propped open letting a sea of vindictive screeching and beseeching wailings wash around me the relatives and legal talent were spaced with hungry-eyed mystics who were convinced they could contemplate god and their navels both consciously as an incarnation of gotama to risk sounding religiously intolerant i usually kicked these out pretty swiftly the one-time inmate who wanted back in after reprieve was fairly rare few of them ever got that crazy but it was my luck to get another the same day the day for me as horbit paulson was a tall lean man with sad eyes the clock above his sharp shoulder bone said five till noon i didn't expect him to take much out of my lunch hour warden paulson said i've decided to give myself up i murdered a blind beggar the other night for his pencils i asked paulson shifted uneasily no sir for his money i needed some extra cash and i was stronger than he was so why shouldn't i take it i examined the projection of his file he was an embezzler not a violent man he had served his time and been released conceivably he might embezzle again but the committee saw to it that temptation was never again placed in his path he would not commit a crime of violence look paulson i said a trifle testily if you have so little conscience as to kill a blind old man for a few dollars where do you suddenly get enough guilt feelings to cause you to give yourself up paulson tried his insufficient best to smile evilly it wasn't conscience warden i never lie awake a minute whenever i kill anybody it's just well dreaming isn't so bad last time i was alan pinkerton the detective it was exciting a lot more exciting than the kind of life i lead i nodded solemnly yes no doubt strangling old men in the streets can be pretty dull for a red-blooded man of action yes paulson said earnestly it does get to be humdrum routine i've been experimenting with all sorts of murders but i just don't seem to get much of a kick out of them now i'd like to try it from the other end as pinkerton again of course if you can arrange it i guess i'll have to go out and see what i can do with say an axe his eye glittered almost convincingly paulson you know i could have you watched night and day if i thought you were really a murderer 
but I can't send you back to the sleep vaults without proof and conviction for a crime. That doesn't sound very reasonable, Paulson objected, turning loose a homicidal maniac who was offering to go back to the vaults of his own free will, just because you lack a little trifling proof of his guilt. Sure, I told him, but I don't want to share the same noose with you. My job is to keep the innocent out and the convicted in. And I do my job, Paulson. But you have to. If you don't, I'll have to go out and establish my guilt with another crime. Do you want a crime on your hands, Warden? I studied his record. There was a chance, just a chance. Do you want to wait voluntarily in the detention quarters? I asked him. He agreed readily enough. I watched him out of the office and rang for lunch. The news on the wall video was dull as usual. A man got tired of hearing peace, safety, prosperity, and brotherly love all the time. I dug into my strained spinach, raw hamburger, and chewed up my white pill, my red pill, my ebony pill, and my second white pill. The gin and tomato juice took the taste away. I was ready for the afternoon session. Matrons were finishing the messy job of dragging a hysterical woman out of the office when Keller came back. He had a stubborn look on his flattened red face. "'New prisoner asking to see you personal,' Keller reported. "'Told him no, okay?' "'No,' I said. "'He can see me. "'That's the law, and you know it.' "'He isn't violent, is he?' I asked in some concern. "'The room was still in disarray. "'Nah, he ain't violent, warden. "'He just thinks he's somebody important.' Sounds like a case for therapy, not dreamland. Who does he think he is? One of the committee, Councilman Coleman. Hmm. And who is he really, Captain? Councilman Coleman. I whistled. What did they nail him on? Misuse of authority. And he didn't get suspended for that? Wasn't his first offense. Still want to see him? I gave a lateral wave of my hand. Of course. My pattern of living, call it my office routine, had been re-established through the day. I hadn't had a chance to brood much over the bombshell Coleman had tossed in my lap in the morning, but now I could think. Coleman entered wearing the same black tunic, the same superior attitude. His black eyes fastened on me. Sit down, Councilman, I directed. He deigned to comply. I studied the files flashed before me. Several times before, Coleman had been guilty of slight misuses of his authority, helping his friends, harming his enemies. Not enough to make him be impeached from the committee. His job was so hypersensitive that if every transgression earned dismissal, no one could hold the position more than a day. Even with the best intentions, mistakes can be taken for deliberate errors. Not to mention the converse. For his earlier errors, Coleman had first received a suspended sentence, then two terminal sentences to be fixed by the warden. My predecessors had given him first a few weeks, then a few months of sleep in dreamland. Coleman's eyes didn't frighten me. I focused right on the pupils. That was a pretty foul trick, Councilman. Did you hope to somehow frighten me out of executing this sentence by what you told me this morning? I couldn't follow his reasoning. Just how making me think my life was only a dream such as I imposed on my own prisoners could help him, I couldn't see. Warden Walker, Coleman intoned in his magnificent voice, I'm shocked. I'm not personally monitoring your dream. The committee as a whole will decide whether you are capable of returning to the real world. Moreover, please don't get carried away. I'm not concerned with what you do to this sensory projection of myself, beyond how it helps establish your moral capabilities. I suppose, I said heavily, that I could best establish my high moral character by excusing you from this penal sentence? Not at all, Councilman Coleman asserted. According to the facts as you know them, I am guilty and must be confined. I was stymied for an instant. I had expected him to say that I must know that he was incapable of committing such an error, and I must pardon him in spite of the misguided rulings of the courts. 
then I thought of something else. You show symptoms of being a habitual criminal, Coleman. I think you deserve life. Coleman cocked his head thoughtfully, concerned. That seems rather extreme, Warden. You would suggest a shorter sentence? If it were my place to choose, yes. A few years, perhaps. But life? No, I think not. I threw up my hands. You don't often see somebody do that, but I did. I couldn't figure him. Coleman had wealth and power as a councilman in the real world, but I had thought somehow he wanted to escape to a dream world. Yet he didn't want to be in for life, the way Paulson and Horvath did. There seemed to be no point or profit in what he had told me that morning, nothing in it for him, unless, unless what he said was literally true. I stood up. My knees wanted to quit halfway up, but I made it. This, I said, is a difficult decision for me, sir. Would you make yourself comfortable here for a time, Councilman? Coleman smiled benignly. Certainly, Warden. I walked out of my office, slowly and carefully. Horbett was sitting in his detention quarters, idly flicking through a book tape on the Civil War when I found him. The tick in his cheek marked time with every new page. President Lincoln, I said reverently. Horbett looked up, his eyes set in a clever new way. You call me that. Does it mean I'm recovering? You don't mean now that I'm getting back my right senses? Mr. President, the situation you find yourself in now is something stranger and more evil than any madness. I am not a phantom of your mind. I am a real man. This wild, distorted place is a real place. Do you think you can pull the wool over my eyes, you scamp? Mine eyes have seen the glory. Yes, sir. I sat down beside him and looked earnestly into his twitching face. But I know you have always believed in the occult. He nodded slowly. I have often suspected this was hell. Not quite, sir. The occult has its own rigid laws. It's perfectly scientific. This world is in another dimension, one that is not length, breadth, or thickness, but a real one nevertheless. An interesting theory. Go ahead. This world is more scientifically advanced than the one you are from, and this advanced science has fallen into the hands of a well-meaning despot. Horbett nodded again. The Jefferson Davis type. He didn't understand Lincoln's belief very well, but I pretended to go along with him. Yes, sir. He, our leader, doubts your abilities as president. He is not above meddling in the affairs of an alien world if he believes he is doing good. He has convicted you to this world in that belief. He chuckled. Many of my countrymen share his convictions. Maybe, I said, but many here do not. I don't. I know you must return to guide the reconstruction, but first you must convince our leader of your worth. How am I to accomplish that? Horbett asked worriedly. You're going to have a companion from now on, an agent of the leader, who will pretend to be something he isn't. You must pretend to believe in what he claims to be, and convince him of your high intelligence, moral responsibilities, and qualities of leadership. Yes, Horvath said thoughtfully. Yes. I must try to curb my tendency for telling off-color jokes. My wife is always nagging me about that. Paulson was only a few doors away from Horvath. I found him with his long, thin leg stretched out in front of him, staring dismally into the gloom of the room. No wonder he found reality so boring and depressing, with so downbeat a mood cycle. I wondered why they hadn't been able to do something about adjusting his metabolism. Paulson, I said gently, I want to speak with you. He bolted upright in his chair. You're going to put me back to sleep? I came to talk to you about that, I admitted. I pulled up a seat and adjusted the lighting so only his face and mine seemed to float bodiless in a sea of night, two moons of flesh. Paulson, or should I call you Pinkerton, this will come as a shock, a shock I know only a fine analytical mind like yours could stand. You think your life as the great detective was only a dream induced by some miraculous machine. But, sir, believe me, 
That life was real. Paulson's eyes rolled slightly back into his head and changed their luster. Then this is the dream. I've thought. No, I snapped. This world is also real. I went through the same fourth dimension waltz as I had auditioned for Horbit. At the end of it, Paulson was nodding just as eagerly. I could be destroyed for telling you this, but our leader is planning the most gigantic conquest known to any intelligent race in the universe. He is going to conquer Earth in all its possible futures and all of its possible pasts. After that, there are other planets. He must be stopped, Paulson shouted. I laid my palm on his arm. Armies can't stop him nor can fantastic secret weapons. Only one thing can stop him, the greatest detective who ever lived, Pinkerton. Yes, Paulson said. I suppose I could. He knows that, but he's a fiend. He wants a battle of wits with you, his only possible foe, for the satisfaction of making a fool of you. Easier said than done, my friend, Paulson said crisply. True, I agreed, but he is devious. The devil. He plans to convince you that he also has been removed to this world from his own, even as you have. He will claim to be Abraham Lincoln. No. Yes, and he will pretend to find you accidentally and get you to help him find a way back to his own world, glorying in making a fool of you. But you can use every moment to learn his every weakness. But wait, I know President Lincoln well. I guarded him on his first inauguration trip. How could this leader of yours fool me? Does he look like the president? Not at all, but remember, the dimensional shift changes physical appearance. You've noticed that in yourself. Yes, of course, Paulson muttered. But he couldn't hoax me. My keen powers of deduction would have seen through him in an instant. I saw Horbit and Paulson happily off in each other's company. Paulson was no longer bored by a reality in which he was matching wits with the first master criminal of the Paratime universe, and Horbit was no longer hopeless in his quest to gain another reality because he knew he was not merely insane now. It was a pair of fantastic stories that no man in his right mind would believe, but that didn't make them invalid to a brace of ex-sleepers. They wanted to believe them. The stories gave them what they were after, without me having to break the law and put them to sleep for crimes they hadn't committed. They would find out some day that I had lied to them, but maybe by that time they would have realized this world wasn't so bad. Fortunately, I was confident from their psych records that they were both incapable of ending their little game by homicide, no matter how justified they might think it was. Hey, warden, Captain Keller bellowed as I approached my office door. When are you going to let me throw that stiff Coleman into the sleepy by vaults? He's still sitting in there on your furniture as smug as you please. You don't sound as if you like our distinguished visitor very well, I remarked. It's not that. I just don't think he deserves any special privileges. Besides, it was guys like him that took away our nightsticks. My boys didn't like that. Look at me. I'm defenseless. I looked at his square figure. Not quite, Captain, not quite. Now was the time. I stretched out my wet palm toward the door. Was or was not Coleman telling the truth when he said this life of mine was itself only a dream? If it was, did I want to finish my last day with the right decision so I could return to some alien reality? Or did I deliberately want to make a mistake so I could continue living in the opiate of my dream? Then, as I touched the door, I knew the only decision that could have any meaning for me. Councilman Coleman didn't look as if he had moved since I'd left him. He was unwrinkled, unperspiring, his eyes and mustache crisp as ever. He smiled at me briefly in supreme confidence. I changed my decision then, in that moment and, in the next, changed it back to my original choice. Coleman, I said, you can get out of here. As warden, I'm granting you a five-year probation. The councilman stood up swiftly, his eyes catching little sparks of yellow light. I don't approve of your decision, warden. Not at all. Unless you alter it, 
I'll be forced to convince the rest of the committee that your decisions are becoming faulty, that you are losing your grip just as all your predecessors did. My muscles relaxed in a spasm, and it took the fresh flow of adrenaline to get me to the chair behind my desk. I took a pill. I took two pills. Tell me, Councilman, what happened to the offer to release me from this phony dream? Now you are talking as if this world was the real one. Coleman parted his lips, but then the planes of his face shifted into another pattern. You never believed me. Almost, but not quite. You knew I was on the narrow edge of this kind of job, but I'm not as far out as you seem to have thought. I can still wreck your career, you know. I don't think so. That would constitute a misuse of authority, and the next time you turn up before me, I'm going to give you life in dreamland. Coleman sat back down suddenly. "'You don't want life as a sleeper, do you?' I pursued. "'You did want a relatively short sentence of a few months or a few years. "'I can think of two reasons why. "'The answer is probably a combination of both. "'In the first place, you are a joy pauper with dreams. "'You don't want to live out your life in one, "'but you like a brief dream every few years "'like an occasional dose of a narcotic.' In the second place, you probably have political reasons for wanting to hide out somewhere in safety for the next few years. The world isn't as placid as the newscasts sometimes make it seem. He didn't say anything. I didn't think he had to. You wanted to make sure I made a painfully scrupulous decision in your case, I went on. You didn't want me to pardon you completely because of your high position, but at the same time you didn't want too long a sentence. But I'm doing you no favors. You get no time from me, Coleman. How did you decide to do this? he asked. Don't tell me you never doubted. We've all doubted since we found out about the machines, which was real and which was the dream. How did you decide to risk this? I acted the only way I could act, I said. I decided I had to act as if my life was real and that you were lying. I decided that because, if all this were false, if I could have no more confidence in my own mind and my own senses than that, I didn't give a damn if it were all a dream. Coleman stood up and walked out of my office. The clock told me it was after five. I began clearing my desk. Captain Keller stuck his head in unannounced. Hey, warden, there's an active one out here. He claims that Dreamland compromises his plan for free will of the universe. Well, escort him inside, Captain, I said. I put away my pills. Solving simple problems such as the new visitor presented always helped me to relax. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Name Your Symptom Henry Enfield placed the insulated circle on his head gently. The gleaming rod extended above his head about a foot, the wires from it leading down into his collar, along his spine and finally out his pants leg to a short metallic strap that dragged on the floor. Clyde Morgan regarded his partner. Suppose... Just suppose you were serious about this. Why not just the shoes? Enfield turned his soft blue eyes to the black and tan Oxfords with the very thick rubber soles. They might get soaked through. Morgan took his foot off the chair behind the desk and sat down. Suppose they were soaked through and you were standing on a metal plate, steps or a manhole cover. What good would your lightning rod do you then? Enfield shrugged slightly. I suppose a man must take some chances. Morgan said, You can't do it, Henry. You're crossing the line. The people we treat are on one side of the line and we're on the other. If you cross that line, you won't be able to treat people again. The small man looked out the large window, blinking myopically at the brassy sunlight. That's just it, Clyde. There is a line between us, a wall. How can we really understand the people who come to us? if we hide on our side of the wall. Morgan shook his thick head, ruffling his thinning red hair. 
I don't know, Henry, but staying on our side is a pretty good way to keep sane, and that's quite an accomplishment these days. Enfield whirled and stalked to the desk. That's the answer. The whole world is going mad, and we're just sitting back watching it hike along. Do you know what we are doing is really the most primitive medicine in the world? We are treating the symptoms and not the disease. One cannibal walking another with sleeping sickness doesn't cure anything. Eventually the savage dies, just as all those sick savages out in the street will die unless we can cure the disease, not only the indications. Morgan shifted his ponderous weight uneasily. Now, Henry, it's no good to talk like that. We psychiatrists can't turn back the clock. There just aren't enough of us or enough time to give that old-fashioned therapy to all the sick people. Enfield leaned on the desk and glared. I called myself a psychiatrist once, but now I know we're semi-mechanics, semi-engineers, semi-inventors, semi-lots of other things, but certainly not even semi-psychiatrists. A psychiatrist wouldn't give a foic gyro to a man with claustrophobia. His mind went back to the first gyro ball he had ever issued. The remembrance of his pride in the thing sickened him. Floating before him in memory was the vertical hoop and the horizontal hoop, both of shining steel impervium alloy. Transfixed in the twin circles was the face of the patient, slack with smiles and sweat. But his memory was exaggerating the human element. The gyro actually passed over a man's shoulder, through his legs, under his arms. Any time he felt the walls creeping in to crush him, he could withdraw his head and limbs into the circle and feel safe. Steel impervium alloy could resist even a nuclear explosion. The foic gyro ball was worn day and night for life. The sickness overcame him. He sat down on Morgan's desk. That's just one thing, the gyro ball. There are so many others, so many. Morgan smiled. You know, Henry, not all of our cures are so... So not at all like that. Those cures for mother complexes aren't even obvious. If anybody does see that button in a patient's ear, it looks like a hearing aid. Yet for a nominal sum, the patient is equipped to hear the soothing recorded voice of his mother saying, It's all right. Everything's all right. Mommy loves you. It's all right. But is everything all right? Enfield asked intensely. Suppose the patient is driving over 100 on an icy road. He thinks about slowing down, but there's a voice in his ear. Or suppose he's walking down a railroad track and hears a train whistle, if he can hear anything over that verbal pablum gushing in his ear. Morgan's face stiffened. You know as well as I do that those voices are nearly subsonic. They don't cut a sense efficiency more than 23%. At first, Clyde, only at first... But what about the severe case where we have to burn a three-dimensional smiling mother image on the eyes of the patient with radiation? With that kind of image over everything he sees, and with that insidious voice drumming in his head night and day, do you mean to say that a man's senses will only be impaired 23%? Why, he'll turn violently schizophrenic sooner or later, and you know it. The only cure we have for that is still a straitjacket a padded cell, or one of those inhuman lobotomies. Morgan shrugged helplessly. You are an idealist. You're damned right, Enfield slammed the door behind him. The cool air of the street was a relief. Enfield stepped into the mainstream of human traffic and tried to adjust to the second change of the air. People didn't bathe very often these days. He walked along, buffeted by the crowd, carried along in this direction, "'shoved back in that direction. "'Most people in the crowd seemed to be normals, "'but you couldn't tell. "'Many cures were not readily apparent. "'A young man with black glasses and a radar headset, "'a photophobe, was unable to keep from being pushed against Enfield. "'He sounded out the lightning rod, "'his face changing when he realized it must be some kind of cure. "'Pardon me,' he said warmly. "'Quite all right.' It was the first time in years that anyone had apologized to Enfield for anything. He had been one of those condemned normals, more to be scorned than pitied. 
Perhaps he could really get to understand these people, now that he had taken down the wall. Suddenly, something else was pushing against Enfield, forcing the air from his lungs. He stared down at the magnetic suction dart clinging leech-like to his chest. Model Acrophobe 101X, he cataloged immediately. Description, safety belt. But his emotions didn't behave so well. He was thoroughly terrified, heart racing, sweat glands pumping. The impervium cable undulated vulgarly. Some primitive fear of snake symbols? His mind wandered while panic crushed him. Uncouple that cable, the shout rang out. It was not his own. A clean-cut young man with mouse-colored hair was moving toward the stubble-chinned, heavy-shouldered man quivering in the center of a web of impervium cables stuck secure to the walls and windows of buildings facing the street, the sidewalk, a mailbox, the lamppost, and infield. Mouse hair yelled hoarsely, "'Uncouple it, Davies. Can't you see the guy's got a lightning rod? You're grounding him.' "'I can't,' Davis groaned. "'I'm scared.' Halfway down the twenty feet of cable, Mouse Hair grabbed on. I'm holding it. Release it, you hear? Davies fumbled for the broad belt around his thickening middle. He jabbed the button that sent a negative current through the cable. The magnetic suction dart dropped away from infield like a thing that had been alive and now was killed. He felt an overwhelming sense of relief. After breathing deeply for a few moments, he looked up to see Davies releasing and drawing all his darts into his belt, making it resemble a hydra-sized spiked dog collar. Mouse Hair stood by tensely as the crowd disassembled. "'This isn't the first time you've pulled something like this, Davis,' he said. "'You weren't too scared to release that cable. You just don't care about other people's feelings. This is official.' Mouse Hair drove a fast, hard ride into the soft blue flesh of Davis's chin. The big man fell silently. The other turned to Enfield. He was conscious on his feet, he explained. He never knew he fell. What did you mean by that punch being official? Enfield asked while trying to arrange his feelings into the comfortable, familiar patterns. The young man's eyes almost seemed to narrow, although his face didn't move. He merely radiated narrowed eyes. How long have you been cured? Not, not long, Enfield evaded. The other glanced around the street. He moistened his lips and spoke slowly. Do you think you might be interested in joining a fraternal organization of the cured? Enfield's pulse raced, trying to get ahead of his thoughts and losing out. A chance to study a pseudo-culture of the cured developed in isolation. Yes, I think I might. I owe you a drink for helping me out. How about it? The man's face paled so fast, Enfield thought for an instant he was going to faint. All right, I'll risk it. He touched the side of his face away from the psychiatrist. Enfield shifted around, trying to see that side of his benefactor, but couldn't manage it in good grace. He wondered if the fellow was sporting a mom voice hearing aid, and was afraid of raising her ire. He cleared his throat, noticing the affectation of it. My name's Enfield. Price, the other answered absently. George Price. I suppose they have liquor at the club. We can have a drink there, I guess. Price set the direction, and Enfield fell in at his side. Look, if you don't drink, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. It was just a suggestion. Under the mousy hair, Price's strong features were beginning to gleam moistly. You are a lucky one that way, Mr. Enfield. People take one look at your cure and don't ask you to go walking in the rain. But even after seeing this, some people still ask me to have a drink. This was revealed, as he turned his head, to be a small metal cube above his left ear. Enfield supposed it was a cure although he had never issued one like it. He didn't know if it would be good form to inquire what kind it was. It is a cure for alcoholism, Price told him. It runs a constant blood check to see that the alcohol level doesn't go over the sobriety limit. What happens if you take one too many? 
Price looked off as if at something not particularly interesting, but more interesting than what he was saying. It drives a needle into my temple and kills me. The psychiatrist felt cold fury rising in him. The cures were supposed to save lives, not endanger them. What kind of irresponsible idiot could have issued such a device? He demanded angrily. I did, Price said. I used to be a psychiatrist. I was always good in chop. This is a pretty effective mechanism, if I say so myself. It can't be removed without causing my death, and it's indestructible. Impervium shielded, you see. Price probably would never get crazed enough for liquor to kill himself, Enfield knew. The threat of death would keep him constantly shocked sane. Men hide in the comforts of insanity, but when faced with death, they are often forced back to reality. A man can't move his legs. In a fire, though, he may run. His legs were definitely paralyzed before, and maybe again, but for one moment he would forget the moral defeat of his life and his withdrawal from life and live an enforced sanity. But sometimes the withdrawal was, or could become, too complete. We're here. Enfield looked up self-consciously and noticed that they had crossed two streets from his building and were standing in front of what appeared to be a small, dingy cafe. He followed Price through the screeching screen door. They seated themselves at a small table with a red check cloth. Enfield wondered why cheap bars and restaurants always used red check cloths. Then he looked closer and discovered the reason. They did a remarkably good job of camouflaging the spots of grease and alcohol. A fat man who smelled of the grease and alcohol of the tablecloths shuffled up to them with a towel on his arm, staring ahead of him at some point in time rather than space. Price lit a cigarette with unsteady hands. Reggie is studying biblical text. Cute gadget. His contact lenses are made up of a lot of layers of polarized glass. Every time he blinks, the amount of polarization changes and a new page appears. His father once told him that if he didn't study his Bible and pray for him, his old dad would die. The psychiatrist knew the threat on the father's part couldn't create such a fixation by itself. His eyebrows faintly inquired. Price nodded jerkily. Twenty years ago, at least. What will you have, Georgie? Reggie asked. The young man snubbed out his cigarette viciously. Bourbon, straight. Reggie smiled, a toothy, vacant comedy relief smile. Fine. The good book says a little wine is good for a man, or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Of course he didn't, Enfield knew. Why should he? It was useless to learn his Bible lessons to save his father, because it was obvious his father was dead. He would never succeed because there was no reason to succeed. But he had to try, didn't he, for his father's sake? He didn't hate his father for making him study. He didn't want him to die. He had to prove that. Enfield sighed. At least this device kept the man on his feet, doing some kind of useful work instead of rotting in a padded cell with a probably imaginary Bible. A man could cut his wrists with the edge of a sheet of paper if he tried long enough, so of course the Bible would be imaginary. But Georgie, the waiter complained, you know you won't drink it. You ask me to bring you drinks and then you just look at them. Boy, do you look funny when you're looking at drinks. Honest, Georgie, I want to laugh when I think of the way you look at a glass with a drink in it. He did laugh. Price fumbled with the cigarette stub in the black iron ashtray, examining it with the skill of scientific observation. Mr. Enfield is buying me the drink that makes it different. Reggie went away. Price kept dissecting the tobacco and paper. Enfield cleared his throat and again reminded himself against such obvious affectations. You were telling me about some organization of the cured, he said as a reminder. Price looked up, no longer interested in the relic of a cigarette. He was suddenly intensely interested and intensely observant of the rest of the café. Was I? I was? Well, suppose you tell me something. 
What do you really think of the incompletes? The psychiatrist felt his face frown. Who? I forgot. You haven't been one of us long. The incompletes is a truer name for the so-called normals. Have you ever thought of just how dangerous these people are, Mr. Enfield? Frankly, no, Enfield said, realizing it was not the right thing to say, but tiring of constant pretense. You don't understand. Everyone has some little phobia or fixation. Maybe everyone didn't have one once, but after being told they did have them for generations, everyone who didn't have one developed a defense mechanism and an aberration so that they would be normal. If that phobia isn't brought to the surface and cured, it may arise any time and endanger the other people. The only safe, good sound citizens are cured. Those lacking cures, the incompletes, must be dealt with. Enfield's throat went dry. And you're the one to deal with them? It's my destiny, Price quickly added. And yours too, of course. Enfield nodded. Price was a demagogue. Young, handsome, dynamic, likable, impassioned with his cause, and convinced that it was his divine destiny. He was a psychopathic egoist and a dangerous man. Doubly dangerous to Enfield because, even though he was one of the few people who still read books from the old days of therapy to recognize Price for what he was, he nevertheless still liked the young man for the intelligence behind the egotism and the courage behind the fanaticism. How are we going to deal with the incompletes? Enfield asked. Price started to glance around the cafe, then half shrugged almost visibly thinking that he shouldn't run that routine into the ground. Well, cure them whether they want to be cured or not, for their own good. Enfield felt cold inside. After a time he found that the roaring was not just in his head. It was thundering outside. He was getting sick. Price was the man who could spread his ideas throughout the ranks of the cured, if indeed the plot was not already universal, imposed upon many ill minds. He could picture an entirely cured world, and he didn't like the view. Every cure cut down on the mental and physical abilities of the patient as it was, whether Morgan and the others admitted it or not. But if everyone had a crutch to lean on for one phobia, he would develop secondary symptoms. People would start needing two cures, perhaps a phoetic gyro and a safety belt, then another, and another. There would always be a crutch to lean on for one thing, and then room enough to develop something else, until everyone would be loaded down with too many cures to operate. A cure was the last resort. Dope for a malignancy case. Euthanasia for the hopeless. Enforced cures would be a curse for the individual and the race. But Enfield let himself relax. How could anyone force a mechanical relief for neurotic or psychopathic symptoms on someone who didn't want or need it? Perhaps you don't see how it could be done, Price said. I'll explain. Reggie's heavy hand sat a straight bourbon down before Price and another before Enfield. Price stared at the drink almost without comprehension of how it came to be. He started to sweat. George, drink it. The voice belonged to a young woman, a blonde girl with pink skin and suave, draped clothes. In this den of the cured, Enfield thought half-humorously, it was surprising to see a normal, an incomplete. But then he noticed something about the baby she carried. The cure had been very simple. It wasn't even a mechanized, half-human robot, just a rag doll. She sat down at the table, George, she said, drink it. One drink won't raise your alcohol index to the danger point. You've got to get over this fear of even the sight or smell of liquor. The girl turned to Enfield. You're one of us, but you're new, so you don't know about George. Maybe you can help if you do. It's all silly. He's not an alcoholic. He didn't need to put that cure on his head. It's just an excuse for not drinking. All of this is just because a while back something happened to the baby here. She adjusted the doll's blanket. When he was drinking, 
just drinking, not drunk. I don't remember what happened to the baby. It wasn't important. But George has been brooding about it ever since. I guess he thinks something else bad will happen because of liquor. That's silly. Why don't you tell him it's silly? Maybe it is, Enfield said softly. You could take the shock if he downed that drink, and the shock might do you good. Price laughed shortly. I feel like I'm doing something very melodramatic, like throwing my drink, and yours, across the room, but I haven't got the guts to touch those glasses. Do it for me, will you? Cauterizing the bite might do me good if I'd been bitten by a rabid dog, but I don't have the nerve to do it. Before Enfield could move, Reggie came and set both drinks on a little circular tray. He moved away. I knew it. That's all he did. Just look at the drink. Makes me laugh. Price wiped the sweat off his palms. Enfield sat and thought Mrs. Price cooed to the rag doll, unmindful of either of them now. You were explaining, the psychiatrist said. You are going to tell me how you are going to cure the incompletes. I said we were going to do it. Actually, you will play a greater part than I, Dr. Enfield. The psychiatrist sat rigidly. You didn't think you could give me your right name in front of your own office building and I wouldn't recognize you? I know some psychiatrists are sensitive about wearing cures themselves, but it is a mark of honor of the completely sane man. You should be proud of your cure and eager to cure others. Very eager. Just what do you mean? He already suspected Price's meaning. Price leaned forward. There is one phobia that is so widespread, a cure is not even thought of. Hypochondria. Hundreds of people come to your office for a cure and you turn them away. Suppose you and the other cured psychiatrists give everybody who comes to you a cure. Enfield gestured vaguely. A psychiatrist wouldn't hand out cures unless they were absolutely necessary. You'll feel differently after you've been cured for a while yourself. Other psychiatrists have. Before Enfield could speak, a stubble-faced, barrel-chested man moved past their table. He wore a safety belt. It was the man Price had called Davies, the one who had fastened one of his safety lines to Enfield in the street. Davies went back to the bar in the back. Give me a bottle, he demanded of a vacant-eyed Reggie. He came back toward them, carrying the bottle in one hand, brushing off raindrops with the other. He stopped beside Price and glared. Price leaned back. The chair creaked. Mrs. Price kept cooing to the doll. You made me fall, Davies accused. Price shrugged. You were unconscious. You never knew it. Sweat broke out on Davis's head. You broke the code. Don't you think I can imagine how it was to fall? You louse! Suddenly, Davis triggered his safety belt. At close range, before the lines could fan out in a radius, all the lines in front attached themselves to Price. The ones at each side clung to their table and floor, and all the others to the table behind infield. Davies released all the lines except those on Price. Then he threw himself backward, dragging Price out of his chair and onto the floor. Davies didn't mind making others fall. They were always trying to make him fall, just so they could laugh at him or pounce on him. Why shouldn't he like to make them fall first? Expertly, Davies moved forward and looped the loose lines around Price's head and shoulders and then around his feet. He crouched beside Price and shoved the bottle into the gasping mouth and poured. Price twisted against the binding lines in blind terror, gagging and spouting whiskey. Davies laughed and tilted the bottle more. Mrs. Price screamed, The cure! If you get that much liquor in his system, it will kill him! She rocked the rag doll in her arms, trying to soothe it, and stared in horror. Enfield hit the big man behind the ear. He dropped the bottle and fell over sideways on the floor. Fear and hate mingled in his eyes as he looked up at Enfield. Nonsense, Enfield told himself. Eyes can't register emotion. Davies released his lines and drew them in. 
He got up precariously. I'm going to kill you, he said, glaring at Enfield. You made me fall worse than Georgie did. I'm really going to kill you. Enfield wasn't a large man, but he had pressed 250 many times in the gym. He grabbed Davis's belt with both hands and lifted him about six inches off the floor. I could drop you, the psychiatrist said. No, Davies begged weakly, please. I'll do it if you cause more trouble. Enfield sat down and rubbed his aching forearms. Davies backed off in terror, right into the arms of Reggie. The waiter closed his huge hands on the acrophobe's shoulders. You broke the code all the way, Reggie said. The good book says, thou shouldn't kill, or something like that, and so does the code. Let him go, Reggie, Price choked out, getting to his feet. I'm not dead. He wiped his hand across his mouth. No, no, you aren't. Enfield felt an excitement pounding through him, same as when he had diagnosed his first case. No, better than that. That taste of liquor didn't kill you, Price. Nothing terrible happened. You could find some way to get rid of that cure. Price stared at him as if he were a padded cell case. That's different. I'd be a hopeless drunk without the cure. Besides, no one ever gets rid of a cure. They were all looking at Enfield. Somehow he felt this represented a critical point in history. It was up to him which turn the world took, the world as represented by these four cured people. I'm afraid I'm for less cures instead of more, Price. Look, if I can show you that someone can discard a cure, would you get rid of that, if I may use the word, monstrous thing on your head? Price grinned. Enfield didn't recognize its smugness at the time. I'll show you. He took off the circlet with the lightning rod and yanked at the wire running down into his collar. The new old excitement within was running high. He felt the wire snap and come up easily. He threw the cure on the floor. Now, he said, I'm going out into that rainstorm. There's thunder and lightning out there. I'm afraid, but I can get along without a cure, and so can you. You can't. Nobody can, Pierce screamed after him. He turned to the others. If he reveals us, the cause is lost. We've got to stop him for good. We've got to go after him. It's slippery, Davies whimpered. I might fall. Mrs. Price cuddled her rag doll. I can't leave the baby, and she mustn't get wet. Well, there's no liquor out there, and you can study your text in the lightning flashes, Reggie. Come on. Running down the streets that were tunnels of shining tar, running into the knifing ice bristles of the rain, Henry Enfield realized he was very frightened of the lightning. There is no action without a reason, he knew from the old neglected books. He had had a latent fear of lightning when he chose the lightning rod cure. He could have picked a safety belt or a foic gyro just as well. He sneezed. He was soaked through, but he kept on running. He didn't know what Price and Reggie planned to do when they caught him. He slipped and fell. He would soon find out what they wanted. The excitement was all gone now, and it left an empty space into which fear rushed. Reggie said, We shall make a sacrifice. Enfield looked up and saw the lightning reflected on the blade of a thin knife. Enfield reached toward it more in fascination than fear. He managed to get all his fingers around two of Reggie's. He jerked and the knife fell into Enfield's palm. The psychiatrist pulled himself erect by holding to Reggie's arm. Staggering to his feet, he remembered what he must do and slashed at the waiter's head. A gash streaked across the man's brow and blood poured into his eyes. He screamed, I can't see the words. It was his problem. Enfield usually solved other people's problems, but now he ran away. He couldn't even solve his own. Enfield realized that he had gone mad as he held the thin blade high overhead, but he did need some kind of lightning rod. Price, who was right behind him gaining, had been right. No one could discard a cure. 
He watched the lightning play its light on the blade of his cure, and he knew that Price was going to kill him in the next moment. He was wrong. The lightning hit him first. Reggie squinted under the bandage at the lettering on the door that said, Infield and Morgan, and opened the door. He ran across the room to the man sitting at the desk, reading by the swivel light. Mr. Morgan, your partner, Mr. Enfield, he... Just a moment. Morgan switched on the room lights. What were you saying? Mr. Enfield went out without his cure in a storm and was struck by lightning. We took him to the morgue. He must have been crazy to go out without his cure. Morgan stared into his bright desk light without blinking. This is quite a shock to me. Would you mind leaving? I'll come over to your place and you can tell me about it later. Reggie went out. Yes, sir. He was struck by lightning, struck dead. He must have been crazy to leave his cure. The door closed. Morgan exhaled. Poor Enfield. But it wasn't the lightning that killed him, of course. Morgan adjusted the soundproofing plugs in his ears, thinking that you did have to have quite a bit of light to read lips. The thunder, naturally, was what killed Enfield. Loud noise, any noise, that would do it every time. Too bad Enfield had never really stopped being one of the incompletes. Dangerous people. He would have to deal with them. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mind Snake Witch! Witch! The cry was among the walkers, but he didn't bother to track it down. It was no longer a fighting word to Hammond. He wore it like a badge of honor. It tasted of brass, but it gleamed on him. A puzzled growl came from the familiar at his heels. The dog could never understand how people could hate Hammond. Lad, the dog, often asked Hammond how anyone could possibly hate Hammond, and Hammond always told him to shut up. He couldn't understand. He was only a dog. The walk ramp was crowded this afternoon with people fresh from the transmitter stations, eager to tell themselves that they were walking on a strange planet. Hammond passed among the nudists, the cavaliers, the zip suiters, the zoot suiters, the ivy coated, the moss covered, walking not only for novelty or exercise, but because he preferred to go everywhere under his own power, even to the stars. Hale and Laura saluted him a few paces away from the entrance to the station. They were a beautiful blonde couple, with brightly polished faces. Hammond didn't much like them but he didn't feel sufficiently pressed to be rude enough to let them become aware of it. "'How goes it, kids?' he asked them. "'Couldn't be better,' Hale said. "'Of course not,' Laura added. Hammond's slate eyes moved from the man to the woman. "'Are you troubled?' "'This isn't the time to talk about it. Not before you and Lad transmit yourself,' the girl said quickly. "'It wasn't,' Hammond admitted to himself." Only now that they had let it slip, he would rest better knowing the whole truth of it. Come on, Hammond urged. It's not as if I wasn't interested. Hale looked at his wife. Laura doesn't like Wagner any more. Perdition, said Hammond. I never liked Wagner. She's growing up. Laura put a half-closed fist to her lips and didn't look at either of the men or at the dog who stood with freshly pointed ears. No, she said softly. I lost something on the last one. Gee, I wonder if the mind snake likes Wagner now. Still, it's not as if I stopped liking music altogether, or books. Not this time. Hale grabbed her arm roughly. You're sure doing a great job of getting Hammond ready for the jump. Laura's eyes clouded. I'm sorry, Ham. She looked up, smiled warmly kissed her fingertips and placed them on Hammond's lips. Companion's code, huh? He took her hand and for the moment liked her. Okay, honey, I guess even a witch squeezes in under the wire for that. The young team was abruptly embarrassed. Oh, well, witch, Hale said depreciatingly. What does Cargo know, anyway? 
Hammond laughed and scratched Lad's ears. They know I'm a witch, but it has its advantages. I don't have to worry about Lad losing his taste for Wagner. A dog doesn't have that much to lose. If it comes to that, he's just gone. Laura shuddered delicately the way of a watered flower. How could you stand to lose a companion with so little feeling? I've lost three companions and got myself and my cargo into port. They were only dogs. Hale looked at him sharply. But you were companioning with them. It must have been, he selected a word, difficult for you. Don't absorb the cargo superstition about witches and their familiars. They have fogged even dirty ideas. They were just dogs to me, like Lad. A dog, that's all he is, Gorda said in a manner designed to explain the thing patiently to Hammond. Lad is a dog. Why do you emphasize the point now? Hammond demanded. The companion sat on a seat formed from a single S-shaped plastic surface. Hammond studied the bulk of Gordas, coordinator of transmatters, who sat hulked in his utility chair in the bubble office overhanging the city of the sea, on the world of Lanola. Hammond was comfortable, cooled, relaxed, amused by the light play of sensory electron music, and aggressively unhappy. Gorda sat in his great chair, patting the hair on the back of his left hand with his right palm, as if the fist were a sleeping kitten. At Hammond's feet, Lad's neck muscles quivered uneasily. "'Your record, Hammond,' Gorda said at last, "'is a good one. "'How could it be better? "'I've never lost one member of a cargo. "'But you have lost three companions. "'Familiars, dogs. "'But it shows weakness.' Harmon's face heated. I never show weakness. Not your weakness, my dear boy, Gorda said in exaggeration. The weakness of the witch familiar relationship. The weakness of witches as companions and all. Don't take it personally. Hammond leaped to his feet. Lad's muzzle gleamed white. Not take it personally, Hammond cried. How else can I take it? You are questioning the worthiness of my profession, of my way of life. You question the honor of many of my friends, my associates. Witchery is an ancient profession. My grandmother and uncle were witches before me. Witches have an unparalleled record of service to trans matters and to the human race. How dare you, sir? Gordas waved a fat hand in front of him, laughing up and down the scale. No, no. "'No, peace, please. "'You have no need to plead so strongly for the case of witches. "'You don't have to be a witch, you know, Hammond. "'You're good enough to be a regular, full-fledged companion. "'The reason you get so many of your cargo through "'is that you, in the most literal sense, companion them all. "'It would be possible for you to use a fellow companion on your jumps "'instead of a familiar.' "'Hammond sat down, no longer angry or energetic.' No, no, it wouldn't be possible for me to do that. I can take people on an occasional jump for high pay, but I couldn't stand the same kind of contact, day in and day out, with another human being. Pay doesn't come that high. Gordas gave another laugh and killed it sharply. And there you were a few moments ago, bragging about all the service witches had been to the human race, and when we get down to it, "'Turns out you hate the human race.' "'Hammond tasted the inside of his dry mouth "'and longed for a way out. "'I don't hate it. "'I just can't stand it. "'There's a difference.' "'If you say so. "'But tell me, do you like your fellow companions "'or even your fellow witches "'any better than you do your cargo?' "'No,' Hammond admitted. "'Good. "'Then we can stop this foolish talk "'about the witch's service to mankind.' since you don't give a damn about either witches or mankind. You care only about one witch. Your interests are entirely self-interests, correct? Yes. Good. Better. Now I suppose you are not entirely satisfied with the benefits you now receive as a witch. You would like more money, pleasure, power, prestige. You have ambition, greed, hunger, desire? Yes. Fine. I didn't think you had altogether ceased to be a human. 
then I can tell you that the transmitter service has to perform its most important mission, and you are thought to be the best man for it. Most important mission, said Hammond. Best man? Gordas became happy. Those are questions, but I can't tell you the answers. Not yet. First, you must promise us the added protection of taking a human companion for this assignment. Why should I want to do that, Gordas? Because I have promised that you would, and I never fail. Hammond stood for the second time. Sorry, not good enough reason for me. Gordas's face splintered into confusion. But as your superior, as your coordinator, I order you to take a human companion for this assignment. Gordas, Hammond said, you were once a companion yourself. When I was younger, while my wife was alive. Then rescind your order or I'll kill you, under the code, in a duel. Gordas sneered. I have never been beaten. Obviously, Hammond said. He didn't point out anything about his own status. No. It was a final thing. Are you armed this instant? The coordinator shook his heavy head. Then I plead grievance and choose weapons. Appeal? The other shrugged. Choose. Hammond was breathing deeply and regularly in preparation. Before this is closed, I want to remind you that the law and the code both state that no one can interfere in the relationship between a team. Doesn't apply, Gordas said. The Act of 97 recognized the companionship of witches, but it did not extend the privilege to familiars. Naturally not. You are a companion, and I could not separate you from a human companion, but I can order you to break from Lad. That isn't just. I know, but we're talking about law, not justice. Do you wish aid from your fellow companion? Hammond asked. In later years, I have often wished for it, but my formal reply, no. Then, Hammond said, I name our weapons as the body. The time, this instant. I can kill you easily with my bare hands, and Lad will help with his teeth. An eyebrow-hedged ridge of fat above Gordas's eye angled. Use the dog and you'll get in trouble. Not before a companion's court. But if you so state your preference, I will only use my own body. Hammond, about this matter, the coordinator said. I'll think about it. An hour, Hammond said, and turned on his heel. Hammond, Gordas called out. Hammond looked back to face a level destruction gun. You know the code, Gordas explained. The challenge wasn't withdrawn. You struck the field. A coward may be killed by any weapon. You're too modest, Hammond told him. Gordas smiled and fed the gun into a compartment of his utility chair. I only want to prove a point. I can kill you any time, anywhere. No one can beat me. Can they? Can they, Hammond? The sweat stung Hammond's palms so hard he could almost taste the salt in it with his fingers. I'll do it. Gratitude is a part of honor. Yes, the code. You do believe in that. You haven't asked me yet who your human companion on the jump will be. Who? Hammond asked. As you yourself pointed, I still come under the code myself. I agreed to take a human companion, but I did not agree to take Gordas himself, Hammond explained to his wrist phone in the clove outside the coordinator's office. I think it's a terrible thing, Laura said. But why don't you jump with him, Gordas, I mean? I hate him, Hammond explained. Oh, sure, I guess I do, too. I never thought about being a companion with him. Oh, oh, hail swimming in now. Aside, over here, darling, Ham's calling. From afar, who? Aside, Hammond the witch. Why didn't you say so? Into the phone. Hi, fellow. What can we do for you? You can do a lot for me. For you, huh? That comes high, you know. What'll it be? Hammond retold his story and finished with, That's why I called you two. I need a human companion. Anybody other than Gordas. A slithering voice, then faint but distinct from Laura. I couldn't do it and I can't let you do it. 
Afterward, whichever of us, it would be as if I were no better than a dog. Hammond stared ahead of him at the clove wall. Ham, Hale said, why did you come to us with this? You were friends of mine, Hammond said. No, no. We aren't friends of yours, Ham, Hale said patiently. We're just acquaintances of yours. We'd like to help you out, but not enough to split our team for you. Surely you've got some real friends, people you look better to than us. Hell, man, don't you know what a friend is? Hammond thought of it. I suppose not. But there must be someone, Hale said in embarrassment, a woman. I know a woman which, on another world, we make love together sometimes, but I know her only well enough to know better than to ask favors of her. There are lots of witches, Hale said in nervous exasperation. One of them is bound to companion with you on a thing like this. Ham touched his fingers to his wrist. I think not. No other witch is going to help me set a precedent to put them out of the trade. But the code, Hale said furiously. Surely you can count on your fellow witches under the code. Why? I couldn't count on my fellow companions under the code, said Hammond, and pressed his wrist phone into silence. Hammond stepped from the clove back into Gordis's office to find a lovely golden woman groveling at the coordinator's feet. The coordinator was smiling at the pleasure of the thing. What's this? Hammond demanded. Cargo, Gorda said. Is she ill? Mad. Then she can't be transmitted. No one could hold together a disintegrating personality in transmission, Hammond said. It will be difficult, unprecedentedly difficult. That is why it will take two of us acting as companions to bring her safely to Earth. Why is it so important that she get to Earth? Ask her, Gorda suggested. Hammond glanced down and saw a lad nosing pointedly at the woman. Often he forgot that the dog was constantly at his side. His eyes lifted up to the woman. She had fine features, impressive blonde hair, and she was wrapped in a frazzled blanket. Indigo rubbed away to white threads here and there. "'What is your name, woman?' Hammond asked. "'I know what it is.' "'Of course you do,' he said sharply. "'But I don't.' "'I know you don't.' "'There isn't that much to know, is there?' "'I know everything,' she confessed humbly, honey eyes down. Hammond whirled to Gordas. "'What do they want with her on earth?' The coordinator gestured eloquently. She knows everything. Do you think they know everything on earth? Don't believe propaganda. There are things she can tell them. Hammond looked again to the creature huddled on the floor. What could she tell anyone? There are words buried in any conglomeration of letters. Confusion is the basis of all codes. There is always a cipher for any code. Hammond exhaled. Never mind. What do I care what they want with her? All right, I'll try to take her through. You don't want me to use the dog? No, it won't do. Then let me take her alone. I could do it this once. Negative. Besides, need I remind you that you have already graciously agreed to take a human companion? And, Hammond said ponderously, I can't get any companion other than you to go with me. You can't? Sad. But why wouldn't I be acceptable? I hate your soul. No doubt, Gorda sighed, but I believe you said you hated all people. I can't stand people, only some people especially do I hate. I see, but surely it is only a small difference in degree, not kind, between the contempt and aversion you hold for humanity at large, and that which you hold for me. Surely that difference is too small to cause you to break your word, given under the code. I suppose it is. The words tasted bad in his mouth. Very well, I'll transmit with you. Of course you will, the coordinator said smoothly. Are you ready to transmit now? Of course we are. Hammond stood within the platform diagram with Gordis and the woman. Beyond the boundary stood the technicians, one at the control mosaic, the other holding the neck of Lad, who suffered it under orders. "'Wiggle away from the mind snake, citizens,' a technician called. "'A native,' Hammond thought. 
He had never been in transmission himself. No one who had ever joked about the mind snake, or rarely even spoke of him. Hammond looked around him, slate eyes, chalking the outline of the diagram in which they stood. It was only a rectangle, but shouldn't it be rather a pentagram? From the time of Aristotle, the populace equated science with magic. Wasn't the diagram only a sign to conjure the demon, spade him, to do the boon of transporting his servants across the void without decay of time? No. Instantaneous transmission of matter wasn't magic. It had always been a part of folklore as teleportation, but just as machines had been made to duplicate the legendary feats of human extrasensory perception, a machine's made to let men speak over great distances to duplicate the strange voices of mystics, and machines made that would indeed show strange visions over vast expanses. Science had made the trance matter for null time object displacement. Trance matters were a logical, progressive, theoretical implementation. If electrical impulses could create patterns first in sound, then in light, it followed relentlessly that some day some form of impulses would be found to recreate matter. Energy and matter were only different forms of one unity. Fortunately, matter duplication had come before matter transmission. As the researches of Phillips established, an exact duplicate is not the original. A duplication of a man is only a duplicate, not the original, unless the elan vital, the spirit, the soul, is transmitted, for it cannot be duplicated. A duplicated man is a perfect robot, capable of memory and learning, and developing into a human being in time. But it is not a human being immediately, and it can never become the original of the duplicate. Every human viewpoint is unique and irreplaceable. Duplication of matter was uneconomical. The power outlay was too great, the equipment too costly to build and operate. So transportation by transmission was investigated. Again, it was too expensive except for very great distances. Trips of light years to worlds established over the generations by the spaceships which had reached virtual light speed and could not go beyond it. Personalities of transmittees got lost among the stars. Transmitted poets arrived with a dim itch for a brutal fight, due to some residue of glandular acid from a parting insult affecting their birth trauma on the new world. Great conductors solidified, hating music. Competent engineers were imported with an infantile urge toward lyric verse, and the companions came into being as a profession. Men with willpower, psionic abilities, strength of character. You could call it what you liked, depending on your profession, your politics, your religion. At any rate, men and women who could hold human personalities together on the long, instantaneous voyage through null space but some personalities drifted away. Or some darkly superstitious people suggested, were they sucked away? They were. Personalities in transmission were being captured by an intelligent entity, unimaginably vast in size, which some believed used the movements of galaxies as the synapse responses of its brain. It was a vast entity, but not a very intelligent one, due to the square of signal decay and noise over light years. Moreover, it was psychopathic. From contact with human minds, it had decided it was, or would become, it was obviously confused on the point, the god of the humans. It proposed to do this by eventually incorporating all intelligence into itself. But seemingly, only intelligence in transmission were soft enough for the mind snake to get a hold on. The companions were harder shelled, but the mind snake grew stronger, and companions began traveling with other companions as teams to resist the mind snake, and there came a class of companions who did not need help of any other man or woman, but only a touchstone of reality, something familiar of earth, the mind of a dog or a cat or some other animal. Familiars. So was born the core of witches. And here, Hammond wondered, was this where witches came to an end? He looked at the bulging head of Gordas. 
He couldn't see inside. Maybe there would ultimately be men who could, but he could only contact other minds when they were taken off the level of matter and energy and placed in null space. Where there is no space, there can be no barriers. There was nothing but confusion in the woman's mind if he touched it. Nothing but boredom and routine in the minds of the technicians. Hammond's eyes moved to the dog. He suddenly decided Lad looked sad. But dogs have human facial muscles, and it would be impossible between a man and a dog for one to look into the other's mind, while they weren't in transmission. Uselessly, he permitted himself to wish Lad was going with him. The heavy shoulder muscles of the dog ripped him free from the technician's grasp and Lad threw himself across the diagram line as the coordinates of the transmatter phased. Transmission. No time. No space. Hammond felt an overblown wave of force. How's that for power? Gordas demanded. It came as words to him, as communication between people had come to him all his life. Deaf-mute companions had told him communication and transmission came to them as hands and fingers feeling of words. "'You have never had a real companion before, have you?' Gordas asked. "'You never felt real power like this before?' "'Power? I've heard members of the cargo scream as loud from terror and horror. We don't scream in transmission. Coordinator, let the snake sleep.' "'Power,' the coordinator repeated." I always held my cargo together with power. When you were a companion, the snake wasn't as strong as it is now. Quiet, please. Hammond felled out for his familiar. A tail wagged somewhere. A head cocked to one side in puzzlement, concern. What wasn't a hand petted that which wasn't a head. Just us, just the two of us, to see after the woman, Gorda said with a sneer in his voice. Didn't he know about Lad crossing the diagram? Hadn't he seen? You sound as if you were about to suggest we team up and rape her. It's hardly practicable here. But that's it, Hyman. That's it. I want to rape her mind. Go away, Gordas. I don't believe you. Nobody really makes a career out of being that swinish. My profession is power, Hammon. I find your attitude unprofessional. Hammond reached out for the girl. What do you want from her? She knows everything, Hammond. Don't you want to know everything? No, Hammond said. I'd never be able to remember it. The girl was retreating from them. Had she been snagged by the mind snake? No, only drift. Hammond threw an anchor into her, braced himself against his familiar, and pulled. She came apart at the seams and flew off in all directions, gibbering. He raced after all the pieces of the woman at a practiced, steady trot and gathered them all in. He made a rough boundary and compartmentalized her. For an instant, he looked through the jumble that was her mind. Sensuality, sloth, greed, hate, envy, pride, hunger, death wish— it was the usual human pattern well enough, but they were letters that spelled out no words. It would be impossible to find any information in that psychic junk heap. Deftly, Hammond turned Gordas back on. Must know. You'll have to help me, Hammond. Why must I? Simplicity. You must. We stay here until you do. You can't close the transmission without me and I will not do it until you help me pick the woman's mind. We can wait forever until you decide to do as I order. There is no time here. Gordas was a blind old man stumbling in the dark. Hadn't he seen Lad join them inside the diagram? He probably wasn't even aware that Hammond had the woman under tow. Listen to me, Gordas. That about there being no time here is a mathematical abstraction. Practically, it has its limitations. There is some flow of some kind of duration here. Otherwise, our questions and answers would come at the same time. What are you trying to teach me? Gordas demanded. I was a companion before you were born. But then the mind snake wasn't so active or so powerful. If the duration of our transmission is too long, he'll get a clear fix on us. And that will be that. I'll risk that. Will you? 
No, Hammond said. You're a fool out here in transmission. You don't know what you're doing. What do you expect of me? Link with me, companion, as you should. Help me gain her knowledge. Hammond knew that he was being asked to help gain access to information intended for the Federation authorities on Earth. But he rarely thought of himself as a Federal, and he knew very few words would allow extradition of him on a Federal charge. At the moment, he was mainly concerned with saving himself and his cargo from the mine snake. As distasteful as it was, Gordas was a part of his cargo, and a man had to have a few ideals. Gordas was not qualified to be a companion after the generations of growth of the mine snake. He was only a pitiful fool now. How long before the snake gets so big I will not be qualified? How long before no one is qualified? How long before the snake comes out of null space and stalks the planets? Hammond shrugged and joined Gordas. They struck for the mind of the woman. Her name, they warned, is Adele. They found that out, and, incredibly, more. In some way, Gordas's mind paralleled the girls. There was much of a kind about them, and Gordas could piece together the fragments of her identity. But then he was reaching down for something, and he pressed a digitated it up and out of sight. Hammond realized that Gordas had succeeded in getting what he wanted and in keeping it from him. He was less of a doddering old fool than he appeared. What was that? Hammond demanded. What did you take? He tried to shake it loose from the coordinator. Let go of me, Gordas cried out in immaterial indignity. Hammond released him. Completely. Gordas screamed soundlessly as he retreated toward infinity. Shall I catch you? Hammond asked. The scream changed in pitch. The witch brought him back. You stayed, Gordas said. Somehow you stayed. That dog, somehow you've got your damn familiar with you, haven't you, witch? No, Hammond lied fluently. Only feeble minds like yours require a contact. Shall I tell you something about witches? The familiars are a deception. We don't need them at all. We are lone wolves. Wolves, are you? So now I know what your grandmother before you was. Hammond laughed, and sobered. "'What did you take, Gordas?' he demanded. "'What do you know about her?' asked Gordas. "'Her name is Isidel. "'Isidel Vanderlice. "'I've heard of her somewhere,' Hammond said hesitantly. "'A great theoretician,' the coordinator explained sullenly. "'Probably the first authentic female genius of the race of man.' on par with Plato, Shakespeare, Newton, Einstein. What theory of hers were you after? Hammond pursued. A method of destroying the mind snake. You want to take the credit from her. I only want to take the theory from her, Hammond. You mean you don't want the mind snake to be destroyed. You are afraid its destruction would mean the end of the companion corps which you had. Not at all. I only want the theory so I can reverse it. Once you know how to destroy the mind snake, you also know how to create one. You see, I intend to become another mind snake, one who knows too much of destruction to ever be destroyed. Listen carefully, Gordas, Hammond said with infinite care. You are ill. You don't know what you're talking about. It can't be done. The ultimate dream, ultimate power. It's pure psychosis, Gordas. Is it? Watch how easily I begin to grow. I have the woman's mind now. It was true. The poor, mad genius woman was gone. Stop it, coordinator. You don't know what you're doing. Hammond tried to reach him. That's it. That's it. Come ahead, my boy. I'm becoming a mind snake. Now I am a mind snake. Come ahead, let me swallow you next. You fool, Hammond broadcast. You are the mind snake now. Don't you think anyone's ever wanted power before? Won't you let yourself remember how it was when you were a companion? This is how it always happens. You've let yourself be swallowed by the snake. You ran right into its jaws. No, 
Gordas thought furiously. I... And the snake digested the tiny egg in its gullet, and I blurred and was washed over by all. Hammond struck at it in anger and humiliation and terror, and it retreated with frictionless speed. The snake took something with it. It took Gordas, and it left that part of the woman, Isadel, that he had been able to capture. But the part of Isadel matched by Gordas's mind was jerked free. She was freed of hate, anger, lust. She was left an impossibly ideal woman, all mother, sister, lover. Against his will, by immutable laws of nature, Hammond fell monstrously in love with her. Hammond was among the first companions or witches to join the suicide squadron. He did it to protect Isadel and her descendants for all time to come, and he did it in an impotent fury at his reason for doing it. The companions transmitted in droves to abolish their profession. They transmitted against the mind snake. The Federation on Earth had made use of Isidel's theories. They were only a formal mathematical statement of what had always been known. Destruction reaches a critical mass and destroys itself by turning against itself. Where Hammond had refused to join one human mind, he joined countless ones in a huge drive against the snake. They became one with each other, and they became one with the snake, and the snake turned on itself and destroyed itself and them, and they turned on themselves and stopped. They hung together for an unmeasurable time and broke apart. They were a super entity like the snake, but where the snake had been mad, they were sane. They drifted through the haze of twilight and broke apart, their hands gliding away into the shadows. Hammond was gloriously happy. He had never been happy before, and he was not at all sure he liked it. Jobs are so hard to find these days, Isadel said, her lovely face brightly saying, What will you take up, darling? There's still a need for companions and witches, he explained. There seems more of a tendency for members of the cargo to drift away than ever. The mind snake at least gave them something to resist, a foothold of friction. Now there's nothing, nothing to do but drift, drift, drift. People in transmission will need companions for a long time to come. I need a companion, lovely Isadel said. His heart leaped ridiculously. But not a witch, said gorgeous Isadel. Pain, very great physical pain. I love you, priceless Isadel went on. How could I help it? I am a woman and I love the father image. You are my father, symbolically. Fortunately, not biologically. You held the sane part of me while Gordas dragged off the unsane part. You gave me, this me, birth. I love you, but I don't love your dog. My dog, said Hammond. No woman can marry a man and his dog. I see, said Hammond, seeing it all and living. You could see everything about yourself and live. It wasn't easy, but you could do it especially if you had the training and experience of being a companion or a witch. It would kill Lad to separate him from me for long, you know, Hammond said. Isadel's beautiful eyes misted, and she said in all her infuriating gentleness, then it is impossible for us if we have to destroy a living. He's just a dog, he pointed out. I would wring his neck cheerfully if it would do any good, but it wouldn't. Isadel looked sad, and brave, and wonderful. Don't you see, Isadel? It's impossible for me to do the right thing. If it wasn't Lad, it would be another dog, and if it wasn't a familiar to make me a witch, it would be something else to make me different, because I am different. I have to live with that. Among the right people, I am the left man. So he left her and walked out of the floating gardens onto the walkway and Lad fell in at his side, and he listened without anger to the hushings and keenings of the crowd. Witch! Witch! End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE LAST TRESPASSER 
They would not believe Malloy was alone in there, in the padded cell. That made it worse. Malloy was lying on his stomach to avoid bed sores. He was walking from Peoria, Illinois, to Detroit, Michigan. Currently, he had just reached Chicago. It was fine to see State Street again, and the jewelry stores stuck in the cloves of churches with the handsomely barred windows. A man in army surplus green with an old library book was asking for car fare to a hiring hall when they began opening the door. Malloy rolled over on one elbow. It was peculiar. They hadn't done that for three years. Two of them came inside, thick men with disinterested faces. Try no sudden moves, one of them advised him. We will anticipate you, the other one added. Malloy went through the unfamiliar process of standing up. He looked at two men. I wouldn't try anything against the four of you. I'm not that crazy. Time for an interrogation, Malloy, the orderly said. Come with us. Malloy fell in between them and left the padded cell, frowning. What kind of an interrogation? he asked them. What other kind? one countered. A sanity hearing. He felt his eyebrows jerk. His sanity? He thought that had been established long ago, or his lack of it. Malloy remembered the doctor. He hadn't had much else to do for several years. He was Dr. Hyerson, a grain man with starched face and collar. But the younger man sitting with Hyerson behind the broad, translucent desk was a stranger to Malloy. He seemed to be a comic strip drawing, all in straight lines. Yes, sir. Step forward, Michael, Hyerson said. Malloy stepped forward. It had been a long time since he had been allowed to travel so far. Now relax, Michael, the doctor continued, leaning forward and grinning hideously. All you have to do is tell me the truth. No, I don't, doctor. I'm under no compulsion to tell you the truth. I'm perfectly capable of lying if it would do me any good. Hush that, Michael. You must not try to make believe you can lie. I know you tell me only the truth. All right, Malloy said, exhaling deeply. Believe that I speak only the truth if you like. But remember, I just told you that I'm a liar, and that must be true. Hyerson blinked in watery confusion. He was obviously senile. Only the old man's writer kept him from coming apart at his mental seams. The angled-faced man spoke into Hyerson's ear. The old doctor continued to blink for a moment, then faced Malloy, the lines of his face drawn into an asterisk. What? You mean to tell me that you don't have an inner voice that urges you to tell the truth at all times? No, Malloy explained. I do not hear voices. You don't? Never. And there is no inner sense that tells you when somebody is plotting against you? Absolutely not. And when you are in trouble or danger, there is nothing that allows you to somehow look into the future or read minds or see through walls? I can't do any of those things, Malloy stated. Hyerson threw up his hands. Complete withdrawal from reality. Pathological. Why is he here anyway? The younger man grasped the withered thin upper arm and whispered audibly but not understandably. Hyerson's face eventually quivered back in line with Malloy's. Michael, do you know what year this is? the doctor asked. Malloy thought about that one. He wasn't certain, but he made some rapid calculations. 1978? 1979. And what has been the most single important development in human history in recent times? Malloy sighed. He knew what he was expected to say. The coming of the writers. And what are writers? Writers, Malloy recited patiently, are elements of a symbiotic life form. They have united with human beings to make one symbiotic creature. They have given much more than they have taken. All prominent religions recognize that they do not interfere with human free will. They have made us healthier, virtually immortal, and near supermen. The race now is so much Zoa, and every man is a Zoon. Every man but me. Damn it, I don't have any writer. I'm not a superman, and I cannot get away with pretending to be one. Hyerson oscillated his head. Michael, 
Michael, your case isn't unique. There are others who claim that they have no writers, usually maintaining that they are naturally superhuman and need no help from some funny kind of foreigner. They are tolerated the same way, that be are. We tolerated people who claimed they possessed psychic auras, or who got up in cathedrals and yelled that they had no souls. But you, Michael, are a troublemaker. You've been rude, vulgar, and reckless with your life and others in your pretense to be riderless. Your pathological retreat from reality leaves us with no choice but to... The other man behind the desk shoved a paper in front of Hyerson and tapped it forcefully with an index finger. Hyerson read the paper and his eyebrows went askew. Yes, yes, we have discovered that there is a basic difference between you and the others who maintain they have no writers. It would seem it has been established that you really do not have a writer. Remarkable. Yes, well, I have no alternative but to dismiss you from this institution, Michael Malloy and to extend to you my personal apology for any inconvenience your three-and-a-half-years detainment may have caused you. A trick, Malloy thought. Only what point would there be in tricking him? The oppressive horror of it crushed down upon him with its full weight. Oh, no, he said. No, sir. Take me back to my padded cell. I've got my rights. I'm not going out there again. Maybe I could have learned to live with it once, but not now. I can't face up to living in a world of supermen, people who can do everything better than I can. Take me back. I think I'm going to get violent any minute now. He took a swing at the nearest guard, but naturally the guard's rider told him what was coming and he dodged deftly, caught Mallory's arm, and twisted into half Nelson to hold him completely, infuriatingly helpless. Malloy had to hold back tears of frustration. Fortunately, Dr. Hyerson croaked, you can do no harm even if you do get violent, and I'm sure everyone will want to do everything possible for a poor unfortunate like yourself. We all will make allowances. No, 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 Malloy announced with the rhythm of his stomping feet. I won't leave here. I won't. The man beside Hyerson favored Malloy with a smile. Malloy wasn't sure whether it was friendly or mocking. The stranger nodded his head briefly to the guards. Malloy was dragged, protesting, down the marbled floor hallway to the entrance of the mental hospital. His anguished cries echoed across the ornate ceiling of the old building. He was shoved out the front door with a parcel in brown paper under his arms. Malloy made one desperate attempt to get back inside, but the massive door clanged in his face, and he could hear the reverberations dying away inside and the steady retreat of footsteps. Malloy turned away in pain from the unaccustomed brilliance and warmth of the sun and banged on the door with his fists and demanded to be readmitted. He grew hoarser and hoarser, and he slid further and further down until he was squatting on the threshold, his cheek rested against the warm, varnished surface of the door. Malloy had never been an overly proud or vain man before the riders had come. After all, he'd had one of the most menial jobs on earth. He had been a magazine editor. But now he felt squashed under the thumb of humiliation. The monstrous indignity of it all. To be thrown out of an asylum. After a time, Malloy felt a coolness, a wetness on his head. He dreamed a little dream to himself that he knew was a dream. They were coming to wrap him in warm sheets again. But it was only a dream. The wetness wasn't warm. It was chilly. He finally identified it from his memories. This was rain. He stirred himself and gathered up the brown bundle that he knew must contain his suit, papers, and a little money. Malloy trudged down the road toward the town that lay below the sanitarium, his collar turned up. He found he didn't mind the rain so much. It tended to settle the dust, and the walk would be a long one. Grayson Amory, the iron-haired publisher, greeted Malloy with a firm, warm, dry handshake. Michael, it's certainly good to see you again. You are looking well. Yes, the bruises left by the straight jacket straps don't show, said Malloy. A unique miscarriage of justice, Amory said. 
I certainly hope it's unique. I hope there aren't any more poor devils like me locked away. Amory offered Malloy a chair with a broad, well-manicured hand. I'm confident that there aren't. And you're out now, fortunately. You can call it fortune if you like, Malloy said uneasily. But you are glad to be out? Malloy hesitated. I'm resigned to it. The flow of time washed some of the salt out of the wound. Being born is definitely a traumatic experience. How well I remember, Amory said. Malloy glanced at him sharply, then eased back in his chair. Of course, like everybody else, thanks to his writer, Amory had total recall. Malloy couldn't even remember his first birthday party. Is there any way I can be of help to you, Michael? Amory went on. Sure, I want my job back. Amory's forehead squeezed into lines of distress. Yes, I was made aware of that. But Michael, there have been a lot of changes in the publishing business since you were with us. For instance, it would be difficult for you to proofread a manuscript today. I'm hardly the type who can't spell. I haven't forgotten that. I know, Michael, but here, have a look at this. Amory handed over a sheet of paper. Malloy glanced at it. It seemed a typical sheet of writer's manuscript, though a horrible yellowish gray that made the typescript from the tatters of a ribbon almost illegible. It was also smudged with jelly donut fingerprints, and there were several holes burned in it by droppings of cigarette ash. Pretty sloppy, but things didn't seem to have changed much. Not until he read the paper. Dash, forward slash, Cynthia, forward slash, dash. I, in parentheses, walked toward, dash, slash, hashtag, double parentheses, him, hashtag, slash, dash, jauntily, in parentheses, slash. Quotes, hi, dash, forward slash, she, dash, hashtag, called, out, in parentheses, to him, in double parentheses and in slashes, hello. Quote, sweet stuff, comma, he slash said slash comma, trying, double parentheses, to hashtag sound, hashtag gay, I. Malloy looked up blankly. What are all the cockeyed punctuation marks doing in there? He asked. Amory exhaled Havana smoke expansively. That's the way things are now, Michael. Those punctuation marks indicate whether the protagonist's thoughts are self-directed or writer-directed, or a combination of both, and which is dominant at the time, human or writer. They became absolutely essential with the coming of the writers. Malloy covered his lips with his fingers. Of course, I don't understand this punctuation now, but I could learn it quickly enough. The publisher shook his massive head. No, you couldn't learn it. You don't have a writer. You could never understand all the little subtleties. I could fake it. Never. It might get past the average reader, but the author and critics would know right away. All an editor can do is watch for typographical errors and change them the way the author wanted them if his fingers hadn't tripped over the wrong keys. As it was, we used to get a good many complaints from writers about you making changes in their work. Grammar, Malloy explained. I got kind of a bug about grammar. I used to fix up manuscripts some. Rubbing out his fat cigar, Amory leaned across his desk. This isn't like the good old days when I started out, Michael. If I had my way today, I'd get the National Guard ordered out and have those miserable slobs grind out stories with a bayonet at their backs. The red gleam dimmed in Amory's eyes. Those were the days, by God. Back then you didn't edit manuscripts with any dinky little blue pencil. You used a razor blade and a grease stick. Amory slumped down in his swivel, his eyes only now embers. But that day is over, Mike. Writers have their rights, damn them. You get the wrong punctuation in one of their private eye epics, Mike, and one of them will slap a suit against the company for defacing a work of art and both of us could land in jail. Westerns, Malloy suggested in desperation. Historical fiction. They can't employ the new punctuation. I could edit them. The veteran publisher shook his head again. No. 
Cowboys and Westerns today turn your stomach more than ever with their damned nobility and purity. Heroines in historical novels act just as if deodorants and living bras had been in use back then. And these stories are written as if the characters did have writers, with only a few minor concessions. Okay. Malloy stood up. I'll go quietly. Maybe you're lucky, Mike, Amory said up at him. I remember old-fashioned ideals like privacy and free will and free enterprise. They don't exist anymore. You can't tell me that my free will hasn't been affected. Why, every business deal I've had since the coming has been strictly ethical. You know that isn't like me. No, Malloy admitted thoughtfully. I'm even so ethical now that I recognize I owe you something. I know money can't repay. Hell, it can't, Malloy said quickly. The publisher stripped off a sheaf of bills with deliberation. Malloy pocketed them, enough to keep him eating for a couple of months. After that, there was always the Salvation Army. He didn't have anything to worry about, really. Amory, what would you do if you were in my place? He heard himself ask suddenly. Amory steepled his fingers. I hesitate to suggest a deception to anyone, but since you ask me what I would do if I didn't have a writer, I will tell you the truth. I would pretend that I did not have a writer. What are you talking about? I don't have a writer. So far as myself personally knows, I'm the only person in the whole damn world that doesn't have one. I'd like to find out why, but I'm no scientist. So I just have to live with it, or without it. There is a very, very fine difference, Amory pointed out with one finger. Semantics is no longer a living science since the coming, but I'll try to make myself clear. You must pretend to have to pretend that you don't have a writer. Join the jockey set. Jockey set? Malloy mumbled, massaging the back of his neck. I've been put away for three and a half years. What's the jockey set? Jockeys are characters who pretend they don't have writers, that they are self-sufficient human beings. Sometimes they use their writer's powers and claim to be natural supermen. Sometimes they leave writer power untapped and pretend to be natural, old-type human beings. But they are all fakes. The writer in them comes out sooner or later. But if they have writers... Will I be able to fool them into thinking I'm only pretending to be without one? Amory lifted his shoulders and drew down the corners of his mouth. Who knows? I will tell you this, though. You must be pretty much of a blank to a writer. If they won't touch you, it must mean they can't. Malloy started to ask him how he knew what writers felt about him, then thought better of it. How would I fake trying to hide the fact that I didn't have a writer? I suppose, maybe, by slipping up and letting myself predict the future or something. That's it, Amory beamed. You see, it will be easy. Of course, Malloy said dully. I mean, that is to say, any time you don't do something and don't do it particularly well, the jockeys will only admire your splendid act. Malloy nodded thoughtfully. He turned and shook hands with the publisher. Well, Amory, thanks for the money, and the advice. You always were the most devious master of deceit I ever knew. Thank you, Amory said with great sincerity. There's one more thing. This may sound silly, but they found me out pretty quick after it happened. What does a writer look like? Where do they come from? Where do they fasten on to the brain or body of human beings? Amory leaned across the desk and backhanded Malloy in the mouth. Get out, Amory said. Malloy left the office holding a handkerchief to his cut lip. It was a dump. The name had changed a half dozen times over the last half century, but the spots in the tablecloths remained the same. The dump had seen the lost generation, the beat generation, and now the ridden generation. Only, Malloy supposed, they called themselves the writerless generation. Well, maybe they were. Maybe they were like him. He walked in, hanging on to that thought, his stride long. He cut down his stride, 
At that rate, he would be out of the alley soon. Self-consciously, Malloy slid into a chair at a vacant table so he wouldn't draw undue attention. As he began idly tracing the grease spots on the tablecloths that looked like the wrappers from a line of cereal boxes, all red and white checks, he discovered every shaved head in the room was triangulating him. He shifted uncomfortably. He was playing at middle of the road. He had a close crew cut and wore a plaid flannel shirt and purple velvet ballet leotards. Maybe he was too far on the conservative side for here. Spell it, saddle, the counterman called to him without coming front. Cola, he ordered, with chicory, pecans, and honey. One sou'easter on the path, the counterman called out tiredly. With your going to sit there, he? A liquid female voice flowed into his ear. With I'm doing it, she, Mallory said, not turning. She eased around in front of the table. She was red-haired and built, wearing black leotards and a coat of black enamel. Your pupils are going to wear me away, the redhead said. I've only got eyes. How else can I read you? That is truth. Truth. The counterman set out Malloy's drink. It's waiting for you, Saddle. Don't tease it, or it will bite. He went for the cola and brought it to the table. You came back, she said. He pulled up his chair. I always come back. You can risk money on it. Saddle up. Saddle before the post, my touchstone. The girl sat down. Her green eyes were moving, always moving, but mostly over Malloy, his chair, the table. You going to keep possession here long? I don't know any reason why not, said Malloy. Of course you don't, she snapped. Only they close at five. The billboard gives it two dozen hours a day. They trim a little off at five to sweep the floors and change the table shrouds. Change him from one table to another, Malloy jibed. You formed it. Clean ones in front, dirty ones in the shadows. Let's try breathing air, she suggested. Wait till we gate up. I've got pecans to drink. The counterman's hawking laugh filled the room. Let him wait, Mandy. I might as well wait to later sweep it in. Her face caught fire for an instant. The Board of Health don't go away just because you can read their dirty minds. So take him out, the counterman snarled. Malloy suddenly decided he had played hard to get long enough. This was his first chance to get in with the jockeys. From what he had heard, they had some kind of underground setup to help their own in business and the arts. He needed that help. Let's lope, he said pushing his chair back and leaving silver on the table for the drink and a tip. He touched the girl's lacquered arm and steered her toward the door. Behind him, the floor fell in. Ripping, tearing, rendering, splintering, crashing, crushing, reverberating bedlam. Of course, it couldn't have been the floor caving in, Malloy thought as he turned to see a great hole where the floor had disappeared. The hole was where the table and chair he had been using had stood a moment before. Flapping at the sides of the cave-in were innumerable thicknesses of linoleum, and between each one an incredible accumulation of filth and debris. O. Henry candy bar wrappers, a cover from Collier's, a booklet on the new Packard, Ask the Man Who Owns One, a newspaper article on Flo Zigfield's Girls, Stop Thinking in Slogans, but mostly just dirt, dust, webs, lint, filth. There had been no boards under the table. The ends of the exposed boards weren't freshly broken, but old and rotted, porously smooth. Only the linoleum and the dirt had supported the table for years. Malloy edged closer and saw some broken sticks lying on a jagged pile of coke standing out black in the darkness far below. The redhead pulled him back from the edge, her fingers digging into his biceps, writhing with a strange passionate intensity, as if she were trying to knead him into a layer for a pie. You're with a real jockey. He, a real jockey, a real one. Truth? I'm going to take you to the commissioner. He, the commissioner in a saddle. 
Somehow, uncertain, yet surely, Malloy was dimly pleased at this. Don't say it, the fat man remarked, glancing up for an instant, then lowering his eyes to the splay of papers on his desk. No esoteric jargon, please. All right, Malloy said readily. Shall I sit down? By all means, saddle up. A second chin trembled. Damn it, there I go. Have a chair. Malloy took the only chair not piled down with books, or maps, or correspondence, or manuscripts, or notes. It had a straight back and a plastic seat, piously uncomfortable. The big man looked up a second time and folded rolls of pink sausages complacently. So you want to be a jockey, eh? Malloy thinned his lips and licked the insides of them, making a snap judgment. Not really. I don't have a writer, and I want what help the jockeys can give me. I'm not particularly anxious to acquire introverted slang and a shaved head, but if that goes along with the help. He spread his hands eloquently. So you don't think you have a writer? Malloy didn't know how to answer that. I don't think I have a writer, he repeated without inflection. I don't think I have a writer either, only I know I do, the fat man said. Malloy stood up elaborately. You dirty steed! Oh, sit down, Malloy, sit down. I'm a jockey like the rest of you. There's only one difference. I know I'm sick. I've got a rider and all its powers, but I could no more use them than an acrophobe could climb a ladder up the Empire State to get a naked princess sitting on a bag of gold. Malloy eased back down onto the chair and shook his head slowly. That would be a hell of a way to be. The big man slammed down two hams made out of fists. You're exactly the same way, sonny boy, only you don't know any better. Malloy swallowed. The man known as the commissioner might be right at that. Have it your way, Malloy said, but I sure think I don't have a rider. The commissioner smirked. Malloy knew what that meant. He knew men like the fat boy. He understood them. He had had Grayson Amory, Dr. Hyerson. He knew the breed. What are you holding back on me? Malloy demanded. Malloy, do you even know what a writer is? Malloy paused then. No, I don't. I thought not. Shall I tell you? I imagine you were planning to. The commissioner braced his fists on the work surface of the desk and lifted his bulk halfway from the chair. Writers are a disease, like rabies. Malloy cleared his throat. That's one way to look at them. Don't be surfily civil to me. That is an accurate, clinical description of the writers. They are a cerebral infection. You mean their powers of emergency telepathy and precognition? their seeming secondary personality. All that's a hallucination? Malloy was fevered as he asked it. It was, alas, some confirmation of his own theory. The whole world was sick, except him. That is exactly what I don't mean, the commissioner said contemptuously. The writers are real entities, capable of real miracles so far as we're concerned. But they aren't mammals or insects, or pure energy forms. They are viruses. Viruses that can think? Malloy asked, aghast. No. No one unit of the strain can think, but chains of them can. Together they form different combinations and responses, like analog components or brain synapses. Objectively, they are an infection that can enter the body anywhere, but that always spread to the prefrontal lobes, like rabies. Only they don't destroy tissue. The riders are benign parasites. That's one word for them, Malloy admitted. But if they are a virus, there must be antibodies. Is that the word? For them? The fat man snorted unpleasantly. You can't fight an infection that is smart enough to consciously change its shape and fight back. Natural adaptation and mutation are tough enough. Besides, nobody would stand for being cured of his rider any more than you would let me cure you of having eyes. Then what was your point in telling me the nature of the riders? 
You weren't merely conducting an adult education class. True. The commissioner burped delicately and settled back in his chair. As a matter of fact, there is one thing I left out. The writers aren't suited for Earth. They have difficulty in adapting themselves to live on this planet. Once they get into a human being, they are okay. But before that, they are weak and have to get hothouse care. Exactly that, hothouse care. Malloy's tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. He pulled it loose and said, And you can break the windows of the hothouses. The commissioner smiled. It was unpleasant to watch. Nothing personal, Malloy, the commissioner whispered almost subvocally as they lay together in the green news. But we haven't known you long enough to give you our trust. The first false step will be a long one for you, exactly six feet. Malloy tried to squint through the foggy darkness and almost instantly gave up. You can't blame me for everything, Commissioner. I told you I wasn't convinced that some of the riders in there won't precog our plans to save themselves. All the ones we are going to destroy are the unhooked up ones. They can't send anything any more than one unattached telephone could. But they aren't really very good with their PSI powers. It's strictly an emergency talent, like our sudden spurts of adrenaline. He gave an unsatisfied grunt and bellied forward. Up ahead of Malloy, the commissioner and an unstable stable of jockeys who had been coming into town for weeks lay the secret hatchery of unhosted rider viruses. They could only multiply beyond a certain self-maintaining balance inside the human body and had to be grown in cultures on Earth, outside the healthy climate of a null gravity, radiated vacuum in space. It was the commissioner's plan to destroy all the virus cultures, so that in eighteen years or so there would come along a rider-free generation to outnumber the minor supermen still infected by the riders. Malloy had a lot of doubts about the plan, but he was willing to go along for his own reasons. During the past few weeks of indoctrination and commando training, Malloy had had time to think. It hadn't taken nearly that long to figure out the commissioner. The commissioner was simply a man who had to have power, and he couldn't stand for a whole human race to be more powerful than he was, just because of a lack within himself. He was out to pull everybody down to his level, so he could stand out again and take over. Still, Malloy thought, he may have something to say about that. The men and a few women crawled through the semi-tropical Florida mud toward the low buildings glimmering in the light from the thin crescent of moon. Malloy elbowed a foot closer to the hothouse breeding factory up to here in stinking muck. Any second now, he thought, somebody is going to roll over on a cotton mouth. Ready with your cloths, a man next to him relayed, first catching his attention and mostly lip-syncing it. Malloy dug out his affixion pad and readied the tab to pull off the plastic coating. Clamped over the guards' faces, the catalytic agent would rapidly absorb the men's oxygen. With a partial vacuum in the mouth and larynx, no cries could carry and the victim would rapidly black out. The pad would be removed and the guards would be allowed to catch up on their air intake. They wouldn't be harmed in any way final so their emergency PSI warning system wasn't supposed to cut in. Malloy shrugged. The plan would never work. It was based on equal parts of megalomania and wishful thinking. Malloy's only problem was when and how to expose the plot before it was found out without his help. He couldn't stand up and shout a warning. If he tried that... One of the fanatic jockeys was sure to clamp an affection pad over his face, and with him, they might not be considerate enough to remove it. Only a treacherous, self-seeking rat would even think of exposing these poor, misguided people and betraying his own race to some extraterrestrial viruses. Malloy's elbow slipped out from under him, and he went face first into the mud. He forced himself to keep from spluttering and lifted his head. Where had that idea come from? For one adrenaline-charged moment, 
he thought he had finally acquired a rider. But no, a rider would hardly urge him to carry out an attack against the citadel of existence to its own kind. It had to be something simpler, more elemental than that. The voice had been his own conscience crying out against treason. He followed the probable train of circumstances if he heeded his conscience. He would most probably be killed in this useless attack. He doubted that this was the only breeding chamber for riders, or that if it were, the riders safely in human bodies couldn't transplant part of themselves and start new cultures. If he wasn't killed, he would probably be returned to his cell, his padded cell, by rider-ridden people. If he were somehow let off, he would be left to wander the streets, a public ward. The trouble with his conscience was that it wasn't logical, and it had a poor memory. It didn't recall those three and a half years mislaid in an asylum. Only an unprincipled. Malloy shut it off and felt a drop of sweat running down the deep crevices between his eyebrows. My only problem, he reminded himself again and again, is how and when to expose this raid before they discover it without my help. The solution bloomed in his mind. It was remarkable how well the human mind could operate under stress. He half rose from the mud so he would be silhouetted to anybody watching, and fell back. The guards hadn't spotted him, but he heard the jockey scurrying toward him through the mud. The squishing halted near him. The commandos moved ahead, leaving him behind. When he felt it was safe, Malloy took the affixion pad off his face, a pad without the transparent plastic coat being pulled off. He made out a buddy team of jockeys almost on top of the first rider-ridden man post. All the others had to be far ahead. Malloy leaped to his feet, or tried to. He managed to slosh to his knees. Raid, he screamed. Jockeys are raiding the hothouse. The lights flared up, a magnesium, 4th of July night glare. Guards with guns sprang from everywhere. The guns went into action. Clouds of crystalline asphyxian snowed down on the raiders. From far back, Malloy watched in satisfaction. The sound came from behind him. The commissioner blobbed forward, a distorted ball of slimy mud. I will crush you under my foot like a bloated white grub, the fat man announced with sincerity. Malloy's eyes narrowed in the darkness. Stay away from me, commissioner, or I'll push you down, way, way down. The blocky figure retreated a step quivering impotently. Malloy nodded to himself. The commissioner spoken to knowingly of a terrible fear of falling. The interrogator was the younger man who sat next to Dr. Hyerson during Malloy's release from the hospital. I feel you'd like to know my identity, Mr. Malloy. My name is Pearson. I work for the federal government. Now would you tell me just what you hope to gain by betraying the assault force of jockeys? It was the crux of the matter. Malloy took a deep breath and said it. I want a writer. I want to be like everybody else. If you people have any sense of gratitude and justice, and you seem to, you'll set up some kind of scientific project to find out why I haven't caught a case of writers and to see that I am properly infected. Pearson leaned back in the other straight chair inside the rough-boarded outbuilding. Mr. Malloy, we know why none of the riders who drifted in from outer space infected you. You already had a rider, an entirely human, not alien one. You're schizoid, and you have a split personality. You adjusted to it to an incredible degree and submerged it but it was still there, and no alien would touch a man who already had two minds. Malloy felt no emotion, only an inescapable acceptance. My conscience, he said. Pearson nodded. Your secondary personality is becoming steadily less recessive. But telepathy, all the tricks of the writers, I can't do them. You will be able to. Two minds are better than one. 
it would seem that schizophrenia is the natural state of supermen, when properly trained and integrated. In fact, you should be able to accomplish more than a rider-ridden man. You will have two human personalities, and the riders are little more than viruses conscious of their own existence. You mean I'm a superman? Yes, but unfortunately you are a threat to the present order because of your non-rider attitude. You are being returned to your padded cell. There are guards outside. I hope you will walk out quietly to meet them. Malloy walked out quietly to meet the guards who would take him away. On his way out, he met Grayson Amory coming in. Pearson shook hands warmly with the publisher. Mr. Amory, the government owes you a vote of thanks for recommending Malloy for this job of infiltrating the jocks. Turning against one of your own kind is never easy. Amory laughed lightly. Malloy was not one of my kind. He was an editor. Even worse than that, I think in his attitude he always remained no more than a writer. I understand he's being returned to confinement? Pearson looked troubled. Yes, sir. Personally, I would feel more comfortable if he were eliminated. I'm not at all sure we can keep Malloy under lock and key once he develops his potential of schizophrenia. I know. Unhappily, the primitive ethics of the writers prevent our taking care of Mike in the most efficient way. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. May I sit down? Please do, sir, said Pearson. Amory took the vacant chair and leaned forward with boyish enthusiasm. Mr. Pearson, I have faith in humanity. I believe we can keep the benefits of any situation, including the writers, and eliminate the disadvantages and limitations. My boy, all of us must start to work to find a way to override the writers. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE UPSIDE-DOWN CAPTAIN "'Excuse me, please,' Ben Starbuck said, tapping the junior officer on the epaulet. "'Get away from me, scum,' the lieutenant said conversationally, his eyes on the clipboard in his hands. Starbuck rocked back on his heels and set his space bag down on the loading platform. He angled his head up at the spire of the inner atmosphere ship, the Gorgon. This was only a sample of what he could expect once he canted into that hall. It would be rough, but he had made up his mind to take it. All tight little groups, like the crew of a spaceship, always resented the intrusion of a newcomer. The initiation sometimes made it a test to see whether a man would live over them, and the probation period, the time of discipline and deference to old members of the group, could be a memorably nasty experience. He didn't have direct knowledge of such customs in the rather shadowy, enigmatic space service, but it was basic sociology. Starbuck knew he would have an even rougher time of it since he wasn't a spaceman, not even a cadet, properly. He was only a fledgling ethnologist on this trip to gather material for his master's thesis. The university and the government had arranged for his birth on the Gorgon. An exploration ship, he thought acidly. That meant he might come back in a few months, or ten years, or never. All because he had had the bad luck to be born in a cultural cycle that demanded hard standards of education from professional men. Thirty years before or after, he could have cribbed all the information he needed out of a book. He stood with his hands clasped behind him, waiting for the lieutenant or somebody to deign to notice him. Somebody would have to pay some attention to him sooner or later. Or would they? Wouldn't it be just like the old-timers to let him stand around and let the ship take off without him, all because he hadn't followed the proper procedure, a procedure he couldn't know? All he had been instructed to do was to report to the Gorgon. How do you report to a spaceship? Say hello, spaceship. Speak to the captain. The first mate. And where did he find them? 
Starbuck felt a moment of panic. He could see himself standing on the platform while the Gorgon blasted off, carrying with it his swabber's rating, his master's degree, and his future. The lieutenant's back, in uniform black, loomed up before him. He would have to try approaching him again. It might mean solitary confinement for a month or two where no member of the crew would speak to him. It might even mean a flogging. Nobody knew much about what went on board an exploration ship, despite all the stories. But Starbuck knew he would have to risk it. He marched up behind the officer. Sir, he said, I'm the new man. The lieutenant whirled. The new man? For the first time, Starbuck noticed that the junior officer carried a swagger stick under his left arm, black, about a foot and a half long, tipped with silver at both ends. Quite possibly it was standard procedure to wrap a man with it three times sharply across the mouth for speaking out of turn, during his probationary period. Cautiously, he filled a little pocket of air between his lips and his teeth, to try to keep them from being knocked loose. The lieutenant dropped his clipboard and swagger stick on the platform. Why didn't you say so? New man, eh? He gripped Starbuck by the shoulders of his new, store-bought uniform. Let me look at you, son. Got some muscles there, haven't you? Aha! Uh -huh. Don't expect you'll need them too much on board. We don't work our men too hard. My name's Sam Frawley. Call me Sam. Come on, let me show you around. Sam Frawley scooped up his stick and board with one hand and draped the other arm around Starbuck's shoulders leading him toward a hoist. It was not quite what Starbuck had expected for a reception. The spaceship was big, bigger than Starbuck had expected or realized. He had known some well-fixed people who had visited Mars and Venus and talked knowingly of an older culture, but he had never been off of Earth himself. He had been thinking in terms of an airliner or submarine. The Gorgon was more like an ocean liner, or like an ocean. His and the lieutenant's footsteps echoed and bounced around the huge corridor. They haven't got the mats down yet, Sam Frawley explained. Sure. Well, what would you like to see first, the brain? You mean the captain? Sam slapped him on the back. Bless you, son. No, I mean the electronic brain, the cybernetic calculator. You've got one of those things? Starbuck asked, in unconcealed surprise. You know what the trouble with the human race is, Ben? We're all living in the Ellisonian age. I don't know. I think most of us are pretty sophisticated and modern, Starbuck said. Not on your life. Most people still think leisure is a sin. Hard work and more hard work. That's the ticket. Don't let the calculator solve a problem for you. Do it yourself with a slipstick. Otherwise, it's immoral. That's silly, Ben said awkwardly. It's just a throwback to a time of protest against the automational revolution. It has nothing to do with us today. You say that, but you don't really believe it. The old morality is too deeply ingrained. That's why cybernetics have so long been out of fashion. This one is new to us on the Gorgon. But we like new things. We're for progress. All spacemen are like that, son. Have you had this machine long? Starbuck asked his progressive officer. They installed it on the trip in. We've never really had a chance to use it. What's it supposed to do? You know our job is exploration, finding new worlds, Sam explained. Not just any world the human race hasn't landed upon, but a world that has a significantly different type than we've ever touched before. We're really the advanced guard of humanity, you see. Well, the brain is programmed with information on all the worlds man has explored. It compares a prospective landing site with what it knows about all the rest and rejects all but the really different, unique planets. It loves the unknown. Its pleasure circuits get a real jolt out of finding an unknown quantity. That brain is really inhuman, Starbucks said. A basic factor of human psychology is that all men fear and dislike the unknown. Sam rubbed his chin. I suppose so, 
but you asked about the captain. This is him. A tall, iron-haired man was coming down the corridor. He was holding the ankle of his right foot in his hand and hopping along on his left leg, whistling some sing-song through his teeth. He stopped whistling when he saw them and said, "'Good afternoon, men.' Frawley framed a sloppy salute. "'Afternoon, sir. May I present the new man? Swabber Ben Starbuck, sir.' The captain stood on both feet and rocked back and forth. "'I see, I see. New man, eh? We see so few new faces, cooped up on this old ship with the same men, you know. We appreciate a stranger, Starbuck. If you ever need help, Ben, I want you to look upon me not as your commanding officer, but, well, a, a father. Will you do that? Yes, sir, Ben murmured, feeling a little giddy. Frawley cleared his throat. I was about to show young Ben the brain, Captain Birdsell. Good idea, the commanding officer said. But I'll show Ben around myself, Lieutenant Frawley. You may return to checking the manifest. Frawley glowered. One of these days, one of these days. The captain snapped very erect. One of these days what? The junior officer shrugged. One of these days, there may be a dark night, Captain. The iron-haired man reached out a manicured hand and twisted Frawley's tunic at the collar. He brought his face level with the second in command. One of these times, there may be charges of mutiny, Lieutenant. And guess who will pay Jack Ketch personally? Frawley assumed an at-attention pose and blinked. Why, sir, there may be a mutiny and somebody may get hung. Birdsell shoved Farley away from him and wiped his hand elaborately down his side. That will be all, Mr. Frawley. Frawley constructed the same excuse for a salute, turned smartly and marched away. Starbuck developed a definite suspicion that there were currents of tension aboard which he didn't understand. This is the brain, the captain said with a gesture. The brain was less than awe-inspiring. The mustard seed cryotron relays were comfortably housed in the steel and aluminum hide, no roomier than a pair of earthside bureaus. It looked a bit like a home clothing processor to Starbuck. Birdsell crossed to the machine and ran a hand along its metal side. Magnificent, isn't it, Ben? I've never seen anything like it before in my long career in the space service. It's certainly nice, Starbuck ventured. Metallic chattering burst out. It's saying something, Ben. This is the first time it's talked since the second day after it was installed. The message was clearly legible, spelled out in a pattern of dots on a central screen. Who is the new one? Give it the information, the captain said hastily. We feed it all the information it asks for. How? Starbuck blurted. Is there a keyboard or something? Yes, yes, but it has audio scanners. Just talk, or move your lips. Send signals. Tap out Morse. Anything. I'm Benjamin Starbuck, he said. The screen rearranged. Meaningless communication, insufficient data. Quick, Birdsell said. Do you have your IDQ file on you? Starbuck fished in his pocket for the microfilm slide. Yes, aye, aye, sir. I had it ready to give to you, sir. Never mind me. Give it to the brain. Starbuck approached the machine, saw a likely-looking slot, and shoved. The brain ruminated with some theatrical racket. Insufficient data. What do you want to know? Starbuck swallowed, saying. Many things. Remember, I'm a human being, he said respectfully. I have to eat and sleep. I can't answer questions for two or three days straight. I am aware of human limitations and their effects, Swabber Starbuck. Sorry. Captain Birdsell looked vaguely distressed. You should try to cooperate with the brain, my boy. I have nothing against cybernetic calculators, Ben said. After all, we aren't still in the Ellisonian age. But I'd like to, uh, stow my space bag and get settled in, sir. No further questions at this time. Return here at this time tomorrow. 
"'He's interested in you, Ben,' the captain said enthusiastically. "'This is the first time he's asked about anybody since the second day. "'Yes, interested.' "'With an excess of enthusiasm, Captain Birdsell clapped his hands, "'then put them flat on the deck and stood on his head, "'kicking his heels in the air. "'He straightened up with a scarlet face. "'Ah, that really gets the kinks out of you, Ben.' Starbuck tried not to stare. Aye, sir. The captain took a step and grabbed the small of his back. Haven't done it in some time, though. Ought to do it more often, eh, Ben? I suppose so, sir. Well, Birdsell said, clapping his hands together. My God, Starbuck thought, he's not going to do it again. Well, the captain continued, still on both feet. I'd better show you to your quarters, my boy. Mind if I lean on your shoulder a bit like this? Not at all, Captain. This way, Ben, this way. Starbuck found the array of tridy pinups on the bulkheads of the crew's quarters refreshing, as was the supportive babble of conversation about them and other women. He had almost begun to think there was something unnatural about the men aboard the Gorgon but Starbuck noticed, to his discomfort, the ebbing tide of conversation from the bunks as he stepped inside with his space bag. For the moment, he wished Captain Birdsell had paced in with him and offered up an introduction. But a look of disgust had creased Birdsell's face as they got near the crew's compartment. He had sent Starbuck on alone, while he limped back towards the bridge. A forest of eyes shined out at him from the shadowed desks of the bunks. This is it, he thought. These were the crew, not officers. Sometimes the teachers were nice to you on the first day of school, but you knew you were going to get it from the other kids. Hi, a gruff voice echoed up at him from a lower bunk. Hello, Starbuck said, hugging a space bag like a teddy bear. The simile crossed his mind. A lumbering giant with a blue jaw uncoiled from the lower bunk. Why don't you stow your bag here, buddy? Till you get used to the centrifugal grav, you may have some trouble climbing topside. You've got the seniority, Starbuck said cautiously. I wouldn't want to cause you any trouble. No trouble, Bluejaw said obligingly. He chinned himself with one hand on the rim of the upper bunk and swung his torso around a tidy 180 degrees to settle onto the blankets. Starbuck threw his bag at the foot and sat down on the bed. He looked around the arena of faces in neutral positions, waiting faces. He cleared his throat experimentally. Could I ask you something? He called upstairs. A set of big feet swung down into view. Sure, Bluejaw said enthusiastically. Didn't know you wanted to talk. Thought you might want to rest. Starbuck looked at the hanging feet. They were expressionless. Maybe it isn't so much of a question, he said, working one hand into the other palm. It's just that I'd like to live through this mission. I know I'm not a regular spaceman, and I'm intruding and all, but I don't mean to cause anybody any trouble or do anyone out of a job. I'd just like to do everything I can to see that I don't slip and fall into the reactor, or anything like that. Don't worry. Blue Jaw said heartily. We'll take care of you, Ben Starbuck. Somehow, Starbuck could find little comfort in those words. He inhaled deeply. Come on down here, will you? You want me down there? Blue Jaw gasped. Why, sure, sure. The giant dropped to the deck with a cat-like grace that nevertheless vibrated Ben's rear teeth. You want to talk about something? The big spaceman inquired. Ben could almost see the paws hanging down and the tail wagging eagerly. Yeah, Starbuck said. I'd like to talk about all these men staring at me. What's wrong with them? Nobody said a word to me but you. What are they waiting for? What are they going to do? I can't stand the suspense. Is that it? I get the silent treatment until I go off my rocker, get violent, and then something happens to me. He stopped and swallowed. He was talking too much. He was working himself up into a state of terror. 
"'Say, you sure are friendly,' the ox said with some confusion. "'My name's Percy Kettleman.' Starbuck steadied his hand and put it in Percy's grasp. It came out whole. "'Those other fellows,' Percy inclined his head. "'What about them?' Starbuck asked edgily. "'They'd probably like to come over and say hello, but them and me don't get along so good. They know better than to come around bothering me.' "'You're not on their side? "'You wouldn't be a new man, too, Percy.' "'Me? Hell, I've been spacing since I was sixteen. "'Those guys don't have any side. "'A bunch of antisocial slobs. "'They can't stand each other any more than I can stand any of them.' "'Starbuck decided he had picked a good ally "'in the midst of a pack of lone wolves. "'Percy was the biggest man on board, physically.' Still, he didn't like the idea of all the rest of the crew looking daggers at him, or throwing them, for that matter. "'Mind if I say hello to the rest of the men?' he inquired of Percy. "'It's your nickel,' gruffly. "'Spend it the way you want.' Starbuck flexed an elbow. "'Hello there, fellows. Looks to be a taut ship.' It sounded a shade in the name. Starbuck had barely passed socializing at the university. But the men replied in good spirits, their faces blooming with teeth, arms waggling, calling out modest insults. Starbuck recalled that among a certain class of men an insult was a good-natured compliment in negative translation. Psst! Psst! Starbuck asked. Kettleman passed him down half a roll of white tablet underhand. Starbuck took it. Tums? Tranquils. We smuggle them on board. Helps with the blast off and phasing for the overdrive. Not that those stiff neck brass will believe it. Thanks, Kettleman. You and everybody seems to be pretty helpful to me. I don't know exactly what I've done to deserve it. We get tired of looking at the same faces out there month after month. It's a treat to have somebody new on hand. It sounded reasonable to him but he felt there was something more to it than that. Well, he was an ethnologist, or almost one. He could figure out group behavior. All he had to do was take time to think about the problem for a little while. Only he didn't have time to think. He discovered why everybody was in their bunks. The spaceship fired its atomic drive. Starbuck tried to lift a tranquil to his lips. He didn't make it. Painfully, he found out why a man would prefer to go through a spaceship takeoff in a tranquilized condition. Come, the captain said. Starbuck palmed back the door to the captain's cabin and stepped inside. Captain Birdsell stood in front of the small wall mirror tattooing a flying dragon on his bared chest. Yes, what is it, Ben? Sir, you remember that the ship's brain directed me to return at this time today. But I understand I'll have to have your permission to go on to that part of the bridge. The brain's directory was quite enough, my boy. He laid down the needle. But I'll accompany there if you like. Just as you wish, sir. Birdsell smiled engagingly. Notice the dragon, did you? It arrested my attention. Yes, sir, Starbuck admitted. The hours are long and lonely in the vaults of space, Ben. A man needs a variety of interests to occupy himself. I have recently taken up the ancient art of tattooing. Surely not recently, sir. You seem quite advanced. You're too kind. The captain escorted Starbuck to the chamber of the brain, discussing tattooing animatedly. He told how it was popular with the ancient mariners on the seas of Earth. He discussed the artistic significance of the basic forms, the heart and arrow, the nude, the flag. He didn't stop talking and button his shirt even after they entered the cybernetics room. As the captain grasped for a second wind, Starbuck turned to the machine. I'm here, calculator. The lights patterned words with a speed difficult to follow. Redundancy, cancel, analysis, social more. I see that you are here. It is good that you are not there or elsewhere, but that here you are. Here are you. Starbuck shifted his weight to the other foot. 
"'Yes, I'm sure here all right. "'What did you do while you were not here? "'I helped lay some walk mats in the corridors. "'I policed up the latrine. "'Lost all the money I brought with me in a crap game. "'Crap, that's where. "'Hoyle's Rules of Games is part of my programming. "'I see. "'You are not blind. "'It is well that you have vision. "'How is the weather?' "'Still under Central's control, I suppose. "'What do you know about tattooing?' "'Only what Captain Birdsell here told me,' Starbuck said. "'No doubt there was a pattern of fine logic to the calculator's inquiries, "'but he was too dense to see it. "'The question sounded to him like mumblings of a mongoloid. "'I'd be delightful to fill the brain in on the subject,' Birdsell said. "'The calculator's communication screen remained blank.' "'Was there anything else you wanted to know?' Starbuck inquired. "'You will process the Gorgon through phasing,' swabber Starbuck. "'The hyperspace jump? "'But that's the captain's job,' he protested. "'Not at all, not at all,' Birdsell interrupted. "'Whatever the calculator says. "'Now, if you'll excuse me, there is some paint I have to requisition.' "'Wait,' Starbuck cried desperately. I don't know anything about the overdrive. You can guide me, can't you, sir? That would be all right with the brain, wouldn't it? Birdsell shrugged. Would it? The screen stayed a stubborn neutral gray. Stay, sir. All right, Birdsell said dubiously. The overdrive switch box had been incorporated into the cybernetic system itself as an interlock. There isn't much to do. "'Captain Birdsell explained. "'We trigger the jump and come out at a mathematically selected random spot in real space "'after phasing through hyperspace. "'The brain scans the sun systems in the area for unique planets worthy of exploration. "'If there is one, we zero in on it via fixed phase "'until the gravitational field makes it necessary to switch back to standard interplanetary or nuclear drive.' We can make suggestions to the brain or theoretically override one of its decisions. Actually, all we have to do is watch. Thumb the button, Ben. It wants you to do it. It likes you. Aye, Captain. Starbuck could believe a cybernetic machine could like him. Everybody else on board seemed to, and it unnerved him more than a little. Only a selected few had ever particularly liked Benjamin Starbuck before. The situation reminded him a bit of Melville's Billy Budd, only he wasn't a handsome sailor, just a fairly average-looking spaceman. Starbuck depressed the button. The button depressed Starbuck. Now he knew why tranquils were popular during phasing. For one instant, Starbuck stopped believing in everything. The spaceship, the captain, Earth, his own identity, the universe. He went completely insane, a cockeyed psychotic. It was over just quick enough to leave him a mind to remember what not having one was like. My, the captain said, his head on an angle. He looked as if he were gazing at some classic piece of art, such as a calendar by Marilyn Monroe, the last of the great realists whose work was indistinguishable from color photography. This is a dandy, Birdsell said. Starbuck swiveled his head around to the outer projection portal. There, in all its glory, was a star system. There seemed to be four stars all orbiting each other. Two red dwarfs, one yellow midget and a white giant. One planet was clearly visible on the side of the system towards the ship, an odd lopsided dumbbell shape in the center of a translucent sphere of tiny satellites, cosmic dust like the rings of Saturn. Strangest of all, the outer shell of the planet was sending in interplanetary morse, CQ, CQ, CQ. It, Starbuck ventured with a newfound sophistication, seems rather unusual. I suppose we'll take a closer look, Captain. The calculator screen replied for the officer. The system is of sufficient interest to warrant exploration. We are seeking significantly unique planets. I have never seen anything like this before. Birdsell drew himself up to his full height. 
However, the machine's knowledge of the history of space exploration is much more extensive than mine. You aren't going to suggest that the brain reconsider or override its decision? Certainly not, Birdsell snapped. We'll rephase after the traditional 24-hour delay for psychological adjustment. Starbuck sneaked another pop-eyed look at the planet on the screen. If he thinks that's a run of the mill, Captain, I wonder what he will have to find to make him think it's unusual. Whatever it took to satisfy the brain, it didn't find it in the next few days. Starbuck reported to the bridge each day to press the brain's phase button and answer some of its questions. Then for two days, Captain Birdsell wasn't on hand for the little ceremony and the expression of dissatisfaction with the available site for exploration. Once, Starbuck went so far as to suggest a reconsideration of a system that had made the one he had seen on the first day look tame. The calculator had duly noted the reconsideration and had again refused. Starbuck didn't dare try an out-and-out -out override, even though he had been theoretically given complete command of the phasing operation. The following noon, in the middle of the 24-hour period, Romero, an engineer, almost tearfully pressed Starbuck's crap game losings back on him, apologizing for keeping the money. Starbuck was about to refuse, not wanting to reverse the state of indebtedness, when the intercom requested his appearance at the captain's quarters. Unable to prolong the argument with Romero, he took the money and shoved it in his pocket, heading for the chief cabin. Starbuck rapped on the door, heard the come, and entered. Captain Birdsell was hanging naked upside down, by his knees from a trapeze, in the middle of a deserted compartment painted solid red. "'You sent for me, sir?' Starbuck said. "'Yes, Ben. Yes, I did,' Captain Birdsell replied, swinging gently to and fro. "'Do you smoke, Ben?' "'Aye, aye, sir.' The I.I. is reserved for acknowledging orders, not answering questions, Ben. Yes, sir. I'll remember that in the future. Every man on board smokes, Ben. Everyone but me. I do not use tobacco. Commendable, sir. I suppose you drink. All of the rest of the men do. Occasionally, Captain. I abstain. Enviable, sir. Have you read any good books lately? "'Good and bad, sir. "'I notice most of the men read. "'I haven't time for reading myself, or shooting craps. "'You do play the game like the rest? "'Just once, sir, I lost all my money, "'which had been returned to him. "'Ben, I think you don't fully appreciate "'the nature of the mission of the Space Service,' "'Captain Birdsell said, "'flexing one knee and performing a difficult one-leg swing on the bar.' It is our duty to go ever onward into the mystery of the unknown, ever deeper, ever traveling into the heart of the secrets of the universe. Nothing can stop us. Nothing. I'll try to remember, sir. Was that all? One more thing, said the inverted captain. I think you are going to be relieved of duty of officiating at the phasing. Correct, said another voice, one Starbuck had never heard. That's all now, Ben. Very good, sir. Starbuck paused at the door. That's a fine trapeze you have there, sir. Thank you, Ben. I don't want to jump to conclusions, Ben said to the knot of men gathered around him, listening to his story of the interview with the captain. But I think Captain Birdsell is... is... Psychotic? suggested Romero. Schizoid? Percy Kettleman ventured. Nuts is the word I was searching for, Starbuck concluded. I believe he intends to keep phasing and phasing, taking us deeper into space and never returning to Earth or the inhabited universe. I guess, Kettleman opined, that we will just have to convince him he is wrong in that attitude. We can make a formal written complaint and request for an explanation under Section 24, Romero said. Is that what you had in mind, Ben? I had a straitjacket in mind, Starbuck admitted, but I'm new in the space service. I have a selfish motive. I want to get back to Earth sometime and a vine-covered ethnology class. 
"'We better go take him,' Kettleman said heavily. "'As much as I dislike agreeing with an ox like you, Kettleman,' Romero said, "'I conclude it is best.' There was a general rumble of agreement. "'Wait, wait,' a youngish man whose name Starbuck vaguely remembered to be Horn stepped forward, his eyes glittering with contact lenses. "'May I ask you men to remember Christopher Columbus? I like our captain no more than any of you, but he may be right. Perhaps what he is doing is vital. We shouldn't let our selfish fears. Always, Starbuck thought, always some egghead comes along to gum up the works. Starbuck knew he would need a decisive argument to overcome Horn's objective theory. Starbuck slugged him. Horn crumpled after a flashy right cross Starbuck had developed in his extreme youth, and Starbuck took a giant step over him, heading for the bridge. The other crew members followed him. Besides, Starbuck thought he had always considered arguing by analogy to be sloppy thinking. "'Don't come in here,' Captain Birdsell yelled through the partly closed hatch to the bridge. "'You'll regret it if you do.' Starbuck swallowed hard and reached for the door handle. Percy Kettleman viced his wrist. I'll go in first, little chum. There wasn't much room for argument with Kettleman when it came to a matter of who could end in wrestle the best. He stepped back and let Kettleman cross the threshold first. Percy threw open the door, screamed once, and fainted. The rest of the men tended to pull back following this demonstration. Starbuck didn't like to do it, but he didn't like the idea of hanging for mutiny as Birdsell had threatened Lieutenant Frawley on the first day. Starbuck realized he hadn't seen Frawley for several days. Had Birdsell disposed of him as he had threatened? He got close enough to the door to see inside. It didn't make him faint, but he did feel a little sick. What is it? Romero demanded urgently. Alien, Starbuck said. "'an unpleasant-looking one inside. "'Sometimes you pick up ghosts passing a system,' "'one of the men explained. "'I'm not an alien,' Birdsell's voice called out. "'I'm me. "'The brain reversed my dimensional polarity. "'I told you you wouldn't like it.' "'Starbuck stirred up nerve for a second look. "'Captain Birdsell was now a man of many parts. "'Some of them were only areas of abstract line and hues.' but there he could see a redly beating heart, a white dash of thigh bone, and a compassionate blue eye bracketed by two tattooed dragon talons. The effect was distracting. Starbuck stepped over his second man that day. Captain, we're taking over the ship. We're either going to explore one of these planets we've been passing up or return to Earth. The apparition groaned. Don't you think I know I've gone too far? I'd like to go back, but the brain won't let me. It's taken over just the way I knew it would. Nonsense, Starbuck snapped with more authority than he felt. The brain can't violate the principles it was built to operate upon. Brain, program this ship for Earth. Starbuck expected the sound of that strange voice he had heard in the captain's cabin, but here it had a communication screen and it evidently thought that was sufficient. I won't go back to that awful old place. I can't. Can't, can't, so there. Take it easy, Starbuck said to the machine. Don't get hysterical. I don't care about the rest of those swine, Birdsell said, but I hate to have gotten you in a fix like this, Ben. I knew the brain was going to replace me sooner or later, but I was going to hold on to my job as long as I could. I was going to stay next to the brain, even if I had to take the position away from you. But the brain kept demanding more and more. Finally, he did this to me. I knew I had let him go too far. Go away, the brain signaled. Go away from me. This monotony is driving me mad, mad. I liked you, Ben, the captain's voice said from the heart of the thing. You're not like the scum I've got used to under my command. I'm sorry that you're marooned out of time and space like this. It's kind of tough, I know, but keep your chin up. Of course, of course, Starbuck groaned. What kind of ethnologist am I? He turned to Romero. Could you reverse the wiring in the computer? 
Maybe, Romero said, but I could reprogram it for negative result easier. Same results, lacking a short circuit. Okay, do it. Well, if you say so, Ben. No, stay away from me. The brain's communication screen flashed a blinding white scream as Romero laid hands on it. Lieutenant Frawley's in charge now, Starbuck explained to Percy Kettleman, who was sitting on his bunk with his head between his legs. Birdsell seemed all right after the brain finished changing him back, but we all thought we'd better keep him under observation for a while. Kettleman straightened up. I'm sorry I passed out on you, but seeing the old man in that shape was quite a shock. Starbuck nodded agreement. I don't like to think about the next step the calculator would have to take him through. Not just a physical change, but a mental one, too. That was the brain's whole reason for existence, to find the unknown. It was programmed to be even more basic than sex or self-preservation are to us. The trouble was, the more it learned, the more readily it could see some similarity to the familiar in the most outer things. That was why the captain was acting so nutty. He was trying to appeal to it. Yes, he had some old moralistic and superstitious ideas about calculators. He thought his job depended on his pleasing it, when of course his job was to please him. But he gave it an idea. If it couldn't find the strange and different, it would create it. It started with the first changing element in its environment, the captain, but I don't know where it would have stopped if Romero hadn't reversed its pleasure-pain synapse response. Now it loves the tried and true. It's not much good for space exploration, of course, but a museum may be interested in it now. So we'll have to go back to picking our phase points at random, trusting to chance. Or the judgment of some skunk like Birdsell. Starbuck cleared his throat. That's another thing. The men aboard the Gorgon and the cybernetics machine had something in common. I finally figured it out. Most men are afraid of the unknown. They fear and hate it. But obviously not space explorers. They spend their whole lives searching for the unknown. They don't suffer from xenophobia. They are xenophiles. They like anything that's new and different. Even a new member of the crew. It kind of lessens the camaraderie aboard a spaceship, but the service must have found the trait valuable. They have searched it out in men and developed it. They even breed it in second-generation spacemen. Do you know what, Starbuck? What, Kettleman? All that talk of yours is beginning to get on my nerves. Kettleman's triceps flexed. Starbuck sighed. The honeymoon was over for him, and the trip was just beginning. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Nineteen Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dangerous Quarry They say automation makes jobs, especially if they are trying to keep their own job of selling automation machines. I know the Act Warvac made one purple passion of a job for me, the unpleasantly fatal results of which are still lingering with me. Thad McCain, my boss at Manhattan Universal Insurance, beamed over the sprawling automatic brain's silver gauges and plastic toggles as proudly as if he had just personally gave birth to it. This will simplify your job to the point of a pleasant diversion, Madison. Are you going to keep paying me for staying with my little hobby? I asked, suspiciously eyeing my chrome competitor. The Actorvac poses no threat to your career. It will merely keep you from flying off on wild goose chases. It will unvaryingly separate from the vast body of legitimate claims the phony ones they try to spike us for. Then all that remains for you is to gather the accessory details, the evidence to jail our erring customers. Fine, I said. I didn't bother to inform him that that was all my job had ever been. McCain shuffled his cards. They were cards for the machine listing new individual claims on company policies. Since the two-month-old machine was literate and could read typewriting, 
The cards weren't coded or punched. He read the top one. Now this, for instance. No adjuster need investigate this accident. The circumstances obviously are such that no false claim could be filed. Of course, the brain will make an unfailing analysis of all the factors involved and clear the claim automatically and officially. McCain threaded the single card into the slot for an example to me. He then flicked the switch, and we stood there watching the monster ruminate thoughtfully. It finally rang a bell and spit the card back at Manhattan Universal's top junior vice president. He took it like a man. That's what the machine is for, he said philosophically, to detect human error. Hmm, what kind of a shove do you get out of this? He handed me the rejected claim card. I took it, finding a new, neatly typed notation on it. It said, Investigate the Ozark village of Granite City. You want me to project it in a movie theater and see how it stands it all alone in the dark? I asked. Just circle up the wagon train and see how the Indians fall, McCain said anxiously. It's too general. What does the nickel brain machine mean by investigating the whole town? I don't know if it has crooked politics, a polygamy colony, or a hideout for supposedly deported gangsters. I don't care much either. It's not my business. How could a whole town be filing false life and accident claims? Find that out, he said. I trust the machine. There have been cases of mass collusion before. Until you get back, we're making no more settlements with that settlement. Research to a writer that generally means legally permissible plagiarism. For an insurance adjuster, it means earnest work. Before I headed for the hills, or the Ozark Mountains, I walked a few hundred feet down the hall and into the manual record files. The brain abstracted from empirical data, but before I planed out to Granite City, I had to find the basis for a few practical, nasty suspicions. Four hours of flipping switches and looking at microfilm projections while a tawny redhead in a triangular-fronted uniform carried me reels to order gave me only two ideas. Neither was very original. The one that concerned business was that the whole village of Granite City must be accident-prone. I rejected that one almost immediately. While an accident-prone was in himself a statistical anomaly, the idea of a whole town of them gathered together stretched the fabric of reality to the point where even an invisible re-weaver couldn't help it. There was an explanation for the recent rise in the accident rate down there. The rock quarry there had gone into high-level operation. I knew why from the floor, walls, ceiling border, table trimmings in the records room. They were all granite. The boom in granite for interior and exterior decoration eclipsed earlier periods of oak, plastics, wrought iron, and baked clay completely. The distinctive grade of granite from Granite City was being put into use all over the planet and in the officers' clubs on the moon and Mars. Yet the rise in accident, compared to the rise in production, was all out of proportion. Furthermore, the work at the quarry could hardly explain the excessive accident reports we had had from the village as far back as our records went. We had paid off on most of the claims since they seemed irrefutably genuine. All were complete with eyewitness reports and authenticated circumstances. There was one odd note in the melodic scheme. We had never had a claim for any kind of automobile accident from Granite City. I shut off the projector. It may be best to keep an open mind, but I have found in practice that you have to have some kind of working theory which you must proceed to prove is either right or wrong. Tentatively, I decided that for generations the citizens of Granite City had been in an organized conspiracy to defraud Manhattan Universal and its predecessors of hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars in false accident claims. They made their whole livelihood off us before the quarry opened up. I used my pocket intercom and had my secretary get me a plane reservation and a gun. After so many profitable decades, Granite City wasn't going to take kindly to my spoiled sport interference. The absinthe flight to Springfield was jolly and relatively fast. 
Despite headwinds, we managed Mach 1.6 most of the way. My particular stewardess was a blonde, majoring in video psychotherapy in her night courses. I didn't have much time to get acquainted or more than hear the outline of her thesis on the guilt purgings affected by the life and legend of Gary Cooper. The paunchy businessman in the next lounge was already nibbling the ear of his red-haired hostess. He was the type of razorback who took the girls for granted and aimed to get his money's worth. I gave Helen, the blonde, a kiss on the cheek and began flipping through the facsimiles in my briefcase as we shoot break for a landing at the Greater Ozarks. It took me a full five minutes to find out that I couldn't take a copter to Granite City. Something about downdrafts in the mountains. Since that put me back in the days of horsepower, I trotted over to the automobile rental and hired a few hundred of them under the hood of a Rolls. That was about the only brand of car that fit me. I hadn't been able to get my legs into any other foreign car since I was 15, and I have steadfastly refused to enter an American model since they all sold out their birthrights as passenger cars and went over to the tractor-trailer combinations they used only for cargo trucks when I was a boy. Dragging around 30 feet of car is sheer nonsense, even for prestige. It was a tiresome 50-mile drive, on manual all the way after I left the radar channel area of the city. Up and down, slowing for curves, flipping into second for the hills. The whole trip hardly seemed worth it when I saw the cluster of painted frame buildings that was Granite City. They looked like a tumble of dingy building blocks tossed in front of a rolled-up indigo sport shirt. That was Granite Mountain in the near foreground. But I remember that over the course of some forty years, the people in these few little stacks of lumber had taken Manhattan Universal for three-quarters of a megabuck. I turned off onto the gravel road, sprained my fenders with a hail of a racket. Then I stepped down hard on my brakes, bracing myself to keep from going through the windscreen. I had almost sideswiped an old man sitting at the side of the road, huddled in his dusty rags. "'Are you okay?' I yelled, thumbing down the window. "'I've suffered no harm at your hands or your wheels, sir, but I could use some help,' the old man said. "'Could I trouble you for a lift when you leave town?' I wasn't too sure about that. Most of these guys who were on the hobo circuit, talking like they owned some letters to their names, besides their initials, belonged to some called or other. I try to be as tolerant as I can, and some of my best friends are thugs, but I don't want to drive with them down lonely mountain roads. We'll see what we can work out, I said. Right now, can you tell me where I can find Marshall Thompson? I can, he said, but you will have to walk there. Okay. It shouldn't be much of a walk in Granite City. It's the house at the end of the street. It is, I said. Why shouldn't I drive up there? The street's open. The old man stared at me with red-shot eyes. Marshall Thompson doesn't like people to run automobiles on streets of Granite City. So I'll just lock the car up and walk over there. I couldn't go getting tire tracks all over your clean streets. The old man watched as I climbed down and locked up the rolls. You would probably get killed if you did run the car up here, you know, he said conversationally. Well, I said, I'll be getting along. I tried to walk sideways so I could keep an eye on him. Come back, he said, as if he had doubts. The signs of a menacing conspiracy were growing stronger, I felt. I had my automatic inside my shirt, but I decided I might need a less lethal means of expression. Without breaking stride, I scooped up a baseball-sized hunk of bluish rock from the road and slipped it into my small change pocket. I have made smarter moves in my time. As I approached the house at the end of the lane, I saw it was about the worst construction job I'd seen in my life. It looked as architecturally secure as a four-year-old's drawing of his home. The angles were measurably out of line. Around every nail head were two nails bent out of shape and hammered down, and a couple of dozen welts in the siding where the hammer had missed any nail. The paint job was spotty and streaked. Half the panes in the windows were cracked. 
I fought down the dust in my nose, afraid of the consequences of a sneeze to the place. My toe scuffed the top porch step, and I nearly crashed face first into the front door. I had been too busy looking at the house, I decided. I knocked. Moments later the door opened. The lean-faced man who greeted me had his cheeks crisscrossed with razor nicks and his shirt on wrong side out. But his eyes were bright and sparrow alert. Are you Mr. Marshall Thompson, the agent for Manhattan Universal Insurance? I put to him. I'm the Marshall, name of Thompson. But you ain't the first to take my title for my Christian name. You from the company? Yes, I said. Were you expecting me? Thompson nodded. For forty-one years. Thompson served the coffee in the chipped cups, favoring only slightly his burned fingers. Catching the direction of my glance, he said, "'Company is worth a few skulls, Mr. Madison.' I accepted the steaming cup, and somehow it very nearly slipped out of my hands. I made a last microsecond retrieve. The marshal nodded thoughtfully. "'You're new here.' First time,' I said, sipping coffee. "'It was awful. He must have made a mistake and put salt into it instead of sugar.' "'You think the claims I've been filing for my people are false? "'The Home Office has some suspicions of that,' I admitted. "'I don't blame them, but they ain't. "'Look, the company gambles on luck, doesn't it? "'No, it works on percentages calculated from past experience. "'But I mean it knows that there will be, say, "'a hundred fatal car crashes in a day. "'But it doesn't know if maybe ninety of them will be in Iowa "'and only ten in the rest of the country.' There's something to that. We call it probability, not luck. Well, probability says that more accidents are going to occur in Granite City than anywhere else in the country, per capita. I shook my head at Thompson. That's not probability. Theoretically, anything can happen. But I don't, I can't, believe that in this town everybody has chance to be an accident prone. Some other factor is operating. "'You are all deliberately faking these falls and fires.' "'We're not,' Thompson snapped. "'Or else something is causing you to have this trouble. "'Maybe the whole town is a bunch of dope addicts. "'Maybe you grow your own mescaline or marijuana. "'It's happened before.' "'Thompson laughed. "'Whatever's going on, I'm going to find out. "'I don't care what you do, "'but if I can find a greater risk here and prove it, the commission will let us up our rates for this town. Probably beyond the capacity of these people, I'm afraid. That would be a real tragedy, Mr. Madison. Insurance is vital to this town. Nobody could survive a year here without insurance. People pay me for their premiums before they pay their grocery bills. I shrugged, sorrier than I could let on. I won't be able to pay for my own groceries, Marshall, if I don't do the kind of job the company expects. I'm going to snoop around. All right, he said grudgingly, but you'll have to do it on foot. Yes, I understood you don't like cars on your streets, at least not the cars of outsiders. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Nobody in Granite City owns a car. It would be suicide for anybody to drive a car. "'same as it would be to have a gas or oil stove, "'instead of coal, or to own a bathtub.' "'I took a deep breath. "'Showers,' Thompson said, "'with non-skid mats and handrails. "'I shook hands with him. "'You've been a great help. Four o'clock,' he said. "'Roads are treacherous at night. "'There's always a dawn.' "'Thompson met my eyes. "'That's not quite how we look at it here.' The quarry was a mess. I couldn't see any in the way they sliced the granite out of the mountain. The idea of a four-year-old, four-year-old moron, going after a mound of raspberry ice cream kept turning up in my mind as I walked around. The workmen were gone. It was after five local time. But here and there I saw traces of them. Some of them were sandwich wrappers and cigarette stubs, but most of the traces were smears of blood. Blood streaked across sharp rocks, blood oozing from beneath heavy rocks, blood smeared on the handles and working surfaces of sledgehammers and tools. 
the place was as gory as a battlefield. "'What are you looking for, bud?' The low, level snarl came from a burly character in a synth leather jacket and narrow-brimmed Stetson. "'The reason you have so many accidents here,' I said frankly. "'I'm from the insurance company. Name's Madison.' "'Yeah, I know.' I had supposed he would. "'I'm Kelvin, the foreman here,' the big man told me, extending a ham of a fist to be shook. "'Outside doing my army time.' I noticed that most people don't have as many slip-ups as we do here. Never could figure it out. This rock is part of it. What do you mean by that? Kelvin demanded savagely. I mean the way you work it. No system to it. No stratification. No plateau work. Listen, Madison. Don't talk about what you don't know anything about. The stuff in these walls isn't just rock. It isn't even plain granite. "'Granite City exports some of the finest grade of the stone in the world, "'and it's used all over the world. "'We aren't just a bunch of meat-headed ditch-diggers. "'We are craftsmen. "'We have to figure out a different way of getting out every piece of stone. "'It's too bad. "'What's too bad?' "'That you chose the wrong way so often,' I said. "'Calvin breathed a virile grade of tobacco into my face. "'Listen, Madison.' We have been working this quarry for generations, sometimes more of us working than other times. Today, most of us are working getting out the stone. That's the way we like it. We don't want any outsider coming in and interfering with that. If this quarry has anything to do with defrauding Manhattan Universal, I can tell you that I will do something about that. As soon as my teeth clicked back together, the sickening feeling hit me that I shouldn't have said that. The general store was called a supermarket, but it wasn't particularly superior. I took a seat at the soda fountain and took a beer, politely declining the teenage clerk's offer of a shot of white lightning from the Pepsi-Cola fountain syrup jug for a quarter. Behind me were three restaurant tables and one solitary red upholstered booth. Two men somewhere between forty and sixty sat at the nearest table playing twenty-one. Over the foam of my stein I saw the old man I had almost run down in the road. He marched through the two-thirds of the building composed of rows of canned goods and approached the fat man at the cash register. "'Hello, Professor,' the fat man said. "'What can we do for you?' "'I'd like to mail a letter,' he said in an urgent voice. "'Sure, Professor. I'll send it right off on the facsimile machine as soon as I get a free moment. "'You're sure you can send it right away?' Positive. Ten cents, Professor. The Professor fumbled in his pants pocket and fished out a dime. He fingered it thoughtfully. I suppose the letter can wait, he said resignedly. I believe I'll buy a pair of donuts, Mr. Haskell. Why not get a hamburger, Professor? Special sale today. Only a dime. And since you're such a good customer, I'll throw in a cup of coffee and two sinkers for nothing. "'That's kind of you,' the old man said awkwardly. Haskell shrugged. "'A man has to eat.' The man called the professor came over and sat down two stools away, ignoring me. The clerk dialed his hamburger and served it. I stayed with my beer and my thoughts. More and more I was coming to believe that Granite City wasn't a job for an investigative adjuster like myself, but a psychological adjuster.' Crime is a structural flaw in a community, yes. But when the whole society is criminal, distorted, you can't isolate the flaw. The whole village was meet for a sociologist. Let him figure out why otherwise decent citizens felt secure in conspiracy to defraud an honored corporation. I didn't feel that I was licked or that the trip had been a failure. I had merely established to my intuitive satisfaction that the job was not in my field. I glanced at the old man. The proprietor of the store knew him and evidently thought him harmless enough to feed. I think I can make it down the mountain before dark, old-timer, I called over to him. You can come along if you like. The acne-faced kid behind the counter stared at me. I looked over and caught the bright little eyes of Haskell, the proprietor, too. Finally, the old professor turned on his stool, his face pale, and his eyes sad and resigned. 
"'I doubt very much if either of us will be leaving, Mr. Madison,' he said. "'Now!' I took my beer and the professor his coffee over to the single booth. We looked at each other across the shiny table and our beverage containers. "'I am Dr. Arnold Parnell of Duke University,' the professor said. "'I left on my sabbatical five months ago. I've been here ever since.' I looked at his clothes. "'You must not have been very well fixed for a year's vacation, Professor.' "'I,' he said, "'have enough traveler's checks with me to paper a washroom. Nobody in this town will cash them for me. I can understand why you want to go somewhere where people are more trusting in that case. They know the checks are good. It's me they refuse to trust to leave this place. They think they can't let me go.' "'I don't see any shackles on you,' I remarked. "'Just because you can't see them,' he growled, "'doesn't mean they aren't there. "'Marshall Thompson has the only telephone in the village. "'He has politely refused to let me use it. "'I am a suspicious and undesirable character. "'He's under no obligation to give me telephone privileges,' he says. "'Haskell has the post office concession, "'the Telefax outfit behind the money box over there.' He takes my letters, but I never see him send them off, and I never get a reply. Unfriendly of them, I said conservatively. But how can they stop you from packing your dental floss and cutting out? Haskell has the only motor vehicle in town, a half-ton pickup, a minuscule contrivance less than the size of a passenger car. He makes about one trip a week down into the city for supplies and package mail. He has been the only one in or out of Granite City for five months. It seemed incredible, more than that, unlikely, to me. How about the granite itself? How do they ship it out? It's an artificial demand product, like diamonds, Professor Parnell said. They stockpile it, and once a year the executive offices for the company back in Nashville runs in a portable monorail railroad up the side of the mountain to take it out. That won't be for another four months, as nearly as I can find out. I may not last that long. How are you living, I asked, if they won't take your checks? I do odd jobs for people. They feed me, give me a little money sometimes. I can see why you want to ride out with me, I said. Haven't you ever thought of just walking out? Fifty miles down a steep mountain road? I'm an old man, Mr. Madison. "'and I've gotten even older since I came to Granite City.' "'I nodded. "'You have any papers, any identification to back this up?' "'Wordlessly, he handed over his billfold, letters, "'enough identification to have satisfied Alan Pinkerton or John Edgar Hoover. "'Okay,' I drawled. "'I'll accept your story for the moment. "'Now answer me the big query. "'Why are all the good people of Granite City doing this to you?' By any chance, you wouldn't happen to know of a mass fraud they are perpetrating on Manhattan Universal. I know nothing of their ethical standards, Parnell said, but I do know they are absolutely subhuman. I admit I have met likelier groups of human beings in my time. No, understand me. These people are literally subhuman. They are inferior to other human beings. Look, I know the clan is a growing organization, but I can't go along with you. Madison, understand me, I insist. Ethnologically speaking, it is well known that certain tribes suffer certain deficiency due to diet, climate, etc. Some can't run, sing, use mathematics. The people of Granite City have the most unusual deficiency on record, I admit. Their psionic senses have been impaired. They are completely devoid of any use of telepathy, precognition, telekinesis. Because they aren't supermen, that doesn't mean that they are submen, I protested. I don't have any psionic abilities either. But you do, Parnell said earnestly. Everybody has some psychonics ability, but we don't realize it. We don't have the fabulous abilities of a few recorded cases of supermen, but we have some, a trace. Granite City citizens have non-psionic ability whatsoever, not even the little that you and I and the rest of the world have. You said you were Duke University, didn't you? I mused. Maybe you know what you are talking about. I've never been sure. 
but these people can't suffer very much from their lack of what you call PSI ability. I tell you they do, he said hoarsely. We've never realized it, but we all have some power of precognition. If we didn't, we would have a hundred accidents a day, just as these people do. They can't foresee the bump in the road the way we can, or that that particular match will flare a little higher and burn their fingers. There are other things as well. You will find it's almost impossible to carry on a lengthy conversation with any of them. They have no telepathic ability, no matter how slight, to see through the semantic barrier. None of them can play ball. They don't have the unconscious psionic ability to influence the ball in flight. All of us can do that, even if the case of a poltergeist who can lift objects is rare. Professor, you mean these people are holding you here simply so you don't go out and tell the rest of the world that they are submen? They don't want the world to know why they are psionically subnormal, he said crisply. It's the granite. I don't understand myself. I'm not a physicist or a biologist. But for some reason, the heavy concentration and particular pattern of the radioactive radiation in its matrix is responsible for inhibiting the genes that transmit PSI powers from generation to generation and affecting those abilities in the present generation, a kind of psionic sterility. How do you know this? We haven't the time for all that, but think about it. What else could it be? It's that granite that they are shipping all over the world, spreading the contamination. I want to stop that contamination. To the people of Granite City, that means ruining their only industry, putting them all out of work. They are used to this psionic sterility. They don't see anything so bad about it. Besides, like everybody else, they have some doubts that there really are such things as telepathy and the rest to be affected. Frankly, I said, hedging only a little, I don't know what to make of your story. This is something to be decided by somebody infallible, like the Pope or the President or Board Chairman of Manhattan Universal. But the first thing to do is get you out of here. We had better get back to my car. I've got good lights to get down the mountain. Parnell jumped up eagerly and brushed over his china mug. "'staining the tabletop with brown caffeine. "'Sorry,' he said. "'I should have been precognizant of that. "'I try to stay away from the rock as much as possible, "'but it's getting to me. "'I should have remembered something then, "'but naturally I didn't. "'It was the time when you could argue "'about whether it was twilight or night. "'In the deep dusk the rolls looked to be "'a horror-flicker giant bug. "'I fumbled for the keys.' Then the old man made me break stride by digging narrow fingers into my bicep. Marshall Thompson and the bulky quarry foreman, Kelvin, stepped out of the shadow of the car. First, throw away that gun of yours, Mr. Madison, the marshal said. I looked at his old pistol that must have used old powder cartridges instead of liquid propellants and forked out my Smith & Wesson with two fingers, letting it plop at my feet. "'I'm afraid we can't let you spread the professor's lies, Mr. Madison,' Thompson said. "'You're planning on killing me?' I asked with admirable restraint. "'I hope not. "'You can have the run of the town, like the professor. "'I'll tell your company you're making a thorough investigation. "'Then maybe in a few weeks or months I can arrange so it looks like you were killed, someplace outside.' We don't aim to let any crazy fanatic like Parnell ruin our business, our whole town, Kelvin interjected bitterly. I took a pause to make abstractions on the situation. I glanced at the little man at my right. Parnell, my car is our only chance of getting out of here. If they stop us from getting in that car, we'll be bums here on town charity for the rest of our lives. No, no. Parnell gave a terrier yell and charged the gun in the old marshal's hand. It seemed as if it would take me too long to recover my gun from the dirt, but almost instinctively I felt the rock in the pocket of my pants. I scooped out the sample of granite and heaved it at the head of the old cop. But my control seemed completely shot. I missed the old man's head with an appalling gap and hit the roof of the rolls. Fortunately, 
the granite radiations didn't influence non-human oriented factors of chance. The stone bounced off the car and struck the marshal's gun hand. Thompson dropped his gun, and I reached for mine in the dust, vaguely aware of Kelvin pumping toward me. I straightened up. He led with his right, of all damn things. I blocked it with my gun hand and let him have my left in the midst of his solar plexus. He crumpled prettier than a paper doll. When the dust cleared, Professor Parnell was sitting on Thompson's chest. Hooray, I said, for our side. The people had made one mistake. They thought people would believe us. Parnell and I broke the story to some newspaper friends of mine. They gave it a play in the mistaken belief the professor and I were starting our own cult, and the equal time law is firm. But nobody paid any more attention to us than the hedonists, the clan, the soft-shelled Baptists, or the reformed agnostics. I tried to get Thad McCain to realize all the money this cursed granite was costing us in accident claims, but it wasn't easy. Manhattan Universal owned stock in Granite City Products, Inc. We had spent a quarter of a megabuck modernizing our offices with granite only months before. McCain, I said earnestly, will you just let me feed the new data we've got from Parnell into the Actrovac? It's infallible. See what it says. Very well, McCain said with a sigh. He let me feed the big brain the hypothesis I had got from Parnell. It chattered to itself for some minutes and at last flipped a card into the slot. I dug the pasteboard out and read it. It said, No such place as Granite City exists. The rock has got to the machine, I screamed. Chief, this brain is stoned. It's made a mistake. We know there is such a place. Nonsense, my boy, McCain said in a fatherly way. The actor of act merely means that no such place as you erroneously described could possibly exist. Why don't you try one of our headness revival meetings tonight? Things have got steadily worse since then. So far, nobody has made the big mistake of dropping an H-bomb on anyone, but that's probably because all the governments made so many smaller mistakes the people made the mistake, or was it, of kicking them out for almost absolute anarchy but the individuals are doing worse than the governments, if that's possible. People have given up going anywhere except by foot, for the most part. Granite City Granite is still as widely dispersed and almost as highly prized as South African diamonds. I hope we will find some way out of our current world crisis, although I can't imagine what it will be. Meanwhile, I hope you will excuse any typographical errors. It seems as if I just can't seem to hit the right keys on my typewriter anymore, as my, and all of our, psionic sterility increases. I ask you, where will it all end? End of chapter 18「19 of 19 Science Fiction Short Stories by Jim Harmon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. February Strawberries Linton lay down his steel fork beside the massively solid transparency of the restaurant water glass. Isn't that Roger Sneed at that table? He heard himself say stupidly. Howell, the man across the table from him, looked embarrassed without looking. Not at all. Somebody who looks like him. Twin brother. You know how it is. Sneed's dead, don't you remember? Linton remembered. Howell had to know that he would remember. What were they trying to pull on him? The man who isn't Sneed is leaving, Linton said, describing the scene over Howell's shoulder. If that's Sneed's brother, I might catch him to pay my respects. No, Howell said. I wouldn't do that. Sneed came to Greta's funeral. It's the least I could do. I wouldn't. Probably no relation to Sneed at all. Somebody who looks like him. He's practically running, Linton said. He almost ran out of the restaurant. Who? Oh, the man who looked like Sneed, you mean? Yes, Linton said. A thick-bodied man at the next table leaned his groaning chair back immediately against Linton's own chair. 
"'That fellow who just left looked like a friend of yours, huh?' the thick man said. "'Couldn't have been him, though,' Linton answered automatically. "'My friend's dead.' The thick man rocked forward and came down on all six feet. He threw paper money on the table as if he were disgusted with it. He plodded out of the place quickly. Howell breathed in deeply and sucked back Linton's attention. "'Now you've probably got old Sneed into trouble.' "'Sneed's dead,' Linton said. "'Oh, well, dead,' Howell replied. "'What do you say it like that for?' Linton demanded angrily. "'The man's dead, plain dead. "'He's not Sherlock Holmes or the Frankenstein monster. "'There's no doubt or semantic leeway to the thing.' "'You know how it is,' Powell said. "'Linton had thought he had known how death was.' He had buried his wife, or rather he had watched the two workmen scoop and shove dirt in on the sawdust fresh pine box that held the coffin. He had known what he sincerely felt to be a genuine affection for Greta. Even after they had let him out of the asylum as cured, he still secretly believed he had known a genuine affection for her. But it didn't seem he knew about death at all. Lyndon felt that his silence was asking how by this time. "'I don't know, mind you,' Howell said, puffing out tobacco smoke. "'But I suppose he might have been resurrected.' "'By who?' Lyndon asked, thinking, "'God?' "'The Mafia, I guess. Who knows who runs it?' "'You mean somebody has invented a way to bring dead people back to life?' Lyndon said. He knew, of course, that Howell did not mean that. Howell meant that some people had a system of making it appear that a person had died in order to gain some illegal advantage. But by saying something so patently ridiculous, Linton hoped to bring the contradicting truth to the surface immediately. An invention? I guess that's how it is, Howell agreed. I don't know much about people like that. I'm an honest businessman. But it's wonderful, Linton said, thinking his immediate thoughts. Wonderful. Why should a thing like that be illegal? Why don't I know about it? Shh, Howell said uneasily. This is a public place. I don't understand, Lyndon said helplessly. Look, Frank, you can't legalize a thing like resurrection, Howell said with feigned patience. There are strong religious convictions to consider. The undertakers have a lobby. I've heard they've got spies right in the White House. "'ready to assassinate if they have to. "'Death is their whole life. "'You've got to realize that. "'That's not enough, not nearly enough. "'Think of all the problems it would cause. "'Insurance, for one thing. "'Overpopulation. "'Birth control is a touchy subject. "'They'd have to take it up if everybody got resurrected "'when they died, wouldn't they? "'But what do they do about it? "'Against it?' There are lots of fakes and quacks in the resurrection business. When the cops find out about a place, they break in, smash all the equipment, and arrest everybody in sight. That's about all they can do. The charges, if any, come under general vice classification. I don't understand, Linton complained. Why haven't I heard about it? They didn't talk much about white slavery in Victorian England. I read an article in Time the other day that said death was our dirty word, not sex. You want to shock somebody. You tell him, you're going to be dead some day, not anything sexual. You know how it is. The opposite of live these days is videotaped. I see, Lyndon said. He tried to assimilate it. Of course he had, he reminded himself, been out of touch for some time. It might be true. Then again, they might be trying to trick him. They used to do that to see if he was really well, but the temptation was too strong. Tell me, Howell, where could I find a resurrectionist? Howell looked away. Frank, I don't have anything to do with that kind of people, and if you're smart, you'll not either. Lyndon's fingers imprinted the linen. Damn you, Howell, you tell me. Howell climbed to his feet hurriedly. I take you out to dinner to console you over the loss of your wife a half year ago, and to make you feel welcome back to the society of your fellows after being in the hospital for a nervous breakdown. I do all that, and for thanks, you yell at me and curse me. You cooks are all alike. 
Howell threw the money on the table with the same kind of disinterest as the thick-set man and stalked out. I've got to hurry, too, Lyndon thought. It's resurrection day. The doctor fluttered his hands and chirped about the office. Well, Mr. Lyndon, we understand you've been causing disturbances. Not really, Lyndon said modestly. Come, come, the doctor chided. You started riots in two places, attempted to bribe an officer. That's disturbing, Mr. Linton, very disturbing. I was only trying to find out something, Linton maintained. They could have told me. Everybody seems to know but me. The doctor clucked his tongue. Let's not think any such thing. People don't know more than you do. Linton rubbed his shoulder. That cop knew more about judo holds than I did. A few specific people know a few specific things you don't. But let me ask you, Mr. Linton, could Einstein bake a pie? I don't know. Who the hell ever wasted Einstein's time asking him a thing like that? People who want to know the answers to questions have to ask them. You can find out anything by asking the right questions of the right person at the right time. Linton stared suspiciously. Do you know where I can find a resurrectionist? I'm a resurrectionist. But the policeman brought me to you. Well, that's what you paid him to do, wasn't it? Do you think a policeman would just steal your money? Cynics! All you young people are cynics! Linton scooted forward on the insultingly cold metal chair and really looked at the doctor for the first time. Doctor, can you really resurrect the dead? Will you stop being cynical? Of course I can. Doctor, I'm beginning to believe in you, Lyndon said. But tell me, can you resurrect the long dead? Size has nothing to do with it. No, my wife has been dead a long time. Months. Months? The doctor snapped those weeks away with his fingers. It could be years, centuries. It's all mathematics, my boy. I need only one fragment of the body and my computers can compute what the rest of it was like and recreate it. It's infallible. Naturally, there is a degree of risk involved. Infallible risk, yes, Linton murmured. Could you go to work right away? First, I must follow an ancient medical practice. I must bleed you. Linton grasped the situation immediately. You mean you want money? You realize I've just got out of an institution. I've often been in institutions myself, for alcoholism, narcotics addiction, and more. What a wonderful professional career, Lyndon said, when he couldn't care less. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. But I didn't come out broke. Neither did I, Lyndon said hastily. I invested in shifty stocks, faltering bonds, and while I was away they sank to rock bottom. Then, when they hit rock bottom, they bounced up. If I hadn't found you, I would have been secure for the rest of my lonely, miserable life. All that's ended now, the doctor assured him. Now we must go dig up the corpse. The female corpse, eh? Resurrection day. Doctor, Lyndon whispered, my mind is singing with battalions of choirs. I hope that doesn't sound irreverent to you. The doctor stroked his oily palms together. Oh, but it does, beautifully. The certificate to a Lowry burial in Virginia hadn't been impossible to obtain. The doctor had taken the body and Linton's fortune and fed them both into the maw of his calculators, and by means of the secret, smuggled formulae, Greta would be cybernetically reborn. Linton shook his head. It seemed impossible. But Greta opened the olive drab slab of metal of the door to the doctor's inner sanctum and walked out into the medical cold fluorescent lighting. It wasn't fair at all, Lyndon thought. He should have had some time to prepare himself. Greta lifted her arms, stretching the white smock over the lines of her body. Darling, she said. Greta, he said, feeling a slight revulsion but repressing it. No doubt he would be able to adjust to her once having been dead the same way he had learned to accept the, to him, distasteful duty of kissing her ears the way she enjoyed. Greta swirled across the room and folded her arms across his shoulders. She kissed his cheek. 
It's so wonderful to be back. This calls for a celebration. We must see Nancy, Oscar, Johnny, all our old friends. Yes, he said, his heart lurching for her sad ignorance. But tell me, how was it being away? The curves and angles of her flesh changed their positions against his ivy dacron. Her attitude altered. I can't remember, she said. I can't really remember anything, not really. My memories are ghosts. Now, now, Lyndon said, we mustn't get excited. You've been through a trial. She accepted the verdict. She pulled away and touched at her hair. It was the same hair, black as evil, contrasting with her inner purity. Of course it would be. It hadn't changed even in the grave. He remembered the snaky tendrils of it growing out of the water-logged casket. I must see all our old friends, Greta persisted. Helen and Johnny. My darling, he said gently, about Johnny. Her fine black brows made gothic arches. Yes, what about Johnny? It was a terrible accident right after, that is, about five months ago. He was killed. Killed? Greta repeated blankly. Johnny Gorman was killed? Traffic accident. Killed instantly. But Johnny was your friend, your best friend. Why didn't you have him resurrected the same way you did me? Darling, resurrection is a risky business and an expensive one. You have to pay premium prices for strawberries in February. I no longer have the money to pay for a resurrection of Johnny. Greta turned her back to him. It's just as well. You shouldn't bring back Johnny to this dream of life. Give him a ghost of mind and the photograph of a soul. It's monstrous. No one should do that. No one. But you're sure you haven't the money to do it? No, Lyndon said. I'm sold out. I've borrowed on my insurance to the hilt. They won't pay any more until I'm buried. And then, of course, you can resurrect me. Of course, Greta said. She sighed. Poor Johnny. He was such a good friend of yours. You must miss him. I'm so sorry for you. I have you, he said with great simplicity. Frank, she said. You should see that place in there. There are foaming acid baths, great whale-tooth disposals, barrels of chemicals to quench death and smother decay. It's perfect. It sounds carnal, he said uneasily. No, dear, it's perfect for some things that have to be done. Her eyes flashed around the doctor's office and settled somewhere, on something. Linton followed the direction of Greta's gaze and found only an ashtray stand, looking vaguely like a fanatic's idol to a heathen religion on a pedestal. Greta pounced on the stand, hefted it at the base and ran toward him with it over her head. Linton leaped aside and Greta hit the edge of the desk instead of him. Brain damage, he concluded nervously, cell deterioration. Greta raised it again and he caught her wrists high over her head. She writhed against him provocatively. Frank, I'm sorry, dear, but I have to have that insurance money. It's hell. Linton understood immediately. He felt foolish, humiliated. All that money, he had resurrected a gold ring that had turned his knuckles green. No one must ever know. Lyndon twisted the stand away from his wife and watched her face in some appalled form of satisfaction as it registered horror and acceptance of the crumpled metal disc falling toward it. He split her head open and watched her float to the floor. Lyndon was surprised at the fine wire mesh just below the skin of those shiny little tabs that looked like pictures of transistors in institutional advertising. He knelt beside the body and poked into the bleeding, smoldering wreckage. Yes, it seemed they had to automate and modify the body somewhat in resurrection. They couldn't chemically revive the old corpse like pouring water on a wilted geranium. Or... Did they use the old bodies at all? What were all those acid baths for if the bodies were used? Didn't the resurrectionists just destroy the old corpses and make androids, synthetic creatures, to take their place? But it didn't matter. Not a bit. 
She had thought she was his wife, sharing her viewpoint down to the finest detail, and he had thought she was his wife. It was what you thought was real that made it so, not the other way around. I've killed my wife, Lyndon called, rising from his knees, stretching his hands out to something. The pain stung him to sleep, a pain in his neck like a needle that left a hole big enough for a camel to pass through, and big enough for him to follow the camel in his turn. He opened his eyes to the doctor's spotless, well-ordered office. The doctor looked down at him consolingly. "'You'll have to go back, Mr. Linton, but they'll cure you. You'll be cured of ever thinking your wife was brought back to life and that you killed her all over again.' "'Do you really think so, doctor?' Lyndon asked hopefully. End of chapter 19 End of 19 science fiction short stories by Jim Harmon